What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was Reborn as Naruto After Valley of the End Fight, Part 2. Like, share and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Previously on God of Shinobi, urgent news, Lady Hokage, she saluted. Sune gave her a sign to continue. A patrol squad ran into a monk from the Temple of Fire. They are on the way back now, but Shiriku and everyone else are reported dead. The monk described the killers as two men wearing black cloaks with red clouds. Of course. Rotten luck as always. New plan. Assemble and deploy the Akatsuki Task Force and then get that drink. Temple of Fire the site is not a pleasant one. Even while entering the property, we could all observe the battered front gate and the debris laying around. Asuma told us that the temple had once been a huge, multi-story structure able to comfortably room a hundred monks along with having rooms for group prayer. But now all that remains is the aftermath of a bloody massacre. And it had looked even worse before. The head monk and a few helpers had cleaned up quite a bit. All the dead bodies had been wrapped in cloth, and the majority put into coffins, while the rubble had been pushed to the sides. Kakuzu and Haydn certainly hadn't held back when they attacked this place. Not that I expected restraint from those two when it involved bounties or killing. Excuse me. But where is Chiriku? Asuma questions the head monk as we stand surrounded by the dead. The bearded elder only lowers his head, so his younger companion confirms what we came expecting. Well, actually, we've been unable to find Chiriku's remains. Hearing this, I quickly create and disperse a clone. So they took it then. Asuma too bows his head, letting out a slow exhale. When he straightens up and faces us a moment later, his expression is set in stone. Determined. It's as we thought then. Our enemy is most likely Dash Kakuzu. The bounty hunter from Taki. Shikamaru finishes. No trace of the usual laziness to be spotted. Experienced. Brutally efficient. Avaricious. The first two are bad enough. The last part just ensures that he won't let go of a 30 million Ryo bounty without a fuss. He has a personal stake in this. Then conflict it is. Assuming we pick the right location, then there will be two squads plus Naruto against the two of them. Katetsu looks around at us. Those are good odds. I say we pick the bounty station closest to us in double time. Teach those bastards not to mess with the land of fire. Wording aside, I agree. The odds are in our favor. Let's go recover your friend's body, Captain. Izumo backed his friend. They did a good job of it. But I still knew they were only trying to hide their nerves. Orochimaru hadn't spoken lightly of Kakuzu in his countermeasures against the man. And with Haydn being a mystery to them, an encounter could go either way even if the Akatsuki were outnumbered 8 to 2. Right, we're doing this then. We should send word to the other squads about Churiku's body being taken. Have the ones assigned to the stations be on lookout. Shikamaru reasons. And once a team finds any sign of them, the others can converge. Finding three pairs of eyes on him, Asuma promptly reaches into his pouch. Naruto, your multi-shadow clones. Are they able to? I nodded. He was a jonin, of course he would be aware of that useful trait. I figured. I'll send the message using the official method regardless. But is there anything to report on that end? I already sent the news down the channel. Getting feedback as we speak. Taking a moment to arrange all the information. Kakuzu and his partner must either be taking their time or have not headed to collect as none of my clones have sensed them yet. But I do think Izumo's plan has merit. We've accomplished what we came here to do so we know how to move forward. The best option is indeed the closest station not only because they would likely head there, but also because of the team that is camped there. Aobas. Oh, that does open up a few different game plans. Shikamaru, hums. I didn't doubt that he was already thinking a dozen steps ahead. Exactly. So while we're running there, I'll share my idea, and you can flesh it out. Sounds good. At his sign of consent I turn to the others. We can do this. It's class or not doesn't matter. You are not expected to see it now, but know that this mission is crucial. It's about more than eliminating Kakuzu and his partner or even getting justice for these fallen monks and giving Chiriku a proper burial. So much more. I don't have time to put it into the right words at the moment. But know that you're here for a good cause. For now though, just focus on getting this done and heading back home. After that, you two can go back to protecting the village, you back to contemplating life, and you, you can kiss your lady's stomach or something. You'll have earned it. 
Watching each person's reaction as I addressed them, I'd say they were as motivated, and maybe spooked, as I could get them with a few unscripted words. Nice, pep talks were not something that I had much practice in, but this situation called for at least an attempt. We were approaching the upcoming confrontation from different viewpoints. While they were anxious at the prospect of fighting two different S-ranks, with one being an unknown, I consider the fight a done deal. The zombie bros were legitimate threats, but not to me. Not really. So being the person with power and abilities to spare, I feel that I have a part to play in keeping morale up. Their worries of monsters with strange techniques were not completely unfounded, but they had a certain safety net in this case. Two of them actually, the other squad and myself. In fact, I plan to take Kakuzu off their hands entirely. Well, in a roundabout fashion. Although he is the one the squad had any information on, Haydn was the easiest of the two to subdue. They had almost succeeded in the original story after all. And just to be sure, I will be there to keep an eye out. No one is dying on my watch. Asuma will be there for the birth of his child, and watch them grow up. Have that bond he wished he'd had with his father. Not privy to my inner thoughts, Asuma sends me a grateful look, and then took charge of his squad. You all heard him. He has the utmost faith in our abilities as do I. Now let's go do what we came here for. Before we could head out, the head monk called out to us. Please wait a moment. Moving closer on his wooden cane, for those of you who are about to enter a fight, allow me a moment to offer you a prayer. Please. I didn't ask about who he was praying to. Shikamaru Piov. When he had been summoned to a briefing along with the other members of the Akatsuki Suppression Platoon, he had naturally assumed it was to disclose information about the dangerous organization. His hunch had been proven correct, little booklets had been given to each squad leader, while the Hokage briefed them. The Akatsuki was said to have had ten members. But due to death or simply lack of intel, Kanofa only had the names of six current members. Atachi Achiha, Kisum Hoshigaki, Kakuzu, Konan, Pain, and Zetsu. Those were the ninjas that Orochimaru of the Sanin had confirmed as being active members. Said confirmation came in the form of personal notes taken from his base after his termination. And hadn't that been a surprise? To him and everyone else in the room aside from the Hokage, the particulars of Orochimaru's death had not been disclosed, nor had there been time to ask about it because they had been deployed right afterwards. What they did receive included bingo book entries on those who had them, additional information from the snake summoner, and strong warning to never engage that pain figure. Personally, Shikamaru would have been fine with never engaging any of those S-rank individuals, but duty called. Unfortunately, with that information, a general plan had been worked out. The platoon would move quickly to set a perimeter 150 kilometers around the fire temple. At the same time, the report from the monk had not contained enough details to determine just which duo had attacked the temple, so the habits and personalities of each had been taken into consideration. With Kakuzu's love of money, the perimeter had shifted to cover the nearest bounty stations. One squad, however, would not fall into that formation, but instead head directly to the center to confirm whether or not Churiku's body was taken. Using the new communication scrolls, the findings would be sent back to the leaf, and from there dispersed to the whole platoon. But never let it be said that the new, hyper-competent Naruto wasn't still unpredictable. Said blonde had appeared at the deployment site, and created a clone to shadow every squad, while the original, according to him, had joined Shikamaru's team led by Asuma sensei It was interesting to learn that shadow clones shared their memories when they dispersed. It certainly added another layer to the five-on-one shogi matches, and made his victories that much sweeter. Shikamaru blinked, discarding that train of thought and focusing on the ones pertaining to the mission. The signal would come any second now, and he couldn't afford to any distractions against shinobi of this caliber. His glance around at his squad members standing in a loose formation, each of them coiled and ready to jump into action. Standing a few paces ahead of them was Naruto looking uncharacteristically grim in full battle attire. The blonde was holding a closed fist over his right shoulder, and as Shikamaru watched, the hand opened and made the sign to advance. Team Asuma moved, flashing from branch to branch in the direction that Naruto had indicated. While they ran, Shikamaru tried forming a mental map of the distance traveled in an attempt to measure the minimum range of the blonde's sensing technique. Information like that was critical if they should ever do a mission again after all. As the trees thinned out to reveal a path with two groups on it, he estimated that they had been a little over two kilometers out. Definitely noteworthy. His sensei, backed by Izumo and Kitetsu, dropped down exactly 20 meters from the duo. While he remained further back in a tree, the vantage point allowed him to see Team Aoba facing down Kakuzu and his gray-haired partner. Despite a silent landing, the rogue ninjas still sensed the arrival of Team Asuma as the shorter of the two turned around completely leaving his back open to attack. What's this, eh? 
Looks like they aren't alone, Kakuzu, he stated with a leer. Shikamaru took in his appearance, odd purple eyes, headband around his neck, and chest left bare under his open cloak. In his hand was an oversized scythe with three blades that he moved around with apparent ease. But that symbol, it's another guardian something or whatever. His lazy voice belied the anticipation shining in his eyes. Another one for Jashin. At his words Kakuzu, who was holding what had to be Chiriku's body behind him, positioned his body to take in both groups at once. His green and red eyes moved over Team Asuma, dismissing them one after the other to focus on the squad leader. Asuma Saratobi, third of five million. So he's worth more than that one. The smile that crossed his face unsettled something in Shikamaru. Let me take him, Kakuzu. I'll have him feel the same beautiful pain that his friend experienced. Oh, look at this, he seems pretty angry already. Aside from running Chakra through his trench knives, Asuma Sensei didn't act out on his emotions. Something that had him sighing in relief as his eyes scanned the environment looking for any natural sources of shade. At the moment, the tree beneath him would serve as the best launching pad. No, there is likely a reason why his bounty is higher. Kakuzu responded while looking between the squads. I'll take him and his team while you can have the other. I'll assist you after I'm done. I won't need your help you fucker. The still unnamed ninja bit out. Despite that he turned to face Ino and Chaoji's team. The build of the big one, the hair and eyes of the girl, and the Shikaku look alike. They are another reiteration of one of the Leaf's most successful teams. The large one can expand the size of any body part, be ready for that. As for the Yamanaka, I doubt she will have much impact against one like you. Shikamaru held back a twitch at this reveal. It wasn't often that an opponent was this well informed and therefore ready to deal with the Ino Shikicho matching. It was becoming more and more apparent that Kakuzu was dangerous. But what exactly was his partner capable of to warrant such a belief? Useless trash I'm guessing. Shem PH, whatever, I'll take care of it. He was certainly capable of great arrogance that one. Kakuzu seemingly ignored him to focus on the largest threat present. There was a tense moment as everyone waited for the other to make the first move. When it came, Shikamaru questioned his vision. Kakuzu blew up. Black threads seemingly erupted forth from tears in his body, leaving behind a dark monstrosity in the ragged remains of the Akatsuki cloak. The Nara absentmindedly took in the fact that the majority of the mass was positioned at the back of what used to be a man, and there were masks attached to it. Four of them. As the alarmed Leaf Nin watched, one of the masks and a significant volume of living thread broke off to create an odd form, before grabbing Chiriku's body and leaping into the open air. Shikamaru worked out his thought process right away. Kakuzu obviously noted Asuma's interest in the body, and was using it to his advantage. Such a maneuver would have split Asuma's focus between the missing Nin, and his self-appointed task, while also requiring the Leaf Ninja to split up further in pursuit. Assuming that whatever Kakuzu just did wouldn't detract too much from his strength, then it would have been an effective psychological and tactical ploy. Good thing they had more than just two squads. With his eyes already on the flying shape, the Nara caught the moment when Naruto appeared before it, and struck the mask with enough force to shatter it. Grabbing Chiriku's body, the blonde somehow disappeared, leaving a mess of tendrils to fall to the ground. Was that an aerial body flicker? The sound of falling trees quickly captured his attention. In the center where the two Akatsuki members had stood, there only remained the unknown. While Naruto occupied the area where Kakuzu had been, a trail of devastation starting behind Team Aoba and leading further into the forest, hinted at the bounty hunter's whereabouts. The plan, more a general guideline than the multi-layered plans he usually employed, had almost been foiled. The original intent had been for both squads to confront the Akatsuki in a staggered order. The first would grab their attention and stop them from moving forward. If the second could catch them unaware, then so be it. But their main task was to further focus the opponent's attention, so that Naruto could get close for an accurate shot on whoever had Chiriku's body. Engaging before that step would have put the body at risk, which would have been counterintuitive for their goals. But now that the body was secured and the duo separated, the next phase could begin. Naruto dashed off with Team Aoba following to act as support. Hair for his part, the lone Akatsuki member didn't seem worried about what happened to his teammate, and instead smirked at Asuma, while readying his scythe. Looks like I get to kill you after all. We'll see about that. Izumo, Katetsu, I'll engage, intervene where you see the opportunity. Shikamaru, you know what to do. Upon getting confirmation, Asuma stepped forward to meet the charging opponent. Unleashing his customary jutsu, Shikamaru took control of the shadow casted by the tree underneath him to enhance his reach. He didn't strike immediately however, doing such so early without an understanding of his opponent, could lead to overplaying his hand. Kakuzu had been so set on facing Team Asuma, that he hadn't bothered giving away the Nara's fighting style so his shadows would be a surprise. Until then, he focused on analyzing the rogue Nin who was quite proficient with his scythe. Rather than being cumbersome, 
The weapon was used to keep Asuma from getting close enough to inflict any damage. Seemingly wild swings clashed against trench knives, and Shikamaru could tell Asuma felt the power behind those attacks. A formidable close-range fighter it would seem, but he had to have something extra to merit that Akatsuki robe. He could only wait to observe for so long however, each second that passed was one where Asuma was risking injury. If the rogue wouldn't willingly show his hand then they would force him, blindside him. Shikamaru called down from his perch. Katetsu and Izumo who had yet to directly join the fight aside from throwing projectiles, acted accordingly. From a scroll Katetsu summoned his special conch-shaped mace, which he then had burrow into the ground. Izumo ran through a quick chain of hand seals, but didn't execute a technique right away his time would come. The rogue and Asuma continued to clash with Asuma on the defensive, more often than not due to the cord attached to the scythe. With a metal spike in his free hand, the rogue could attack directly while harassing Asuma from random angles, with the triple-bladed farming tool swinging around. A surprisingly effective method which had the side effect of requiring focus on each side, user and opponent, Izumo. Katetsu prompted his close friend, I'm ready. Dashing forward, he spat out a flood of syrup, dousing the ground behind where the two were locked in combat. At the same time Katetsu's mace erupted from the ground beneath the rogue, unsettling his footing and launching him into the air. Batting the mace away with the spike, he recalled his side before landing, right onto the adhesive fluid. Shikamaru leapt at the opportunity. Before the rogue could perform any jutsu, the Nara's shadow connected with his, the sewing technique tearing into his flesh to further prevent movement. Even while Asuma's cloud of ash hid the Akatsuki member from view, Shikamaru could feel as he tried to resist, but at that point, it was too late. The cloud combusted kicking up intense heat while the light caused the shadows to vanish. So wound up, Shikamaru didn't allow himself to relax his ready stance, until after the fire had been put out, and Asuma removed the head off the charred corpse. Sighing to himself, he shook off the tension that had set in his shoulders. His first foray with an S rank, even if the fight itself hadn't been too nerve-wracking, the anticipation certainly had been. The fear that the rogue had a dangerous ability lying in wait for whenever he needed it had been all too real. But it seems they were unwarranted. Just what dash I'll want. His eyes pan around looking for the source of the voice. It sounded like it was coming from the downed Akatsuki member, but that couldn't be possible, could it? If he wasn't some sort of master puppet user, then that was his real head down there. Held in Asuma's wide-eyed grip, I'll make you all pay for this. He didn't fault his sensei for throwing the head to the side and leaping back. Subtly pulsing his chakra didn't do anything either. What kind of technique was this? Just wait until my head is reattached, I'll kill you all. Why had he expected this to be any different, especially after seeing the monstrous form Kakuzu had taken? But at the same time, was this it? Some sort of immortality technique. One revolving around the brain seeing as although the head was speaking, the rest of the body was inert. Not something you see every day, is it? For the rest of his life, the Nara would deny leaping in fright when he heard the voice beside him, clearing up at the Naruto clone standing on the tree where he had been seconds ago. His reply was understandably heated, where were you this entire time? Securing this, he held up a black storage scroll, one of the types specifically used for fallen comrades. Churiku, I also had to deal with a trespasser, likely a scout for the Akatsuki. Leaping down the clone gave the scroll to Asuma Sensei, who took it with a complicated expression. The Nara watched as the clone then moved to pick up the severed head, which had yet to stop screaming obscenities. What are we going to do with that? Asked Izumo. The Chunin looked just as ready as Shikamaru was to be done with this mission. Giving no verbal response, they all watched the clone grasp the head with two hands and concentrate on it. Before their eyes, charred skin and exposed bone slowly turned to stone, and soon what remained was more a toad head than human. Surprised like the rest, Shikamaru noted how the marking around the clone's eyes disappeared, and yellow shifted back to their original blue. Curious. Hadn't the original's eyes been red? At least the shouting stopped. Now it's done. He nodded to the rest of the body which was still not moving, but had started to leak a greater volume of blood, as one would expect from a decapitation. And it looks like my clone is done as well. The other squad is perfectly fine. Thank Kami. He sent a quick prayer in hopes that the Akatsuki remain out of the land of fire after this. The last thing he wanted to do was face another of those nin. Wait. What does he mean by clone? Eov. Restored. Kanoha, I see. Tsunade finally says at the end of the mission report. It was only the two squad leaders and I standing across from her as she hadn't wanted nine people in her office. Good work you two, your teams handled themselves well. That's enough for now so as usual after a mission like this, you get a week's worth of downtime. Don't forget the written reports. Yes slash hi, Hokage-sama. The two responded. After a nod from Asuma, 
They exit the office leaving me alone with Tsunade. So that went well, I'm guessing the rest of the platoon already returned. I ask while unsealing a scroll, they did, and it did. You worked with them, what are your thoughts on keeping the Akatsuki suppression platoon around? Not active, but ready in case this happens again. They're certainly efficient enough to make a difference, and with six members unaccounted for, it wouldn't hurt to keep them around. I do think the next time the Akatsuki acts however, they'll likely come directly for me. A direct attempt like what Itachi and his partner pulled. Yes, I see why you'd think that. The way things are heading, either they'll come to us, or we'll go to them. Jiraiya, I guessed. Unfortunately, they were his students once, so he feels pressured. I fear he may very well ignore my words soon. I sighed. Can't say I'm surprised. I'll make sure to talk to him before he leaves. Calm him down if I can. You do that. Perhaps one knucklehead can get through to another. She snorted. I wasn't really sure on how the confrontation with Nagato should go, especially with Drea beside me. He would likely go in with the intent to talk, and perhaps he'd get the chance after we beat them. But I don't know if he can convert the two. Without Mr. Charisma around, that task would fall on Jiraiya's shoulders. I have a potential solution, but it's still in the works. My second concern is where this fight would take place. I don't want it to be the Leaf nor the Rain Village, too many possible casualties. I should have some time to think on this further, if events don't change too much. What's this? Brown eyes flick between the scroll lying on her desk and me. I swear Naruto, if this is another attempt to increase my workload and bring more stress, I'll make you pay for it. It's not. I think it actually might turn out that way. Giving me a hard stare, the blonde unravels the scroll and pushes Chakra to release its contents. A corpse. Chalk white and in multiple pieces after getting splattered by a Rasengan but a corpse, nonetheless. Tsunade's hands light up with green chakra as she scans the thing. It was spying on us when we engaged Kakuzu and his partner. I explained. Emerging from the side of a tree, the thing didn't even register to my chakra sensing ability. Would have escaped me if it weren't for its negative emotions. More importantly however is its makeup. It feels like Dash Grandfather's cells. It's almost a perfect match for his DNA. She finished in shock and rising anger. Yeah, that, with its ability to avoid detection, I assume it's that Zetsu creature mentioned in the snake's notes. Their spy. It doesn't have the black side so maybe it's a clone or something. I was getting disturbingly good at this deception thing. It's for the best really. Jen. I waited for a few minutes as she performed scan after scan, before finally sitting back in her seat looking pensive. It's less than two days old. So you might be onto something with the clone idea. We can assume that the original's composition included a significant level of grandfather's cells, meaning increased regeneration capabilities and more potent chakra. Could possibly include access to his wood release. In short, I don't like this one bit. Maybe I'm forgetting his lesser used abilities. But I never saw White Zetsu use wood release. He could merge into landscapes and move around quickly, make clones, and eat things to dispose of them. Those in the 100,000 strong army were shown to be able to absorb chakra, create spores, and pose as real shinobi down to their chakra signature. Assuming Zetsu created that army by cloning himself, then he has all of those abilities which although not insignificant, aren't exactly would release either. What are we going to do? I ask her instead. For now, we wait and plan. And keep an eye out for more of them. I'll have a team do further tests on this to see what they make of it. Perhaps it can be used to our benefit, she decided. If that's all, you may leave and enjoy the rest of your evening. See you back on three days. Huh? Why three? You gave the others a whole week off. With this new headache to deal with, you'll be more helpful in here than ever before. She replied totally unapologetic. Vindictive even. Oh, fine. Later, Tsunade. I sent a wave over my shoulder. Maybe I should have just disposed of that corpse. By Naruto. Bobbing my head to a song from another world. I push my front door shut and lock it behind me. I then kick off the footwear and neatly place them to the side. Before reaching to the areas just under my armpits. Where my armor fastenings are. Making quick work of it. I pull of the various pieces, and seal it all into its assigned area on my right arm guard. Similar to the current rakage and whatever those things on his arm are, my vambraces are either always equipped or on my dresser when I'm asleep. Thus, they are very convenient for storing my valuables. It's from that same pocket dimension of sorts that I unseal two different packages onto the coffee table. Which isn't really called that here. A hey, whatever. After leaving the Hokage's office, I'd made a stop at the parcel office where mail from inside and outside the village was processed. Turned out today was my lucky day. Having an idea what the bigger one is, 
I open the smaller one. It's much softer to the touch and unwrapping it reveals a red garment made from silk. It came with a note. Naruto. I'm experimenting with a new fiber and discovered it feels amazing against bare skin. After making something for myself, the idea of a matching set for you came to me. Hope you like it. Ash you are holding the garment up in both hands. It looks like a pair of pants. She's right, the fabric is nice, but also too delicate for everyday usage. I suppose it's meant for sleeping with the way realization hits me. You all made us matching pajamas. Or that's what it sounds like, matching set for me right. Damn, our last encounter had ended on a happy note. But to think she remembered where I was from, and was willing to pay to send this to me. I really wish the reason I had given for being around Tenchi Bridge, hadn't been a lie. Really should have went to see her again. Missed opportunity there. Mental note. Send her a thank you letter. Also, design a jewel and scroll that's civilian friendly. I place the pants and letter beside me on the sofa, and turn to the large package. Before opening it though, I feel a prodding sensation causing me to chuckle. Knew I was missing something. Go on then. Kurama says after I summon the clone. All right. He's not the only one excited for this actually. Been waiting on this for a good few weeks now. Moving deftly, the outer cloth is ripped open, and then a wind-coated finger snaps the cords holding the bundle together. Doesn't look like much does it? Kurama muses, grabbing a panel of wood. They forgot to put assembly required on the outside. I joke, to anyone besides us, it would look like a woodwork project. Wouldn't be wrong either. Here, I think this piece is the base. Okay. Hold this there please and these here. This part's the top and the latch would go here. In short order Kurama and I fit the pieces together to form a box-like structure. It's a perfect square with each side about 30 centimeters long. At the moment, our hands are the only thing holding it up, but the fasteners came included along with a hinge for the lid and a latch to keep it shut. This seemingly plain looking thing was the foundation of what I plan on calling Pandora's box when completed. In Greek mythology the original container was said to have held all sorts of evil and misfortune. That was unleashed upon humanity when opened. I think the name will be very apt with what I plan for it. I'm going to seal Black Setsu into Pandora's box. As the earliest of Shogi master behind many of this world's conflicts and the person laying the groundwork so a crazy goddess can trap everyone in an illusion, he's pretty close to the embodiment of evil in my books. Deserves to be sealed for the rest of eternity. I also don't know how to permanently deal with him. He called himself a physical manifestation of Kagaya's will, and he's proven that old age won't do him off. He's also a very intelligent and wily creature, so if I were to blindside him with an attack, and he survives the odds of me finding him again in my lifetime are low. That's assuming he isn't immune to ninjutsu, and that tojutsu could even hurt him. So rather than discover the answer to that theory in the worst way possible, I'd rather use my sneak attack on something more likely to work. Will you do the experiment today, or do you want to finish this first? My partner asks me. Your clones could certainly perform the seal work in your place. Ah, yeah, they can. I look up from the box. I'll leave this to them. They're basically me so it should be fine. I create two clones who quickly move about the apartment, one fixing up an appropriate workstation right in my living room, while the other gets the right brushes and ink. Going back to my arm brace again, I summon a scroll which after a drop of blood summons a book. My personal journal of seals I've picked up over the years. Working with the seal and barrier department upon my return, contributed a good amount of the seals in here. I turn to a page about a fifth of the way in and leave the book on the coffee table. Using the blueprint in there, the clones will place seals onto each panel on the inner side. Then the box will be fully constructed upon which further seals will be added to connect the previous seals and make them work in harmony. Should maximize sealing capability. The final touches will be reinforcing the entire thing from external damage and securing it from being opened. It might sound like boring work, but I was kind of looking forward to doing it myself. For that sense of accomplishment because Kami knows. My plan for an anti-apparation seal isn't coming along anywhere near as well. That area of sealing is not easy. Seeing the clones settle down to work. I turn to follow Kurama. Despite how confusing the results of combining Indra and Asura are, the actual process is fairly simple. Combine their chakra. Seeing as how the four reincarnates I know were in a shinobi, their chakra permeated their bodies, meaning something like what Madara did was sufficient. He literally grafted a piece of Hashirama's flesh into himself if I remember correctly. So if that worked for him, I assume it would work for me too. Hence the samples I took from Sasuke little less than two weeks ago. The only issue that remained was the time it took before Madara unlocked the Rinnegan. Of course, I'm a lot younger than when he did it. Sources place Madara at age 30 or higher during the Valley of the End battle which should help, but it could still take some decades. I don't want that, and yet, I'm no expert at inciting reactions in Chakra. 
I had the idea of using electricity or some type of current as a catalyst, but it didn't make enough sense. I considered natural energy, but that was just from seeing it mentioned in the snake's work in conjunction with enzymes from Jugo. That was geared towards physical transformations and enhanced physical capabilities. Not what I needed. It did raise a few questions though. Assuming Sasuke's chakra is taken in and takes a while to merge with mine, would it just sit around? Could I potentially have mine, Sasuke's, and Kurama's chakras churning around in me? And I will likely use sage mode eventually, so I can add natural energy to the mix as well. Will those energies create an unforeseen effect? Could they speed up what I'm after? Guess I'll find out. Performing incision, I bite down on the piece of cloth. Even prepared for it that still hurt. After a moment, the clone moves on to apply the flesh sample into the wound. Hopefully, the towels are enough to prevent my mattress from being ruined. Coming around to my left side, a needle is stuck into my arm feeding from the IV drip prepared with the sample of blood. Only then does the clone begin healing the wound beneath my ribs. To make space for the blood transfusion, I'd had to lose an equal or greater amount of my own blood. Now that that part was done, I just needed to sit here until the drip ran out. What does it feel like? Kurama speaks up after the clone disperses with its task completed. Can't say. There's a faint sensation there, but don't know if it's lightheadedness or just circulation. I shrug the shoulder not connected to the needle. No autoimmune reaction as of yet. Chen. Yeah. Stuff like that doesn't really mean anything to him, does it? I think you should carry out the second operation. Yeah. The more I think about it, the better it sounds. If this is Operation Six Parts Chakra, then the second one would be called Operation Rinnegan. Of course. If the threats that come later are as serious as you think, it would be for the best. He would benefit as well. He adds, All these points I've already thought of. Operation Rinnegan calls for removing Sasuke's Manjaku Shuringen and placing them into myself, while giving him a touchies to create the Eternal for him. Kurama and I are of the belief that although it could take time, those eyes would eventually shift into my own Rinnegan. We also believe although this has less empirical evidence behind it, that the aspect of reincarnation could work to my favor. If Sasuke is Indra and I'm Asura, then to infer we have some connection wouldn't be amiss. Especially with his blood now flowing in me. We hypothesize that I have a decent chance of being the one person not a Chiha by birth, but able to wield their Dejutsu like they do. That means switching between the dormant and active phases of the Sharingan at will, and not incurring the chakra penalty that those like Kakashi do. Furthermore, with those becoming my eyes in a way and activating the Rinnegan myself, I would be able to switch between the different Dejutsu, like I remember Madara being able to do. As if that weren't incentive enough, my own Rinnegan would mean having a unique ability. Madara had access to the Limbo, while Sasuke had some sort of space-time technique, both very potent abilities. If either of the two plans should bear fruit in time for the events of Boruto, then it would be a game-changer. If I get both, I don't want to invoke bad luck, but I'd be optimistic about my chances. Trust me Kurama, my mind is already made up. I want it. What I need however is a way to obtain them without anyone else knowing. Especially Sasuke. Aside from the breach that it would appear as, it could also set a bad precedent. I don't want him coming after me in pursuit of power. After they battle, we could repeat our actions from previously, incapacitate him and perform the switch. He will not be able to differentiate between the eyes if the Manjikyu is new to him. Kurama begins and I quickly fall onto the same wavelength. If we seal his chakra before bringing him back, Tsunade will probably leave it that way until she's sure he can be trusted again. It could be a good while before he even has the chance to use those new eyes. Precisely time in which they will conform to him lowering the odds of him suspecting foul play. We're definitely glossing over a few things, but that's not a bad outline. I muse. This, this right here is why I keep you around, you sly old fox. This right here is why you need me, you annoying brat, to provide much needed wisdom. He retorts. I laugh, relaxing back into my pillow. Having a partner through this whole mess makes a real difference. Who knows what I'd do without a sounding board. Asuma, Piov, stepping out of the shower, he reached over for his towel to dry himself off. Placing it back on the rack he moved over to the sink to finish with his pre-bed rituals. Minutes later, he walked out into his bedroom to behold a sight that brought a smile to his face. Asuma wasn't perfect, he recognized that, and had come to terms with it. There were many things he regrets, chief among them being his relationship with his past father, and the way he dealt with problems back in his youth. If he could go back and smack some sense into the selfish and annoying brat he used to be, he would. But life doesn't work that way so all one could do was learn and do better in the future. Despite his failures, or perhaps due to his failures, he had a number of bright spots in his life, 
and he made sure to cherish them all. His home, his students, his friends. They all added their own light to guide him in this dark world. But one person was held above all others. Raven Locks, eyes made of ruby, fair complexion, the loveliest face and a body to put all other women to shame. Such was an apt description of the one who held his heart. You're staring darling. Cora and I smiled, cheeks a touch of red in front of his adoring gaze. Only because you are the most beautiful thing in the world. He replied. I could stare at you for the rest of time and not get tired of it. She sat reclining against the head post of his. Their bed wearing only a loose kimono opened in the front. It exposed a mouth-watering amount of her generous breasts, and even a hint of pink on one. But aside from an appreciative pan, he only had eyes for her stomach, her slightly rounded stomach. He was going to be a father soon. Well, you can do more than just stare. Even her laugh had become a precious thing in his mind, meant to be protected at all costs. You already have in fact, a delicate hand moved down to caress her bump. I know. Smile growing, Asuma joined her on the bed to lay his head in her lap and a hand of his own, on where their child was developing. When her fingers starting brushing through his beard he rested his eyes, content in the moment of comfortable silence. It was moments like these that Leaf Nin fought and laid down their lives for. So, he started, looking up to meet her eyes. I've been thinking, about what you asked me. Oh, I'm assuming you've changed your mind then. The mission. Yes, Asuma sighed. It really put things into perspective. Nothing went wrong per se. In fact, the mission went as well as it could have. Both the primary and secondary objectives had been fulfilled, and no one sustained any injury. A perfect outcome if there were ever any. But at the same time, my mind can't help but consider how things could have turned out differently. If either of us squads would have encountered the Akatsuki alone, he breathed out and took solace in her warmth and sent around him. I think it's time I spoke to Hokage-sama and got a new placement. If that's the case, know that I'll support whatever you choose to do. An administrative post wouldn't be a bad fit however. Kora and I suggested, standard hours meaning you'll be with me every night. And you know how itchy, I get by then. That is a good point. Wouldn't want you to deal with that itch yourself. Asuma laughed before turning contemplative. I could do that. Taking another group of genins could also work no. It would be a while before they take missions outside our walls. An eyebrow rose. Didn't know you enjoyed being a sensei that much. What was there not to like? Maybe at first it was challenging, but after that, it was smooth sailing. I can attest to developing three great ninja for my village. Hum, it would be different. I doubt you will be assigned another group as calm as your first one. You lucked out with Shika and Chaoji there. True, but your team wasn't too rowdy either. He pointed out. One was an Aburam, and the other was Hanata. Only Kibo was a handful, and he got better after his first Chunin exam. She smiled fondly. Perhaps she would take another team in the future. Speaking of Hanata, she told me about seeing Naruto working in the Hokage's office. What's that about? I'm not sure. No one seems to know the reason why. Perhaps he's making true on his goal to become Hokage. He shrugged. Isn't he kind of young though? His whole generation actually. I'm not saying it's impossible. But they have a long way to go before we can hand the reins to them. Unbidden, a conversation on the way back from the mission came to Asuma. He fought that monster alone. He questioned Raido in a low tone. Noticing the faint accusation in his voice, the scarred special Jonan just nodded. That was the plan. Our presence was never required. Asuma's gaze landed on the subject of the conversation tree hopping a short ways ahead of them. Said Blonde was conversing with his classmates who had taken the chance to swap stories. How strong is he? He mused. Kakuzu faced a force of nature. Yuzumaki simply outclassed him in speed and strength. Likewise in jutsu application. Raido explained with typical levelness. I would compare it to seeing the fourth in combat. Few could match him. And in the end, it was just a clone. A clone using the Kaiwubi's power. But yes, a clone. Putting aside the memory, Asuma replied to Kuranai. It's expected that each coming generation be stronger than the one before it. I, for one, am not too worried about them. They will do just fine. It was good to see a son of a Hokage live up to the expectations placed on him. Meanwhile in the leaf Kakashi Piov, as he flew through a tree and narrowly avoided doing the same with another one by using a well-timed wind jutsu, Kakashi had to admit that hadn't been the most well-thought-out plan he'd ever had. Perhaps the earlier blow to the head was to blame. If head onto jutsu wouldn't work, then it's time he attempted something different. Landing on a tree branch, his keen senses easily detected the sounds of water slowly moving within a river, so he leapt in that direction, after creating a mud clone to deceive the opponent of course. Such a tactic would have worked perfectly a few years ago. Too bad his cute little genin had turned into a right terror behind his back. Kakashi landed on the surface of the water with barely a ripple. Not too long afterwards special Jonin Naruto appeared a few meters from the riverbank, but by then, 
half the needed hand seals were complete. Feeding his chakra into the jutsu, a dragon materialized from the river and started growing at a rapid rate. At the same time, the second level to his plan showed itself as the mud clone revealed it had circled back around and attacked Naruto from his blind side. It didn't last longer than two seconds, but that was all Kakashi needed, as the water dragon had grown large enough to pose a threat, and he went to have it target the blonde. And yet, a distant part of his mind commented on how content Naruto seemed to just stand there, not at all compliant with the blonde's display fighting style so far. That brief moment of forewarning was the only thing that allowed him to use a chakra reinforced jump and avoid the explosion of water as the dragon flew into the area he had evacuated. Reaching the apex of his jump, he flung several lightning laced shuriken downwards and multiplied them with a jutsu of the third's creation. The projectiles functioned as a smoke screen as he landed on the opposite side of the river and used an earth jutsu to slip underground. Jiraiya Sama's analysis of the blonde had included primary affinities of wind and water, but he had left out just how far along his pupil was. It took an extraordinary level of control and a not substantial amount of chakra to commandeer another's jutsu like Naruto just did. Traits that not many obtained so early in life, not during the times of relative peace. Despite the current situation he was in, Kakashi felt a sense of pride run through him. Should have expected nothing less from his sensei's son. Navigating his way through the earth, Kakashi looped around and resurfaced in the field they had initially started. He saw no point in turning this into a long, drawn-out affair. When the Yuzumaki had more chakra and stamina than he did, he'd rather spent that time with his new book. Truly, Jiraiya Sama was a blessing from Kami herself. Giving up already Kakashi. Of course he'd be there waiting, pulling two kunai from his pouch. The copy ninja's lone Shuringen gained a dangerous glint. His signed edition of Make Out Paradise. What the heart wants could wait while he humbled his junior. Your skill as a sensor makes me envious. He commented idly as he leaned his back against a tree. His poor, humbled back. Really? I know you have your dog summons for tracking, but I assumed you had some type of sensory technique as well. Naruto replied as he unsealed a bento from his Vambris, something that was quickly becoming as customary to the blonde as the old orange outfit had been. They were certainly more functional than those eyesores. I do, but it isn't my main method. He happily took the proffered stick of Pocky. Thanks. Hum, not bad. Anyways, I'm not a natural sensor. So I can't use it to easily distinguish between clones or track someone using the headhunter jutsu like you can. Shame. I for one can attest to how useful it is. It's like a Byakugan with how I can observe people outside my range of sight. He took a bite out of his snack. To be honest however, my technique is different from others you might run across. How so? Kakashi took another piece without shame. Maybe he and Naruto should spar more often if he'd get fed like this. Did you create it yourself? like the Rasengan variant used on the mission to retrieve the Kazakage. In a way, over the years I was gone, I made a lot of progress in using the power inside me. Naruto started. Kakashi sat up somewhat, not expecting Naruto's tenant to be part of this story. Don't worry, it went well. So long story short, I got a few abilities from that training, and one of them is the ability to sense negative emotions. That's new, a great tool to have especially when dealing with Shinobi, but it could also alienate certain people. Shinobi pride themselves on both keeping a tight rein on their visible emotions, and also being able to read others. Those traits helped one survive longer in a treacherous world after all. So it stood to reason that abilities that could negate or enhance those traits were taken note of. Sensing emotions might not be as invasive as Yamanaka mind techniques, but it could certainly prove more alarming if its usage couldn't be detected. Kakashi suddenly became more self-conscious about what he was feeling at the moment. Were they negative enough to be felt? What about moments where he was stuck in the past? Was melancholy a negative emotion? He blinked and pushed those thoughts away. They wouldn't lead to a good place. Through the Nine Tails power you say? He asked instead. The source of the most malevolent chakra he'd ever felt in his life had an ability to sense negative emotions. Made sense in a twisted way. Not what one would assume right. Anyway, I created a method where I could use that ability without having to enter the full chakra shroud it came with. For the price of lesser physical boosts, I can sense emotions like fear, anger, or rage within my range. Interesting. I would assume clones don't feel emotions like a normal person, due to being temporary constructs. Am I correct? Yup. I've only sensed anything resembling emotions from shadow clones, and even then, it's a muted thing. Naruto explained, unlike normal sensory techniques which skilled nin can hide from, my empathy senses fail proof for the time being. So as long as your target is feeling the appropriate emotion, they can never hide within your range. Like I said, your skill as a sensor makes me envious. 
says the guy who knows over a thousand jutsu. Although I have yet to see you use 30 different techniques. A. 1000 is somewhat of an exaggeration. More of a ploy to build reputation for client purposes. He shrugged lazily. And to be honest. I can't use a number of the jutsu I've copied over the years for one reason or another. As talented as Kakashi was, he wasn't on the level of the professor as he had yet to master all the basic elemental affinities. This meant certain jutsu couldn't be performed without rigorous training, and others while he could do them, they weren't comparable to someone who had a trained affinity. While he could reasonably train to meet those requirements, other techniques simply called for too high a chakra expenditure or a special blood limit. I know, just wanted to hear you admit that out loud. The blonde smiled before turning serious. That's not exactly common knowledge, so I'd appreciate you keeping it to yourself for now. No one can counter it if no one knows about it. Your secret is safe with me. Kakashi nodded. Every nin should have a technique or two to give them an edge over opponents. Speaking of secret jutsu, you know, you're not the only one who used the last two years to get stronger. I have a new technique myself. Really? Naruto sat up, his blue eyes scanning for something. Did you finally add shape transformation to your Chidori? Ah, no. He answered, some of the wind leaving his sails. A good guess, but his continued failure to succeed at that particular endeavor rankled him. Not that, something better. And before the blonde could attack his pride again, he uncovered his left eye and applied chakra to it. To be honest, he still wasn't quite comfortable with the sensation as the eye transformed. The Manjaku. Since when have you had that? Years ago. But I didn't know about it, and thus couldn't activate it until recently. Well, seems he was coming off as a real idiot today. Hum, I remember you saying Itachi's advanced eyes really strained his body. With that being an implant, can you actually use it? Naruto asked him with a hard look. Even though I'm not the same person who faces abuser and collapse right afterward, I'll admit this new form does come with high demands. It requires a staggering amount of chakra and Tsunade Sama warns me the eye could deteriorate with overuse. I've only used it while training and sparsely at that. One never knows when a technique could be useful, so he'd rather develop it to an adequate level instead of regretting not having it should a danger present itself. A good safety measure. Have you figured out what it does? Seems Atachi had two different techniques so assuming each eye had one, you should have a single ability. What is it? It's a time and space technique from what I've observed. It takes something within my line of sight and warps it away, Kakashi explained. And before you ask, I do not know where they go, and I can't recall them. It's a one-way journey to elsewhere. Limits. I need to have a direct visual on it. Mass is somewhat proportional with chakra cost. Works on all states of matter. And there is a focal point where the warping begins and once started. I can't move that point until I stop the jutsu. You didn't say anything about what happens if the medium the focal point is on moves. Naruto pointed out. I would assume something moving fast enough to escape my line of sight would be able to get away. Same for teleportation techniques and substituting. I would assume. Sounds like a useful tool for desperate situations then. The last part is because it's chakra intensive and hurts your eye. Naruto finally said after a moment of deliberation. So I won't ask you to demonstrate it for my benefit. But I would like to be present next time you train. Odds of a clone actually surviving the process are likely low. Kakashi pointed out having guessed what his old student had in mind. It would disperse before seeing anything. If there is anything to see that is. Remember the chakra shroud I mentioned? Well, I'm pretty sure it should make the clone durable enough. Especially if you're careful when casting the jutsu. Naruto argued. The silver-haired jonin saw no reason to oppose such an experiment. No one would get hurt. The Sharingan was debatable. And he certainly wanted to know where he was sending all those test dummies. If Naruto wanted to help then he would accept. Sure, I'll invite you to the next training session. As he said that he took the final piece of Pocky. As payment of course. Sakura, P of. It's more than just that Eno complains as she moves about tidying the flowers on display. I feel like there's something they're not telling us. Something only those at the top know. From her position leaning against the counter, Sakura rolls her eyes in amusement. Well, if it's that high up, why make such a big deal out of it? Maybe it doesn't concern us. But that's just it. I've been working with my dad in the analysis department, and he's usually open about things, or at least lets me know what it's about. But lately they've been doing something and won't let the junior analysts be around. Still don't see why you of all people should be involved. Even if your father is in charge of that division. She laughs. Because there's only one entrance to the branch and I've seen Naruto walk in with no issue. Naruto, you sure? Yeah. The blonde sends her a smirk over her shoulder. He's not wearing orange anymore. 
but that doesn't make him any less noticeable. Ignoring her best friend's antics, Sakura focuses on what she just said. What would Naruto be doing in there anyway? He's never showed any aptitude in interrogation. Well, he also didn't use to fight S ranks by himself, so maybe he picked it up while away. The blonde shrugs before casting an eye around the flower shop and nodding to herself. She then moves behind the counter to drop off the work apron and then joins the pinkette at the register. Have you noticed anything while with Tsunade Sama? Not about this I don't think. Sakura answers. Her sensei had asked her and Shizun to study a cadaver brought in from the Akatsuki mission a couple weeks ago. But that didn't really explain anything. As far as she knew, no prisoners had been taken alive from that mission, so they wouldn't bring a dead body to the analysis team. Plus, Tsunade Sama had sworn them to secrecy about the cadaver, due to its composition. ENA from the first. Shame. From the way I see it, they must be investigating something or someone from inside the village. That's the only way it could be kept so quiet. At that comment realization came to Sakura. From up here, the village might present a unified front, but don't let that fool you. Not every Leaf Nin is on our side, it's the rogue aspects within our command structure. Naruto had said that. To her, did that mean Tsunade Sama was in the process of eliminating the traitors within the Leaf? Yeah, that could explain it. One or more of them must have been apprehended and was now being interrogated for intel on the rest, perhaps. Maybe they were just being quiet about it, so any conspirators wouldn't realize the hokage was onto them. Hey, I know that look. You know something about this. Eno asked her, pupil less eyes, or just eye with one covered by her hair, drilling into her. What is it Sakura? I, uh, I just remembered something Naruto said to me a little after he got back. She responded hesitantly. Would it hurt to tell Eno? Well, I'm all ears here. Her friend prompted making her sigh. Look Eno, Naruto told me about something because he felt I should know about it. That it could have something to do with our old team and therefore involve me. He didn't want me going in blind. She tried to explain to her inquisitive friend without going into too much detail. If you're in some kind of danger, no. I don't think that's the case. In fact, I think this is a good thing if I'm reading it correctly. We should probably just leave it alone. No need to tip off the enemy. Or risk it, if you say so. Eno reluctantly backs off. But are you sure you can't tell me? Sorry. It's probably best if I don't. And besides, Naruto has been tight-lipped about most things regarding his abilities and his plans. If he found out I told you when he warned me in secret, he might never confide in me again. Sakura shrugged helplessly. She would say her old teammate was being overly paranoid. But this conversation was making it clear that there were indeed threats close to home. Ugh, I guess. But it's not like he would have found out from me that you shared. Sure, it's not like you've been trying to get his attention recently. She remarked dryly. No, I haven't. But if we did somehow randomly and purely on coincidence bump into each other, I'm sure we'd have other things to talk about. Eno denied to which Sakura scoffed. Don't believe you. And he's a lot more perceptive now so even then, it wouldn't be too surprising if he saw through you. In more ways than one. I've been meaning to ask about that actually. What's up with Naruto these days? Like, he went off with Jiraiya-sama for a couple years, and came back a completely different person. There has to be a story behind it all. You know, looking back I would say the changes started even before the trip, right after Sasuke left. Sakura felt the familiar pang in her chest, as she mentioned the desertion of her crush. To this day, she still had feelings for him. To her credit, Eno noticed, and her tone became softer. I hadn't realized. You think yeah, that changed him I think. She made an effort to brush away the uncomfortable atmosphere. He became more distant after he got out of the hospital. Started training more is what Tsunade Sensei tells me. I can't really blame him. If Shika or Chaoji had left the village, I don't know what I would do with myself. Probably wouldn't handle it as well as you two did. Ino confessed. Yeah, she blinked. When you factor in the Akatsuki and how they're after him, it's no surprise that he became so focused. It could be the difference between life and death. He's done well so far is all I can say. Eno said in an upbeat manner. It wasn't necessarily faked either. Almost half their number has been eliminated. And even though some people are thinking Jiraiya-sama did it. I think Naruto was also involved in taking out Orochimaru. Most likely, an increasing number of people knew about the death of the Sanin, but almost no one knew how it happened, so they attributed it to another Sanin, since it made the most sense. Jiraiya-sama was both in the public eye, and yet also worked covertly enough that he fit the perfect mold for such a surprise operation. With Naruto's newfound strength, it wasn't improbable that Jiraiya would take his student along when he faced his rogue teammate. Beyond that, the timing of when Naruto started working in the Hokage's office was somewhat fishy. Ino was actually on the right track then, 
something was going on, and Naruto had a role in it. That's it, just most likely. What more can I say? You made a good point and I happen to agree with it, she defended. I expected to hear more details. Something that no one else would know since you two hang out sometimes. Don't tell me all you do is train. Her tone made it obvious she wouldn't take that for an answer, but Sakura really had nothing else to add. Naruto certainly hadn't fessed up to anything. Are you asking me to lie to you? She wondered. ECH come on Sakura. You're the only one of us besides Shika who actually knows anything, and he won't share. Sakura turned away from the pouting blonde. Maybe there's a reason for that. Actually, why don't you just ask Naruto himself? Better than asking someone who doesn't have concrete answers. I don't know where he lives. Ino shrugged. You know where to find him when he's not at home. It was common knowledge that Naruto could be found in the Hokage's office during the day. And risk making Tsunade-sama angry. There's only one blonde she has a soft spot for, and we both know it's not me. You won't know until you try, Sakura said sweetly. Perhaps a one-way trip through a wall would get her to calm down. I bet Hinata knows where Naruto lives. Think she'd tell me? Ino asked instead, completely ignoring her and likely plotting something. Hinata, give the location of her crush's residence to another girl. As if. Maybe Ino really does want to be put through a wall. Anko, P of. The Kinochi behind the desk eyed her ninja registration information for a quick second, before handing the card back. Giving her a nod, Anko briskly walked by her. Entering the intelligence division building was always a tedious process regardless of identity. Perhaps the reigning Hokage was permitted some leeway. But for everyone else, verification was required for every visit. The main hub was where most of the security was focused. But each individual branch had their own lesser measures, meant to verify purpose and clearance level. She worked with the torture and interrogation branch. But right now she was making her way down the corridors of the analysis team branch. Her path soon led her to a large circular room, where a strange structure was the sole decoration. It was made in two parts, the one in front being a semicircle with a notch and an opening near the flat side, while the second part was a crescent of sorts, hugging the round portion of the semicircle. Both were covered in an assortment of seals, but Anko couldn't begin to make head or tails of it. All she knew was that it was used in conjunction with a Nochi Psyche invasion jutsu. It wasn't in use at the moment, but she knew the traitor Danzo had been attached to it within the previous hour and would be subjected to it again, until he had no secrets to disclose. The thought of the disgraced elder brought a frown to her face, so she pushed that away, as he wasn't the reason for her trip down here. No, the reason was solely due to one of the two individuals conversing in the room. She didn't know how long their dialogue would last, so she took a few steps back, and found a comfortable spot to lean against the wall. A quarter of an hour later and the two separated with one heading her way to leave, while the one she'd came looking for stayed put. This was her chance. Hello there Anko-chan. The last male Sanin greeted her as he approached. I suppose you wish to speak to my student and not me. Yes, Jiraiya-sama. As long as I am not interrupting. She bowed. Being polite was not a habit of hers. An open coat was the only thing keeping her mesh-covered breasts decent after all. But sometimes it was called for. Speaking to one such as the Toad Summoner was one of those instances. Especially when he looked as serious as he currently did. There was no trace of the perverted persona she had witnessed on previous occasions. Of course not, he's all yours. With a nod he made his exit leaving her to make her way over to the blonde. Anko. Anko Mitarashi, right? Was the first thing he said to her since the tune-in exams all those years ago. He certainly had grown since then, they were around the same height now. Yes. And you're Naruto Yuzumaki, the one who finally killed Orochimaru. She responded looking into his cool blue eyes. She found herself explaining before she even realized it. I was given clearance to work on the Danzo case. I though so, there's a lot to deal with regarding his situation. So I'm sure multiple heads were brought in. What do you think of it so far? She did not hesitate. The village is better off without him. After what happened with her sensei. The one thing she hated above all else was a traitor. A close second was one who abused a position of power and made their underlings suffer. Danzo, the scum, met both of those criteria. When news of Orochimaru's true colors had been publicized, she'd been placed under a lot of negative scrutiny by those who'd never known her. Because she'd been his student, many thought she'd been compromised. That she'd known of and supported his cruelty. They thought the seal on her was a sign of his favor rather than the curse it truly was. If they'd bothered to look deeper, they'd have seen she was just a little girl who was abandoned by someone she trusted, 
and had no one to support her. That Orochimaru had fooled her even worse than he'd fooled the village. Despite being proven innocent and forming bonds with those around her, there were some who still doubted her to this day. Danzo had been one of those people. He hadn't kept his distaste for her a secret believing her to be a liability. And now the truth was out. Not to everyone but the select dozen also with clearance, knew about Danzo's treachery and his schemes. He was the liability and security risk that she'd enjoyed being able to work on beside Ibiki. He deserved all that and more. It wouldn't be long until he was executed. She was looking forward to it. I completely agree with you. Only wish he'd been found out earlier. The blonde nodded. But he'll get what's due to him soon, and hopefully his agents can be freed. It shouldn't be too long until they are rehabilitated. A couple months maybe. She actually had no idea because although psychological programming was something she had experience in, Jinjutsu that could permanently rewrite someone's personality was new to her. Luckily, that sorry excuse for a human had had the forethought to compel his agents to be loyal to the leaf rather than him personally. No doubt he thought impersonating a village would be more difficult than doing the same for one individual, and thus making it harder for his agents to be led astray. Whatever the reason, it left only the results of their harsh training regime to be altered, after which the leaf would gain a few dozen fiercely loyal nin. Anyways Yuzumaki, the reason why I came to talk to you was to say thank you. She started, not just because you discovered the traitor, but for finally killing Orochimaru. Mitadash, no, please, she didn't want to cut him off. But she also couldn't let him interject here, she needed this. Please let me say this. Get it off my chest, he was my sensei a long time ago. Before he was driven out, and even after the fact, his shadow always loomed over me. People looked at me different just for being associated with him, and I won't say the person I am today is a mask, but I know for a fact that their opinions shaped me. Shaped me because of him and what he represents to everyone. A monster. She took a deep breath to try and calm herself down. This was not going how she had practiced, but at least he was giving her the moment to vent. As a Jinchuriki, he probably understood what she'd gone through better than anyone else ever could. For a long time, my fondest dream was to one day kill him. To stand above his corpse and to know he wouldn't be allowed to haunt me anymore. But in the end, her jaw clenched before slowly loosening as she shook her head in that forest. He showed me the truth. Little Enko-chan would never be able to kill her sensei. He wouldn't allow it. A hand moved to rub her left shoulder. Just the memory brought up phantom pain. My dreams were stomped on that day. Torn to shreds as I realized I didn't have the power to take down a Sanin. Not on my own. My only hope was for someone else to kill him. That was the only way for me to be free of him. So I prayed for that person. And then you did it. She was staring into his soul at this point. You killed Orochimaru where the third and so many others had failed. I never considered it would be you. I don't think anyone did. But you did it. So if you can take anything from my rambling, then I want it to be this. Thank you Naruto Yuzumaki. Thank you for freeing me from a nightmare. His eyes held hers for a long moment before he nodded. You're welcome Mitarashi. Just like I told Jiraiya, I didn't off the snake with anyone else in mind, but I'm happy to hear my action brought you some peace. Since we're on this topic, were you allowed access to the documents I took from his bases? If you're talking about his notes regarding my curse mark then yes, I do know about them. Hokage-sama felt that I should know, although the science of it all went above my head. She admitted, all she really got from that discussion was that her sensei was dead, and that her seal was a potential method for him to be resurrected. A method she was essentially safeguarding. The irony, yeah, I just skimmed it all myself, so I don't understand it either. Yuzumaki shrugged. It's good that you were told though, was worried I would have to break it to you. Jam PH, she felt a smirk come over her face. Worried I would break down and do something stupid, she asked jokingly. Although, the scene where she attempted to do a suicide technique to take out her sensei, came back to her mind. Perhaps it wasn't merely a joke, mostly the breakdown part. Strangers crying to me isn't something I'm really equipped to handle. His lips twitched in a smile. If she'd been looking for a K, then that was it right there. How about we fix that then? She offered with her own smile. The stranger part. I would like to hear the tale of Orochimaru's last stand, and seeing as how you had the best vantage point, you're the man to ask. A good meal and an even better story. Sounds like the start of a great friendship, don't you think? I suppose you do deserve that story more than anyone. The smile that had been struggling to come out, finally made a full appearance. That I do. My treat. She sweetened the deal. Okay. Lead the way. Jiraiya, Piov. He faintly chuckled to himself as he made himself scarce. Even outside his writings, his godson seemed to have the luck of a protagonist. Now if only some of that luck would come his way. Exiting the building, Jiraiya took note of the gloomy evening sky. 
that cinched with his current mood quite well. His mind once again turned to the northwest, to the war-torn village of Aim. He'd been a fool to leave them back there. Really, why hadn't he just brought them to the leaf? They were orphans with no connection to the village besides unpleasant memories. So ultimately, the decision would have fallen to them if he'd made the offer. Even if he did have a war to continue fighting in, he should have gone back for them afterwards. It would have been the smart thing to do, the humane thing. But as of now, it might be too late. No, he shouldn't entertain that thought. It could very well be that they needed him now more than ever. Conan, Nagato, Yuhiko, innocent children turned into S-category criminals. Orochimaru believed them to be in the upper echelon of the Akatsuki. Leaders even. Jiraiya couldn't begin to imagine just what they'd experienced behind his back to lead to such an outcome however. The reports of pain having Yahiko's appearance paired with Nagato's eyes did not sit well with him. If one of them died taking a steadying breath, he forced down all the anger and anxiety. Decisions made under the influence of those emotions would only lead to disaster. It's for the best that Haim and Naruto talked him down into waiting for a good window to infiltrate AIM, as even he had to admit taking on numerous opponents of that caliber would not have been feasible. Alone that is, with a solid plan and Naruto beside him, he would attempt to do right by his old students. That was later however, until then he had an important package to deliver to the Toads, and overdue contacts to see as it was becoming obvious Danzo, would be a tough one to fully crack. He decided to go see Heim before departing. Maybe the protagonist's luck would work in his favor this time. Calm before the storm Sasuke Piov. It is just him atop the high bluff. Him and the nightmares that drive him. My foolish brother his fingers run through seals he's long since memorized. The resulting fireball soars up into the heavens and explodes. If you want to kill me curse me. Hate me. Another set of seals and the clouds take the brunt of multiple balls of fire. Run away, run away, and cling to your pitiful life. One more. A stream of flames escape from his lips, and finally the heavens can take no more. Clouds darken and thunder roars. It's time. These hand seals are likewise engraved in his mind. Chakra flares up around his hand pointing to the sky. The urge to bring it down and cast the final judgment is great. And then someday, when you have the same eyes as I do, come before me. The hand drops, and the sky is split with a bright flash of lightning. Kirin, Sasuke blinks away the spots left in his vision by the overwhelming might of nature. Brought about by him of course. Within seconds his vision clears, and he takes in the sight before him. Dirt and wildlife within the impact zone had been vaporized, leaving behind a burning crater several meters across. He could only nod to himself as a light rain falls, and begins putting out some of the wildfires. It might require clever planning and situational awareness. But his first original technique would certainly live up to expectations. It had to. Oh, I'm really starting to get tired of this place. The purple-eyed Sujetsu complains loudly as they amble down a path in the Sky District. This is only the second time you've been here, you idiot. Karen snaps back from beside Sasuke. Yeah, well, that's one time too many. The nerve. She shakes her head and turns her nose up at him. You should be grateful they provide the supplies we need. Kami knows you're all but useless to us seeing as how you failed to find any of the swords. Sasuke grimaces internally knowing what Karen knowingly just instigated. Screw you. At least I'm not a waste of space in a fight like you. Sujetsu explodes. Shem PH. There's a reason Sasuke Kun came for me first. If Orochimaru would have had other shinobi who were as capable as these two yet quieter. Sasuke would have formed a team with them rather than Karen and Sujetsu. Unfortunately, they were the best help he could find. At least Jugo was different. Sasuke pushes aside those thoughts as he takes a turn from the main road and heads down a tunnel with visible pipes running through the ceiling. Back so soon, inquires a small voice near the ground. Could it be that you've accomplished what you set out to do? Denka. He acknowledges the ninja cat. Some of us have while others not so much. Karen responds to the question while aiming another barb at Sujetsu, which gets the result one would expect. Enough you two. They fall silent. Denka, we're here to see her before we set out. No problem, she's been expecting you for a good while. The clothed cat turns to lead the way. The four shinobi follow and soon find themselves in a little room where an old lady, a teenage girl, and a multitude of cats are sitting in wait. With a passive scan of the room, Sasuke walks over to the carpet and kneels before the elder. Granny, Sasuke Chan. He looks up to her wrinkled face. She has a dark, cat-like nose, and wears a band in her gray hair with ears on them. His younger self hadn't been wrong in addressing her as Granny Cat. 
A pipe in her right hand creates a faint aroma in the room. I suppose the time has come. You are ready to fight your brother. Yes. The displeasure is evident in her tone, but he pays that no mind. She doesn't understand. It has to be done. We will need more supplies before we leave. Please. And you will have them. Tamaki-chan. The brunette flits around gathering a few pouches and laying them in front of him, and then grabbing a large cleaver-like sword which she hands to Sujetsu. It's hardly a legendary blade. But if you are to fight one of the seven, then better that than nothing. Your friend can keep it. Really. The young swordsman did not waste a second in grabbing the blade and swinging it around, sword arm bulging with the artificial mass. I take back what I said earlier. This place isn't so bad. Such an idiot. Karen mutters under her breath. The water user sends her a sharp smile. That's one issue down. When he'd recruited Sujetsu the Hazuki had expressed an interest in finding the seven legendary swords from the mist and making them his own. It worked well for Sasuke's intentions, seeing as how Itachi's partner Kisum had one of those swords, and by joining the Achiha, Sujetsu would get the opportunity to challenge the tailless beast. Unfortunately, when Sasuke had led the team of three to take possession of the blade that had featured in his first C-turned-A rank mission, they'd ran into a setback. Someone had taken the blade from Zabuza's resting site, and then someone else had taken it from the grave robbers. There were no clues as to who has it now, but Sasuke would not be surprised to find it with the leaf. Or Naruto in particular, his old teammates certainly knew how to complicate matters. With no executioner's blade to challenge Kisum, Sujetsu and Jugo had dedicated the last month or so to pursuing the other swords not currently in possession of the mist. As Karen had no issue pointing out, his efforts were not met with much success. It made for high tempers and more vicious arguments whenever the two interacted. Sasuke would have helped, but his time was better spent training his body and honing the techniques he would use against Itachi. Now, with the Kirin under his belt and the proper sword for Sujetsu, they were ready. Their next step would be tracking down Itachi. I know nothing I say will change your mind, and I've accepted that. Granny begins making Sasuke turn back to her. But I do hope after it is all said and done, that you will find some measure of peace Sasuke-chan. In whatever form it may present itself, he bowed his head grateful for her aid, if not necessarily her words. Thank you Granny. Not much else is said before he takes the team and heads out. Images fly before his eyes as he walks. Memories of his family, his clan, back when they were alive. A father who was stern but loved them just as much as their affectionate mother did. An older brother who was frequently busy yet would play with his sibling from time to time. Just as fast as the memories appear, they turn dark. So many bodies. So much blood. Everyone he knew all of them dead. Not a single one survived that night. His eyes narrow in determination. He'd made a vow then, one he would see through. Nothing would deter him from that. Nothing at all. Tsunade P of. Her fingers tap idly on her desk surface as she scans the report in front of her again. Another sighting of Akatsuki members within the Land of Fire except they were named this time. Atachi Echiha and Kisum Hoshigaki. Skilled individuals with unique traits that made them even more difficult to prepare for. But she had faith in her ninja. Tsune did consider sending out the suppression platoon once more before deciding otherwise. The presence of Fugaku's boy complicated matters, given the nature of his last assignment from the leaf. After having him wipe out his whole clan, integrating him back into the village would be difficult bordering on impossible. And yet, the thought of simply eliminating him left a bad taste in her mouth. She'd had to make hard choices back when she was a foot soldier, and even recently as a cage. But this situation is different from previous ones, and she would never be able to forgive herself for making a rash decision here. For now, capturing Itachi alive is the best plan of action, and the best way to achieve that is with a strong yet covert strike force. My lady, they're all here, said Shizune before stepping aside and letting the members of Team Kakashi walk in. She then closes the door and moves over to stand behind Tsunade, who is taking the time to observe the trio. They all look healthy and aside from Kakashi, they're primarily in civilian wear. You're probably wondering why I called you three in here, since your team is yet to be reactivated. The reason for that is this report I just received. A hand gestures down to her desk, sightings of red clouds in the land of fire. More specifically, sightings of Itachi. Amusingly enough, it is her apprentice who shows the most outward reaction. She doesn't doubt the other two's ability to connect the dots, but neither of them display the same anticipation that Sakura does after doing so. You're all aware of this, Itachi is currently the one identified member of the Akatsuki who defected from the leaf, and is no weakling. Between him and his partner, the tailless beast, Itachi is without doubt more dangerous. She meets the eyes of Team Kakashi one by one before cutting to the chase. I want him captured and brought in alive. 
Aside from a nod, the second blonde in the room takes the news quite well. As he should being part of the task force to incapacitate the elder Danzo and his subsequent interrogations, Naruto knew exactly why she would want Itachi brought in. That's part of why she wanted this team for the upcoming mission. Kakashi's lone eye narrows. Tsunade imagines the shinobi is expressing multiple emotions with that reaction. From confidential mission reports she knows the two had history together having served in the same Ambu squad. Yet Itachi was also the one who'd left Kakashi Bedridden using a powerful illusion technique. That experience fighting with and against the Achiha should be beneficial. As for Sakura, her reservations about such a task are plain to her sensei's eyes. Capturing powerful shinobi alive is always harder than simply killing them, but needs must. Her ability as a medic nin and fine chakra control would be a boon. This team is being selected for this mission for two reasons. First, I have faith in the ability of this team to perform. Secondly, it is possible that by pursuing Itachi, you may very well come across your wayward team member, Sasuke Chiha. It is not guaranteed, but the chance of it happening means this team has a vested interest in this mission succeeding. That being said, if either of you would prefer not to be part of this mission, then speak up. Like she was expecting, no one objects. Now that we are on the same page, we can discuss the mission outline. The reports came through Jiraiya's network, and established their location to be south of the leaf as of two days ago. It's not very precise meaning the first part of the mission will be to find them. Naruto and Kikashi, both of you possess abilities that lend themselves to tracking, for the sake of keeping the assembled squad to a manageable size. Do you believe you need further assistance in finding the Akatsuki? Kakashi and Naruto share a look before the first nods and turns back to her, no Hokage sama You can rely on us to track them down. Not surprising. Kakashi and his dog summons already made for a formidable tracking unit. So when combined with Naruto's Senjutsu-provided sensing ability, along with his emotion sensing, the two had everything they needed regarding that aspect. Very well. That leaves only one subject to be accounted for which is Itachi's partner Kissum. Due to his special chakra consuming sword and a previous encounter, I am assigning team guy to this mission. They will provide the needed firepower to engage with shinobi of this caliber while also keeping the assembled squad from being cumbersome. Aside from Yunaruto, Team Kakashi should be familiar with working alongside Team Guy, which is another point in their favor. Are there any objections to this? As the team voices their assent with the chosen personnel, Tsunade nods to herself. An eight-man team is the largest she would have considered for the mission, so it's a good thing Team Kakashi has the required skill set to carry out the first part of the mission. It meant that she doesn't have to assign a tracking team, but instead focus on making sure whoever she picked would be able to contend with Kissum. Team Guy should be capable. That's good to hear. Shizun, if you would. The brunette bows and leaves the room. While we wait for Guy and his team to be brought in, I want to emphasize that Itachi is the priority. If you encounter Sasuke and can bring him in as well then that's fine, otherwise, I expect the older brother brought before me. Her voice gains a measure of softness. For what it's worth however, knowing Itachi is being held here will likely compel your teammate to return. Eov. Restored. Kanoha after what seemed like hours worth of strategizing, Tsune finally called it a day, and we were able to leave. Kakashi and Guy went off together. So it was just us five youngsters. It seems we've gotten another mission together Naruto-san. Niji comments as we exit the building. Yes, let's make sure it doesn't end the same way as our last one. I respond and catch an expression flit across his face. Probably remembering being used as a living pincushion. Indeed. Is all he says. Do not worry my comrades. This team is most youthful and will surely succeed. Lee declares with the utmost confidence. Got to agree with that part. The eight of us are more than enough. He likely won't need it, but I'm hoping to see Guy and the inner gates in action. Got to agree with Lee on this one. Tenton casts an eye over the group, you've all gotten stronger since that last mission, so your odds have improved. And better yet, I'm coming along on this one. She still hasn't let that go yet. Not like with the ones who picked that team years ago. And me too. Sakura affirms. She seems a little off though. We'll get Sasuke back together. Do keep in mind the primary objective. The Byakugan user cautions while coming to a stop at an intersection. This might be an opportunity to redeem ourselves. But only if Sasuke Chiha makes himself present. Hokage Sama warned against undue risks. Don't worry about that Niji. We all know what takes priority. Tenton waves it off. I live down that way so I'll see you all at the gate tomorrow. Bye everyone. Likewise. I must go as well. Goodbye Naruto, Sakura-chan. Waiting until they're gone, I turn to Sakura to study her. She'd originally been excited when hearing of this mission, but now there's something else mixed in. Join me for dinner. 
I offer her to which she nods and joins me as I walk towards my place. Huh. You're not heading to Ichiraku's. Sakura asks with a finger pointing in their direction. Guess the unexpected turn I took drew her out of the autopilot mode she'd been on. No, I had lunch with them earlier. And I'm in the mood for something different. Even though delicious and prepared by people who have always been nice to Naruto and Naomi, eating ramen twice a day is a stretch. I'm going to make something myself back at home. You still want to come? Yeah. Why not? I haven't seen your new apartment yet. It's near the Shinobi district, isn't it? I give her a look before she explains her question. I asked Sensei once, and that's what she told me. Well, it is. Come on. She's unusually quiet for the handful of minutes it takes to get there, and soon... I'm unlocking the door and beckoning her inside. This is it. Welcome Sakura Haruno to Yuzumaki Palace. Hum, Sakura took her shoes off near the door as was custom before looking around the living room and the connected kitchen. It's definitely new and clean. Fits with the current you. I think. I know. Could use some more decorations. But I haven't gotten around to doing that yet. I smile faintly at her expert breakdown of my pad. Don't get me wrong, you have a good start here. But some personal touches would really enhance everything. Show that someone lives here. She offers. I'll do that eventually. Give it a few more months. No need to spend time on stuff like that when they're not insured against almighty pushes. So, you were promised food. I could get it done much faster if you give me a hand. Clones were the usual option. But my senses tell me she has something on her mind. And cooking usually helps me work out my thoughts. What do you need me to do? She follows me into the kitchen and watches as I pull out pots and other materials. Actually, what are we making? I put out some meat there in the sink. So if you can prepare the vegetables while I work on that, we can have stir fry for dinner. Leave it to me. Sakura rolls up her metaphorical sleeves and gets to slicing. As for me, I start in on the boneless lamb. This really brings up old memories. Not because I was some cooking expert back on Earth, far from it actually, but because stuff like this had never appealed to me. Preparing meat had always been something my parents did while I was growing up, and when I went off for college, I had a meal plan, so there was no reason to ever learn how to do this. Somewhat embarrassing, but since I never got the chance to move and get a place of my own, it doesn't really matter. As a young orphan however, Naruto had picked up some experience in this field, and joining Team 7 had built on it so I had a good foundation to work with while traveling with Jiraiya. As we prepare the ingredients and then get around to frying everything, I glance periodically at my helper, whose expression faintly hints at the turmoil going on inside. With what we were talking about earlier, I have an idea as to what's bothering her, but I ask anyways while opening a cupboard where the plates are kept. Ryo, for your thoughts. Ryo, for my thoughts. She pauses, face a picture of confusion. What's worrying you? I explain. Thought that one would be easy to translate. It's not okay. Maybe it is worry. I have been looking forward to this opportunity for so long. A chance to finally make things right. Make Team 7 whole again or as much as possible. She trails off. It's good that she realizes the team won't be what it used to be. Too much has changed. Sasuke went rogue which is really frowned upon in shinobi society. I don't see it within me to create that bond of pseudo-brotherhood the two eventually had, and honestly just a bunch of other reasons. That will make themselves apparent when the time comes. And now, I ask leadingly. It's just how do you think he will respond? I raise an eyebrow in prompt. Sasuke. His dream ever since that day has been to avenge his clan by killing Itachi. He left us, left the village, because he thought Orochimaru could help him do that. That's the most important thing to him. I can tell it pains her to say something like that out loud. The plan is to use Itachi to get to Sasuke. So say we succeed in capturing them both, or maybe even just Itachi. How would Sasuke react to that when he wants to personally kill Itachi? Would he hate us? I find myself humming. There it is. The question I can't really answer because she's not allowed to know certain things just yet. I gesture with my head to move everything to the table giving myself a few extra moments to think this over. Sasuke wants to kill Itachi, while Itachi wants Sasuke to kill him. Neither one outside is butting in, so each will bring backup to ensure that. And then you have us, the Leaf, who want to go against what the brothers want. Even worse, it's the same Leaf that gave Itachi the task of killing his people. Yeah, either way you look at it, Sasuke will eventually have plenty of reason to be angry with us. But I don't want to depress her further. Honestly Sakura, you're right. We are absolutely interfering with Sasuke's mission and life, and he will definitely be mad if we succeed. Keyword there. If. Apologies in advance Tsunade. But I don't think it will be unsalvageable. This mission is just part of Tsunade's overarching plan, and I'm sure that if we handle it and any blowout accordingly, 
then the final outcome will be something we're all happy with. So it's a good thing that we are the ones assigned to it rather than a team with no connection to Sasuke. I won't tell you not to worry. I can't predict the future after all, but I'm certain that we'll be able to overcome whatever happens. She's silent for a while. And once again I acknowledge that comforting people isn't my strongest point. Maybe you're right, she nods hesitantly. Of course Tsune-sensei would have considered that issue. Instead of the negative, I should be looking at the positives. We'll deal with any problems as a team. Exactly. That's the attitude we need heading into this mission. Now, try the food and tell me if we did a good job. Smiling, she does just that. It's good. Taste it. I will. Just going to wait a few minutes in case you start feeling sick or someone joking. I catch a piece of veggie that had suddenly decided to become a missile and pop it into my mouth. Hum, it is pretty good. Well done. Turns out letting Sakura help in the kitchen isn't a bad idea. Her specially crafted medicine pills are still disgusting. However, the time has come. We head out today. I calmly raise my hands over my head, so the two clones can lower the connected chest and back plates. When the shoulder straps find their place, I lower my arms to be parallel to the floor, while the side straps are adjusted for a snug fit. The high collared shoulder piece comes next, and they make quick work fastening it. I go about testing my range of movement, and after finding it satisfactory move onto the various seals on my armor. Privacy seals protecting against Dejutsu users are intact. Trio of storage seals on my chest too are in standby, while the last holds the Kusanagi blade. Four unprotected seals are all occupied, took the time last night to create an inventory suited for this mission. As I go through the rest and my clones continue with their preparations, my mind wanders. This mission is looking to be an interesting one, in others before this. I had a good idea of what to expect, and that functioned as a crutch of sorts. Due to changes caused almost completely by me, certain factors differ from what I saw years ago. Sasuke has been out from the snake's grasp for much longer than the original had. I assume he's gathered his team by now, and should be closing in on Itachi much like we are. The Avenger also lost out on fighting the snake and the suicide bomber, two experiences which might have shaped how the confrontation with Itachi went down. In fact, if he still needed the snake to help complete his lightning technique, then he might have lost his strongest attack I regret nothing. Other things to note is the possible interference of Obito, should we close in on Itachi and Sasuke too soon. Progress with the anti-time and space seal is not going very well. But I have alternate plans, assuming we encounter him. Even more importantly however, if the Achiha brothers do fight, Black Setsu is almost guaranteed to be nearby being the opportunist that he is. As such, despite how dangerous Abito is and how beneficial Project Rinnegan is, Operation Pandora's box takes priority. For obvious reasons, I move over to the coffee table where a trio of clones are preparing two scrolls. Near one scroll is a familiar set of medical equipment and miscellaneous items, while near the other is a black cube. Roughly 30 centimeter long sides and covered in intricate seals that are invisible in its inactive state, the thing looks both odd, and also not odd enough for its intended purpose. It doesn't really matter since no one is to interact with it after I hide it. Testing. Prompts a clone and I nod. The box is lifted and placed onto the seal array, and quickly vanishes with a small application of chakra. I feel the expected pulse on my chest and channel chakra into the second storage seal there, and out comes the box. I put it back into storage, and seconds later the clone has it sitting on the scroll in front of him. Next. We do the same test with the other scroll and its contents before packing up. Everything seems to be in order. No one can know about my secondary objectives. Doesn't matter if they come about or not. So once again my clones are performing missions on their own while I stay with my squad members. Both to protect them if need be and because between the Sharingan and Byakugan, leaving a clone in my spot might be discovered. I would have liked to send Kurama but he has unfinished business with a certain Achiha. My clones should be capable anyhow. They're practically 3S ranks at this point. With one last mental check, I head out the door. Plans to be disrupted and whatnot. Itachi, P of. From a throne-like seat in the Achiha hideout, red eyes narrow minutely as memories from one of the clones fills his mind. He's been running for several minutes in search of his target, Naruto Yuzumaki who reports say had once been the closest person to his younger brother, at least before he left the village. Such a relation explained why Zetsu's intel included him in the Leaf Squad, sent to capture him and Sasuke if found. His intent is to get a proper reading on their young shinobi to see where he would fit into his plans. Perhaps he could serve as his brother's keeper. He hopes it won't get to that point, but hopes don't always become reality. The Kin Slayer would know that best. From up ahead, a presence catches his attention, and as he gets closer, he notes that it is the person he's looking, or rather, a shadow clone. His eyes reveal the truth. This confirms that the leaf is in the general area, 
but for the conversation he has planned, the original would be the optimal participant. Gazing down at the approaching clone from a high branch, he makes note of which direction he came from, and then recalls the typical patterns Leaf Pursuit teams employed in the past. It isn't an exact calculation. The sheer amount of shadow clones the Yuzumaki is said to be capable of makes it even more challenging. But he eventually settles on a route that could take him to the other squad members, and perhaps the original. With a last glance he turns to move away. Movement from his peripheral interrupts. Leaving so soon, the seemingly unaware clone now stands in a tree just meters from him. Surprising. Impassively, he turns and makes eye contact with eyes that are yellow, rather than the expected blue. The pupils are off as well, and the serious expression is leagues different from that encounter years previous. Even further, the attempt at a Jinjutsu fails almost from the onset. Another surprise. Hello, Naruto-kun. He doesn't try for another illusion. That would likely only be a waste of chakra he currently couldn't afford. A Tachi Achiha. The clone responds. I wish to speak with you directly, but I suppose a shadow clone will work for now. How long can you maintain this? It would seem seeking the original is no longer feasible. Although, this is not how he foresaw such a discussion to begin. His mind runs through the reasons why the Leaf Shinobi would claim to want to talk rather than capture him. To delay perhaps. Regarding the question however, long enough I would suppose. Good. The blonde looks off to the side momentarily as if in thought. Before he can speak the clone continues. I'm sure you've heard the news about the snake being killed. Well afterwards, several of his bases were found and searched. In one of them evidence of dealings between said snake and the elder Danzo was found. The Hokage of course had him questioned. He was brought in on multiple charges. The clone gazes at him, one of which being bloodline theft. Just those short lines provide him with an idea of where this conversation might head. Danzo was always a wily character, unscrupulous if it would benefit his village. Hearing this did not surprise him, rather it is the question of why the clone feels the need to tell him this that sets his mind pondering. Could the Elder have done what he is starting to think he did? Danzo possessed a Sharingan eye in his right eye socket, and a right arm composed of tissue cultivated from the first Hokage's corpse, and ten Sharingan orbs embedded in it. The snake's notes detail helping create the limb. I see the manner in which he says those words do nothing to convey the emotion he feels inside. The sheer anger, frustration, sense of betrayal. Above all, when he finally masters himself again, is the feeling of tiredness. How much more would this world take from him? The deception and secrets, the underhand tactics, he understands the need for it all but his own village. After everything he did for them, for Danzo, I was part of the effort to bring him in. The eye in his head was destroyed while capturing him, and the artificial arm was severed. There are discussions to destroy it as well. But it is also possible Jiraiya will seal it away with the toads. After a quick second, Atachi decides both are tolerable options. He stares at the clone who then continues, his questioning revealed much. His part in the Echiha massacre, an attack on Shisui Echiha to obtain his Sharingan, and most importantly, your role in the event. Atachi takes a breath in and slowly releases it. At long last he finally knows what brought Shisui before him that night, down one eye and on the verge of death. He supposes it's good to know a part of his best friend is no longer in the hands of a treacherous warmonger. He can only pray Tsunade Sama takes more after the third than the root commander. As for the rest, this revelation would have shocked him had it came earlier. But at the moment, it was simply the logical result after interrogating someone who had been involved with the events of that night. It does complicate matters however. He could not guarantee keeping the secret from his little brother, if others in the village now know. Long made plans are in need of adjustment. Is this why you came seeking me? To bring me back to the village and serve again? Such would explain why only now the leaf is making a move against him. Assuming the priority is not Sasuke. Either way, he would have to resist capture. He did not have much longer to do what was required. That is the mission, yes. The Hokage wants you captured alive. Something told him there was more. You have alternate plans. That depends. For so long, you were the villain in this story. You killed your clan and traumatized your little brother. But as life frequently shows us, things are not always what they appear. The clone nods then, you Itachi Achiha, did what you believed you had to. Backed into a corner, manipulated by one you should have been able to trust, you still took the burden onto your shoulders, because you loved your brother, and such was the only path to protect him. Knowing what I do of your sacrifice, the only thing that remains is to hear of your intentions for Sasuke. What will you do when you face him? With all pretenses done away with, Atachi finds himself in a situation where he can tell the truth. Has to tell the truth as he can see nothing less would suffice. And to be honest, he wants to. The disease doesn't affect the clone like it does the original. But he remembers well the feeling. The knowledge that his body is shutting down on him. 
and that each mission is a step closer to being his last. If he wants Sasuke to kill him and get retribution for the clan he killed, then he doesn't have much longer. Fighting the Leaf Squad would hasten the process, and it is possible he would die without atoning for his actions which he won't accept. He will go out on his terms. And although he had a different picture in mind, coming clean now and later with Sasuke is not necessarily a bad thing. Better he tell his impressionable younger brother the truth rather than someone with malicious intentions. Yes, if he truly loves Sasuke, dying and leaving him in the dark is not the best way. He has to have faith that his little brother will understand and live a good life. That's all he ever really wanted for him. His hand will deliver justice for the innocents I killed. The words lift a weight off his shoulders. For his part, the clone is silent for a long moment. Eyes narrow as they drill into his, searching for the truth. And then he takes a step back and nods again. I will try for time then. Naruto-kun, Itachi calls as he feels his chakra waning. After it is done, bring Sasuke back with you. To the leaf. Right before he disperses. He hears it, of course. The original Itachi closes his eyes with a small smile. He did not anticipate this coming about, but perhaps it's for the best. With a few hand seals a crow is brought into existence and with one glance, slowly taken out. Black flames rage as the crow calls, staring at him with one blood red eye. He'll put his trust in his brother. A fated battle Itachi Piov. He sits there, on a seat designed to look like a throne, with seemingly no worry. Legs crossing at the ankles, left over right, hands similarly clasped, dominant right holding onto the left poking out of the top of his cloak. Eyes shut while his head reclines against the top of the throne. As with everything Itachi Ichiha does, he presents the picture of poise of being in control even when he isn't. Despite pain both emotional and physical as well as impending death, this reunion would be handled in the same fashion. So at the sound of approaching footsteps, he makes no movement other than to lazily open his eyes, Sharingan orbs meeting another pair. Sasuke the precious little brother who could never hide how much he looked up to his elder brother. The so-called prodigy, the perfect heir and shinobi. Theirs had been a strong bond at one point, weakened by duty perhaps but always present, always to be relied on when it mattered most. Itachi still remembers the smiles the shiny-eyed toddler would send his way after any time apart. Be it a few hours apart or weeks due to missions, little Sasuke was always the one bright light in his life. He remains that light even now, but he would willingly admit to missing those smiles. The brotherly love. Unfortunately, the expression Sasuke bears is completely deserved. The loathing stare, it would forever be a reminder of where Itachi failed his little brother. Of the time when the darkness so prevalent in humanity tried to overcome the one lit corner of his heart. Tried and yet failed. Life may have torn his brother from him, but he would always carry him in his heart and mind. Alas, it is all too common where the gentle approach is not the correct one. He would have to harden his heart and will one last time to provide a final lesson to his brother. So even as he burns the somewhat blurry sight into his memory, if only to take it with him to the next life, Itachi takes the opportunity and molds Chakra. Illusions have always been his specialty. So that is what he begins this last confrontation with. Such was his experience and talent that the Jinjutsu is cast, and then weaved with a trio more, while his brother hardly feels the intrusion. Within a fraction of a second of eye contact, the battle had begun. Leaf Squad the two-team coalition pursuing Itachi Ichiha move rapidly among the forests flitting from one branch to another. The original plan, starting at a center point and slowly expanding outwards tracking the rogue ninja by scent, had not worked as intended. Indeed, they'd been at it for hours before Naruto brought news of the Ichiha's shadow clone, which actually gave them their best means of tracking him. As skilled as the infamous prodigy was, the forest environment meant he'd left just enough clues for someone who can see down to the microscopic level to detect signs of his passage. The lone Hyiga was more than up to the task, so with that, the squads moved as one. Leading their loose formation is an unusually serious guy, boisterous and playful demeanor set aside for the mission. Near the center are their two current trackers, Niji and Naruto. The Hyuga with his Byakugan blazing as he visually scouts almost a kilometer around them with minute shifts of his head. In his thoughts he once again praises his cousin who's trained her eyes to be able to see several kilometers. Such might have been of use for the mission. Beside him the soul blonde casts his awareness beyond his body to sense foreign chakra and negative emotions. Normally blue eyes are yellow with cross-shaped pupils denoting his partial use of the Kurama cloak. In what he calls the hover state, mixed with Sage Mode. The two abilities combining to enhance the Jinchuriki's tracking capabilities too beyond the vision of his dark-haired counterpart. 
As such, he is first to sound the alarm. I've picked up something. Naruto's eyes narrow as he turns his head, seven degrees left of our current direction. A single chakra signature doesn't match Itachi's. Approximate distance, asks Kakashi from where he is acting as the rear guard. Seeing as how scent was no longer an option to catch their target, he'd send away all of the ninja dogs aside from Pakin, and set himself at the back of the formation. He trusts his physically superior friend to handle any attacks head-on, while he covers their rear alongside his summon. Six and a half kilometers. The Yuzumaki informs the squad with a frown, but something isn't right here. He didn't get to that position from outside my range, he just appeared there. Some sort of seal barrier that blocked your senses. Offers Tenton. She possesses a minor knowledge about seals due to her reliance upon storage scrolls. An encapsulated area that he either left or works best at long distance. Perhaps. Could also be a form of summoning or teleportation technique. Sakura suggests in turn. All are possible methods. But with the variety of skill sets and techniques available to the Akatsuki. We can't assume anything as of yet. Kakashi advises. The after-report on Kakuzu and his partner had been an eye-opener as to how esoteric the members of the organization could be. When we get in range but before we engage, I want you to relay a visual on them Niji. Of course, Kakashi Sensei, he nods. From the front guys silently adjust their trajectory while they ready themselves in case of combat. Getting close, two kilometers away. And now one. Naruto reports as they closed in. How much closer Niji? This is close enough. The Hyuga finally speaks out, and they slow to a stop. One person, Akatsuki Cloak. They are wearing a mask with seals that prevent me from seeing through it. Would say that they appear to be male in shape. In summary, an unknown. I see. This capture mission just became more complicated. Guy frowns. His miniature clone hums beside him. How will we advance Guy Sensei? With caution. If he is Akatsuki then he is likely an S rank nin. Not knowing his identity makes this more dangerous. He turns to his fellow Sensei. What say you Kakashi? Should we go greet them? The silver haired Jonan voices what everyone is thinking. We have to engage as going around may leave our backs open to attack. Keep in mind that he could be expecting us and all that that entails. I would also like to remind you that the Akatsuki normally move in pairs. Naruto throws in. No one has to question why he said that. There could very well be another S rank nearby serving as a partner to this one. Very well. Use formation C, attack pattern 2. Move in. Kakashi calls and they are off again. Slowly splitting into two groups. Formation C means Niji stays out of the direct confrontation to oversee the development while Sakura and Tenten accompany him. One acting as the field medic who mustn't sustain injury while the other watches over the other two, and provides long-range support if needed. Resting on Niji's shoulder, Pakin serves as another scout. So as called for, mere moments later when the Akatsuki member wearing an orange spiral mask comes into view, the other members of the squad carry out attack pattern number two. Instantly unlocking the second gate, Gate of Healing, Guy plants a foot and blurs. A branch off to the side used as a leaping platform barely has time to burst into shreds, before his leg is rapidly approaching the rogue shinobi's face in a dynamic entry. Where Guy goes high, Kakashi goes low. The silver-haired Jonin leaping forward, Ambu era blade in hand, set for a strike to the midsection. His lone Sharingan tracks the progress of Guy's leg, and his blade as the window for evasive maneuvering closes. It's that close scrutiny that informs him what happens next is not a delusion. None of the attacks land, not his, not Guy's, and certainly not the pair of kunai sent by Naruto to complete the full pincer movement. And it's not because their opponent was able to evade them all, rather, everything went through him. The kick entered one side of his head and appeared out the other, while Kakashi ended up on the other side of the nin. Quickly correcting his balance, he leaps to a safe position to observe the Akatsuki member once again. Phew, you leaf ninja sure are no joke. The masked figure swipes imaginary sweat off his forehead, exaggerating the movement. You guys almost had me. Guy, for his part, stares. As someone who's experienced a lot during his time as a shinobi, and wears a mask of sorts to cover it up, he has a good eye for such falsities. This opponent is more than meets the eye to stand there surrounded, while putting forth an attitude like that. But then again, a technique to avoid physical harm, would likely lead to such levity even if just an act. The green beast glances at his longtime friend standing behind the masked fellow, and then to their students standing facing him. He didn't expect otherwise, but none seemed to have an understanding of what occurred earlier, meaning they could retreat or engage further for opportunities to observe. Turning away would not help with the mission, however. But don't think that means I'll let you get past me though. Toby's a good boy, and he was told not to let the scary leaf ninja through. The self-identified Toby sinks into the branch beneath him and appears on one behind Kakashi. 
neatly escaping the triangle he was in, and likely getting between them and their objective. There, all better. He says, voice dripping with taunting cheer. The four leaf shinobi take the opportunity granted and quickly regroup, moving back to where Niji and the girls are positioned. I don't know what to think of this guy, Sakura shares eyeing the masked man simply waiting for them rather than engaging. He waves happily. From here, it looked like he completely negated your attacks, almost phasing through them. I believe that may very well be the case, Sakura-san. Niji agrees, right before contact I was able to see an irregularity in his chakra. It became blurry, for lack of better word. The areas targeted seemed to lose integrity, while the rest of his body was unaffected. I felt something similar. His overall chakra fluctuated and then decreased. Like some of it was no longer there. Seeing as how it's back to normal now. I would say it's a technique he's using. Indeed. Niji nods at Naruto, one activated with no hand seals. Could it be automatic? Like the Kazakiyaji's sand defense. Lee wonders looking perplexed. The mechanics behind them should greatly differ. But that is a possibility. A very grim one. Kakashi acknowledges. We need more information before we can draw any conclusions. Same formation, attack at will. Tenton, see if you can target any blind spots he has. Any hit would mean his defense is not automatic. Will do. The weapon's mistress affirms. This time when the four spread out and engage, Naruto takes the lead wielding two kunai. Rapid swipes see the masked ninja leaning and swerving to avoid them. Ugly woe, be careful or you could hurt someone with those. Toby continues his childish act, while the blonde takes the time to observe the second largest obstacle in his path to eliminate the Akatsuki. Toby is fast, as expected of someone trained by Madara and possessing cells from the first, but Naruto knows he's holding back. Both of them are really, each for their own reasons. He slashes diagonally down to the left which causes Toby to duck into a crouch and reach out for Naruto's leg. The Yuzumaki, knowing what the contact could result in as Toby is tangible at the moment, pumps the brakes and hops backward. A perfectly timed fireball from Kakashi crashes into the crouched opponent. Catching his sensei's eye upon landing, Naruto shakes his head. It was well executed, but sensing that same shift in chakra signature from before meant their opponent had gone intangible. Indeed, Toby appears on a different branch clapping enthusiastically. Bravo. Such teamwork, no wonder Dashley appears beside him cutting him off. Well, Kakashi lands near Naruto, both keeping an eye out as Guy and Lee show off their teamwork. Their familiarity and speed not allowing Toby to dodge all their attacks, but instead phase through some. Can't say if it's automatic yet, but clearly he can choose to physically dodge certain attempts. Could be because he can or perhaps there are limits to his technique. Naruto reports, I have something in mind that might answer that question for us. You three will have to keep him busy while I summon a couple toads. If his objective is to prevent us from closing in on Itachi, then I don't think he'll mind us taking our time here. We'll keep him busy. Kakashi promises. Thanks. Have you considered using your Manjikyu ability on him? I have Kakashi grimaces. Since it provides no forewarning and is a ranged technique, warping their opponent could potentially be a way to defeat him. But doing such comes with risks. Even one use would take a toll on my stamina and chakra reserves. Don't want to do that with Itachi and kiss him on the horizon. I thought so. This should help with that. Naruto comments, before placing a hand on Kakashi's shoulder and concentrating. From that point of contact a shroud of red chakra forms, and quickly begins to envelop his sensei. Oh. The copy ninja raises a hand to his face, analyzing the visible chakra. Internally he can feel his reserves being bolstered, while the fatigue and slight strain from keeping the ocular implant uncovered fades. It's a good feeling. The increase in power not too dissimilar to opening the few gates he's capable of. He also takes note of the tail waving in the air behind him. This chakra, is it? Yeah, it is. Use it wisely. The blonde moves away. While Kakashi focuses back on the battle now looking for the best instant to intervene, Naruto finds a safe distance to put one of multiple contingencies into effect. He quickly bites the inner side of his lip and swipes a glove thumb in the ensuing blood before the wound can heal. He runs through hand seals and slams a hand onto the wood beneath him which results in a small cloud of smoke before two small, elderly toads are revealed. Greetings. Sorry for being abrupt. But I could really use your help Itachi Piolf. Landing atop the Achiha hideout building, Itachi takes a moment to breath while waiting to see the status of his brother through one opened eye. The smoke and residual flames disappear revealing Sasuke being protected by unsightly wings growing out of his back. ECH, these wounds are nothing. He huffs, rising and leaping onto the roof as well. They won't slow me down at all. Silently pleased with his perseverance and ability to push through, Itachi slowly rises from his crouching position with a hidden wince. The blade from the windmill shuriken didn't penetrate his leg all that deep. 
but it is enough to impede his movement, said Wound combined with his quickly dwindling reserves and twitching left eye caused by the failed Tsukiyomi put him on the back foot. This couldn't go on much longer. Luckily Sasuke is in no mood to stall and prepares another attack. Recognizing and matching his hand seals, the brothers each launch a fireball at the other. The ninjutsu that was seen as a rite of passage for any young Ichiha wishing to become a shinobi. Their father had drilled a tachi on it at one point. Same for Sasuke. A shared experience. Who could have predicted that the day would come when they would turn the jutsu on one another? Regardless of his inner thoughts, the two fireballs meet in the center and vie for supremacy. He doesn't hold back yet Itachi feels the exact moment when his technique starts losing ground. Accepting the truth and not willing to concede, his right eye slowly opens and summons the black flames of Amaterasu into being. In almost no time at all the normal flames disappear, having been burned away by his potent ocular ability. Sasuke seeing this and likely realizing the danger of remaining a still target dashes about flames pursuing him. If burning him entirely had been Itachi's goal, Sasuke's evasive movements would not have prevented it, being both too close and too slow to avoid such an outcome. Indeed, it's the hand-shaped wings that Itachi is targeting, and sooner than later his dwindled accuracy locks onto them, and they catch fire. Sasuke collapses with a cry. He makes his way over to Sasuke's prone body, and bends down before jumping back at the last second. He doesn't completely evade the dragon flame fired from below, but the damage is minimal. Essentially nothing compared to the gaping hole left in the roof. It's what allows him to look down at Sasuke as the marks on his face from Orochimaru's curse seal dissipate. That Amaterasu of yours, it seems to have taken quite a lot out of you. The younger Achiha falls onto a knee, matching the eldest's weakened stance. Likewise, I can tell by looking that you're out of chakra. Atachi comments to his brother. He also deduces that Sasuke used the Orochimaru-style substitution jutsu to hide. I don't have any left. Sasuke admits but doesn't look defeated just yet. I used most of it in that last dragon flame jutsu. As they speak, the overabundance of heat from their flames rises up into the atmosphere, leading to a chain of reactions. Rain starts falling, lightning flashing and thunder echoing above them. Now Itachi, you asked for it so here it is at last. Rain droplets splatter against the roof. The lightning seems to flash even brighter and more frequently. I'll make your death a reality. It's at that point that Itachi realizes Sasuke might have a final effort left in him despite being low on chakra. He casts a quick look into the sky where lightning seems to coalesce, forming a being composed of energy. Come. Sasuke yells out, hand enveloped with lightning chakra, Kirin. Seeing the sheer amount of power poised to descend on him at the speed of lightning, Itachi knows he has to do something. Despite the urgency, his lips twitch the slightest bit. Leave it to his little brother to command the heavens like this. The smile doesn't fade even as he prepares his defense, and the lightning avatar strikes down with all the force of an angry god. Clone P of. The clone holds up a closed fist to his fellows, waiting for the best moment to strike. The other hand holds a ready Pandora's box. Out of the three created and tasked with taking out the trash, this particular clone came into existence first, and therefore obtained the self-given designation of Alpha. Bravo and Charlie are currently waiting behind him for the signal. They didn't necessarily need it with the light show being put on by Sasuke, but a chain of command made things more orderly. They were also bored, and pretending to be a squad of black ops made it more interesting. Not that they were just pretending at this point. Being completely off the books and off the radar, they basically were covert operatives. Their clandestine mission having started with sneaking out of Kanoha some time after the official squad left and then looping around Naruto Prime and Co. to reach Itachi's final destination. They'd taken special care to avoid detection by using Aero Step and hiding among the clouds. As such, they were already in position to watch as Sasuke arrived at the hideout, and felt more than saw the presence of Black Setsu. The parasite really needed to be eliminated, never before had they felt something so poignant through their negative emotion sensing. Even without knowledge of his deeds, they would have written off Black Setsu as evil. It was repulsive really. They hadn't remained in the sky for too long after the brothers engaged. None of them wished to see if the lightning jutsu would indeed follow Sasuke's will. If there was something else much closer for it to target. So they made another loop to descend while remaining undetected. Now hiding amongst, but not touching, the treetops via Aero Step, the clones wait. At last, they see the Kirin starting to form and Alpha gestures to his brethren, making sure not to disturb the environment around them. They slowly close in and stop at the edge of the tree cover. Fortunately, the one thereafter made sure to put some distance between him and what would soon be ground zero. Makes this next step much easier. The lightning construct strikes, heavily obscuring all physical senses. It speaks to how well coordinated they are that Alpha hardly needs to signal before the squad moves. Just like Prime had practiced, Alpha takes off at an angle, while Bravo takes the direct approach with Charlie hanging back. 
From up above the two, Alpha catches the moment as Bravo arrives upon Zetsu wearing the full Kurama Chakra Shroud, and forms a large hand to scoop into the floor. He then uses all the power granted by that state to leverage the hand and shovel out the plant creature, sending him into the sky towards Alpha. It takes a slight adjustment in altitude, but Alpha quickly closes in, while avoiding the chunks of building likewise thrown into the air. Before he even has to plan for it, Bravo is on the other side of Zetsu prying open the Venus flytrap-like head covering. Wah dash! There are two distinct expressions of surprise before the open top of the box connects with the right side of the being. No, too bad for the millennia old chess master. That one touch is enough. Like being vacuumed he's ripped off his favorite carrier and sucked into the contraption. Prime had expected both black and white Zetsu to be sealed away, but the clones were nothing if not adaptable. Alpha shuts and locks the box with all haste, while Bravo punches a fist through white Zetsu's head, which turns it into a sapling. Not wasting a second longer they both body flicker in mid-air to another predetermined area around the hideout. Charlie joins them a second later. All clear. He announces meaning he'd seen no sign of Black Setsu escaping, and that the Ichiha brothers also hadn't noticed anything. Good. Alpha replies while not taking his eyes off the box. The array of seals covering its exterior was still lit up, and although he didn't have a heart like an actual person, his mind is kind enough to provide the phantom sensation of it beating erratically. If this thing failed thoughts of a wild race to throw some litter into orbit, slowly die down, as the seals go dormant again signifying a successful capture. Oh, thank Kami. He sighs in relief. Beside him, Bravo lets the shroud fade away as the danger passes. Charlie provides the special scroll, and the box is sealed away. It's Prime's responsibility now. And that's Operation Pandora's box done with. He doesn't have to say much more than that. Not when they're all clones of the same person, and have almost identical thought patterns. Each of them recognize the importance of what just occurred, and each knows what comes next. They're professionals like that. Are you going to keep lugging that tree around with you? Charlie asks Bravo who still has the accessory hanging off his arm. Mostly professionals. Eov. Restored. I maintain my position as Fukasaku and Shima begin the song that heralds their demony illusion. Toad's confrontation chant. It will take a short moment before they're fully harmonized. So we just have to keep Abito occupied while protecting the two elders. I momentarily cast my attention outwards, catching the anxiousness and anticipation rolling off our sentry and support squad. Seems Abito's Kamui is getting the respect it deserves from them which is to be expected. It's quite frustrating watching Gaia and Lee weave in and out, attempting to land a hit and failing while Obito pretends to be some airhead. I personally wouldn't be so collected if I didn't have the means to combat him. Three clones appear beside me before they each transform into kunai which I palm. With my other hand I unseal a few regular kunai and get ready for what I'm expecting. Obito spins around a punch from Lee, ducks under his roundhouse kick, and then phases through all of Guy's significantly faster and more powerful attacks before managing to clear some space. He hardly lands on an adjacent branch when Kakashi makes his move. It's the first time I'm seeing his version of the Kamui in action, and it's somewhat interesting. The dark focal point centered on Abito's chest. That quickly starts pulling in its immediate surroundings. It's what I picture a black hole to look like, although much weaker. The sight doesn't rob me of my composure however, acting fast and launching all the kunai in my hands towards Abito, while flexing my chakra to turn 6 into a 100. The hail of real metal and chakra tools fly across the clearing, and blanket the area where Abito used to stand. There's a pregnant silence as everyone takes in what just happened. No one drops the guard just yet which is good because seconds later Abito drops back down among us. A little worse for wear but still intact. I'm back. He yells while ignoring the tears and scratches in his cloak. Try as he might, there's no deceiving my emotion sensing. The simmering anger and hatred that had previously been aimed at our group had only magnified. I wouldn't be surprised to learn it's his old teammate he's really upset with now. Speaking of Kikashi, I pick up the surprise and frustration he feels towards what he probably sees as a faulty usage of his Kamui. With what I know and remember, I don't think he messed up there. No, his Kamui worked as Abido wasn't expecting it and the rogue was sent back into their shared dimension. Same with the many projectiles and being on the same plane, they were able to do some actual damage to him. Shame that it all looks superficial, but my real objective with the kunai was to camouflage my transformed clones with the shadow kunai technique and position those clones in the kanui dimension. Two of the three are now in there. Did you me he stops mid-sentence, body ceasing all movement, and I blitz him. Manjikyu Sharingan, years of combat experience, implanted cells, 
none of them make up for the fact that his timing couldn't have been any worse, seeing as how he is now trapped in the Toad's unique, sound-based Jinjutsu. One which traps the victim's mind and renders the body inert until the technique ends, or their body is killed. I was fully prepared to lend the Elder's Chakra Cloaks to prolong their song and outlast Abito's intangibility timer. But that wasn't needed. I decapitate Abito with a simple wing-coated kunai. A cut so fine, the body stands there for a moment before the separated pieces fall from the tree and towards the ground. A beat. Then another. He's still alive. The horror movie warning comes from Niji. Our eye in the sky. Very much appreciated but not necessary when Abito announces his resurrection himself. The RGHH. A sound of pure rage and loss. Chakra surging wildly, refusing to be contained. Yuzuma Kiyu. I immediately body flicker from my position, just in time as something smashes through the branch, and leaves the limb to be taken by gravity. My eyes narrow, focusing on the sight before me. It's definitely a Beto despite the change. Sticking out from his back and tearing into his robes, are tendrils of wooden spikes. As I watch he grows a long thorn from his wrist which falls into his hand, a weapon obviously. It's easy to tell that the once mockingly playful Ichiha is enraged. Too obvious. What isn't so obvious is the reason why. His mask. Instead of the one eye hole it now has two. The original hole and a new one that looks like someone made it hastily. Or with hands shaking from anger. Oh, could it be? I once hypothesized that Abito had another Sharingan under his mask. It made sense as he contributed to the Echiha massacre and no doubt stole a few eyes as just compensation. Knowing what I do about the clan's secret techniques, having fresh eyes on hand for emergency usage of Aizanagi, would be a logical plan. So Abito would have one in the socket he later used for the Rinnegan, the perfect method to avoid death. That wasn't the case. However, if he uncovered that eye to now see after performing the Achiha brand of rewriting reality, it stands to reason that eye is not what was used, meaning the other one was. The Manjiku possessing the ability of Kamui, Something Abito depended on dearly I don't quite break into laughter, but that's only because of how serious the situation is. Giving credit where due, I did not expect this. The Toad's demonic Jinjutsu disconnects the target from their body, so I wasn't sure Abito would be able to activate Aizanagi in that state at all. And yet, he did. Somehow. Even despite essentially dying separated from his body and therefore his Sharingan. More Echiha favoritism. Too bad for him and luckily for us, it seems he defaulted to what he was most accustomed to, and sacrificed his right eye. Hey, is this what plot armor looks like? All that runs through my mind as I stare down an enraged Abito who likely blames me for his loss. I was going to save you for last, he growls, already moving to attack. Not anymore. Most definitely blames me. I swing around a tree trunk and then descend to the forest floor before leaping between a series of branches. All that to avoid a charging Abito and the wooden spikes being flung at me. I do note that he's moving faster than earlier. In fact, his eyes and physical amps might have placed him on par with my sage mode. Can't have that. Fall back? I yell to the other three. For the first time against a real enemy, my Kurama cloak comes into play. Chakra bright and flickering like flames erupts and molds to my body. Various black markings breaking up the orange aura around me. It feels great to finally use this. But I have an important task to see too. If he truly is vulnerable right now then I'm going to take full advantage. I charge him, the shroud providing additional buffs to my considerable capabilities. Appearing inside his guard, I grab hold of his wrist holding another wooden stake and send a brutal knee into his stomach. Aside from cutting his head off earlier, that blow is the first we've landed on him today. Quite cathartic. My free elbow drops down onto the back of his head, while simultaneously twisting his wrist, making him drop the makeshift weapon. I bat it away and use the movement to spin and plant my sandal into his side, launching him away from the rest of my squad. As is my custom, I don't let up. Likely due to the Hashirama cells in his body, the blow to the side didn't kill him. He merely catches himself after going through a couple trees, and returns fire with literal fire. A massive stream that widens as it closes in on me, using the forest for further fuel. I mold chakra and release it in the form of my liquid nitrogen technique, the only wind jutsu I know that can trump fire despite the elemental weakness. With the sheer amount of chakra I have to empower the jutsu, it narrowly overcomes the flames and blankets the environment in a layer of frost. Something that Abito wants nothing to do with as he withdraws to an untouched part of the forest and drops to the ground. I already suspect he has wood release techniques. So as he slams both hands down and launches countless wooden spears at my approaching form, it's all too easy to arrow step to the side and send a Rasengan burst back. I harry him with a few more ranged Rasengan to keep him on the back foot and prevent more ninjutsu, but his chakra still shifts, 
signifying the use of a seal-less replacement. I instantly lock onto his new position and body flicker over, avoiding a stab from another piece of sharp wood. If that were a regular weapon then I would not worry about it, but since it's made using wood release, I'll take the utmost caution and not let it land on me. I don't think one can be too paranoid regarding that particular blood limit, so I form a chakra construct of an arm from my back and catch his follow-up attack with it. The large hand covers his arm almost to the elbow. It tightens into a vice before Abito can react, the prosthetic arm being crushed to paste and drawing a muted yell from the rogue shinobi. From there, the fight quickly comes to an end as I use my physicality to the max. Despite his rage, he does try to run away when he realizes he can't keep up with me. Tries and fails as expected. Even the snake, slimy version of Hadini that he used to be, could not escape me back in Kusa, and that was without the aid of Kurama's power. So I catch Abito on every attempt and continue what I do best. I don't believe in going easy on opponents as one slip-up can do you in, and that's especially true in this encounter. As easy as this seems, Abito still has one Sharingan meaning one last Izanagi. Everything that he learns in this bout will be used to defeat me in the next. So what I'm doing is focusing on Tajutsu with a few ninjutsu thrown in, leaves everything else an unknown. The fact that he will be down both eyes and blind means nothing. So after he falls, mask mostly intact as intended but body broken. I once again use a kunai to pierce his brain through the eye hole he made. This time I go the extra distance of launching a fireball onto the corpse like it will keep him dead. From there I wait, fire crackling beside me while my eyes and senses look for his next reappearance. Waiting, waiting a bit more, and then some. I think he's down for good this time. Kakashi comments, moving over to observe the pyre. Guy and Lee follow on full alert while Niji and company remain where they were. The other times he returned within seconds. Shen. I suppose by other times he means the failed Kamui and the first decapitation. Could Abito have actually given up and not used Izanagi? Maybe, though highly unlikely. There was something else at hand here. Your thoroughness is commendable Naruto, but perhaps we should continue with our official mission. Guy suggests each second we waste is one which Itachi Achiha can use to escape our pursuit. You're not wrong. The chakra cloak around me disperses. Same with the one around Kakashi. We don't need those right now. Assuming his stalling wasn't completely effective, getting back on the track should lead us to Itachi eventually. Him, Kissum, and perhaps Toby's partner. I nod at Kakashi. No point staying here. With that we turn to regroup with the rest of the squad, where I thank the Toad Elders for their help and promise to visit sometime. Before the clearing leaves our sight I make the plus symbol and mole chakra, shrugging to the questioning looks. If he does return, then I want some forewarning. That assuages their curiosity, and we continue in silence. Sasuke, Piov. Nothing seems to be working. A last ditch fire technique. Bounced off the orange avatar. The remainder of his kunai equipped with explosive tags. Same result. One final attack with his sword. His blade ricocheted into the distance while he flew back and almost crashed into a piece of wall miraculously still upright. No Sasuke breathes, desperately standing up and backing away. No, no, no. Stay back. Atachi pays his pleas no attention. As horrible as Sasuke feels, his older brother looks worse. Staggering forward with a limp while blood runs down his chin as he coughs wetly. Even the arm stretching out towards him is covered in severe burns and bloody at the fingers. Despite it all, Sasuke's the one retreating until his back meets the wall. He's the one fearfully pleading as death comes ever nearer. Could it really end like this? Was this all his ambitions would lead to? Death at the hands of the monster who'd mercilessly slaughtered his family. Would he leave this world the same way his mom and dad did? As Atachi slowly comes closer to touching him, Sasuke accepts the truth. Yes, this was the end. Unbidden, memories and thoughts forcibly suppressed flash before his eyes. He sees his younger self, fresh off the loss of his clan, and foolishly deciding the lone path of vengeance. Would he is, pushing away all and any attempts at friendship because stuff like that would only make him weak. But then his teammates, Naruto they got through to him, just barely. It didn't stop him from betraying them for a better chance to kill Itachi. How assured of himself he'd been. How easily he lied to himself that he'd made the right choice to leave them and be alone. That they were a weakness. And now here he is, about to die, all alone. The realization makes his shoulders slump further in defeat. What a failure Itachi's avatar breaks down allowing him to touch two fingers to Sasuke's forehead. Wide, fearful eyes meet hazy red, and his world shifts. A Jinjutsu, one which he's in no state to break out of. He doesn't know exactly where the following visions take place, but he recognizes the architecture of Kanoha. The first set consists of meetings in a dimly lit room. Various adults, young and old, bearing a chiha wear sitting around and discussing changes in the village. Discontent and mistrust regarding the village proper. Plans to address the issue, 
plans of a coup. His mind can barely comprehend what he is seeing before the images change. Now they consist of the third Hokage and another elder. They learn of the clan's planned revolt and use young Itachi who seeks peaceful resolution as a double agent. Time advances and bloodshed becomes inevitable. The other elder approaches Itachi with an order, kill every Ichiha and be branded a hero. Itachi opposes, chooses to wipe out the clan except for his little brother, and live life as a rogue instead, threatening to expose village secrets for his safety. The influx of images stop there thankfully, but Sasuke feels his world breaking down. All he thought he knew is no longer true. Or maybe this is one last lie at his expense. Yes, that makes more sense. The Achiha, it wasn't likely that they would plot to overthrow the third, was it? It hadn't been his focus. But the village treated his clan right, didn't they? They were respected by everyone, shinobi and civilian alike. They were a welcome addition to the village. In fact, he was treated like royalty in many of the places he deemed to visit. Ichiha-sama is what they called always paying respect to his slain family. Sometimes they would even owe realization hit. His clearest memories of village interactions were after that night. As the pitiful survivor of a massacre. So what were they like before then? Try as he might, he can't properly recall. He does remember they were somewhat distanced from the village proper. However, likely of their own choice as most Ichiha were reserved individuals. Probably wanted to be alone rather than some slight from the village. Yes, as co-founders of the village, the Ichiha deserved the right to some privacy. Their sweat, blood and tears given for the leaf called for no less. Sasuke can't ignore the quiet voice questioning why no Ichiha ever took the position of Hokage. Surely their sacrifices warranted that. Instead, a line of Senju and their allies held a monopoly on the hat. Was that purposeful? The more his mind wonders the more he can see why some might suspect foul play against the clan. Perhaps the arguments he'd just witnessed weren't completely baseless. But were they enough to inspire a revolt? To have the Echiha turn on the village their ancestors helped found? Was it possible? The broken body of Naruto lying in the valley comes to him suddenly. He'd done that hadn't he? Almost killed a pseudo friend while abandoning the same village he couldn't believe his clan would turn against. In that light, was it really so impossible? No. No, it wasn't. He could see it now. As if waiting for that cue, the setting changes and Itachi appears before him. Together they stand in a world under a red sky. Neither show the toll their battle had taken on them. But that's not to say both are unscathed. Sasuke didn't know just how to- He did not appreciate how weak and imploring his voice sounds. But he had to know. Had to hear Itachi's take on what was currently turning his world upside down. It's the truth, little brother. Itachi sighs. Our clan wanted a revolution it wasn't meant to be. I dash, something had to be done. And there were no other options before me to maintain the peace. A battle between the village and the clan would have destabilized everything. Put us at risk of extermination, should the other hidden villagers take advantage. It was the only way looking into his eyes, Sasuke could find no hints of deception. Only tiredness and an expression that he only used to see back when they were young. It had hurt, honestly. Why? He asks, why did it have to be you? Why didn't you take the first option? What he really wants to ask is why didn't Itachi kill him and live a hero? But he can't quite put it in words. His brother smiles sadly. Because I was their best option. Rather than risk the news behind our clan's treachery reaching the village or beyond, I could operate in silence. Limit the number of people aware. And it had to be me because that was the only way to keep you safe. Itachi blinks as the illusionary world shudders, cracks starting to form. My time is not much longer. So let me just say this please I did what I did. Because you were my precious little brother. I could not kill you if I tried. And I couldn't let whoever they chose in my stead kill you either. How is he supposed to react to such news? My intention was always to protect you. But in the end, I went too far. I didn't want to darken your perception of our clan, of our father, so I became the villain. One you could hold responsible and slay for retribution. In an attempt to push you to become strong and to one day free me from the burden I placed upon myself. I tortured you, Sasuke. There is no other way to describe the horrors I made you witness. The memories of that night flit across his mind, yet at the same time, it did push me it motivated me to become stronger. Sasuke doesn't know why, or maybe he does. But the sudden revelation makes it hard to watch his brother place even more blame on himself. Not when he went through something even worse. Perhaps it did, Itachi exhales, yet it also forced you to walk a path that I hadn't wished for you. All I wanted was for you to be safe and to have the strength to defend what was yours. Happiness, love and acceptance, I wanted all that for you. And I hope you'll find it someday. You deserve it. 
He closes the distance then, and Sasuke allows it too numb to do anything as Itachi leans his forehead against his in a brotherly embrace. My time is up Sasuke. Know that although you won't see me, I'll always be with you. Right here. He taps the spot over Sasuke's heart. I'll always love you. No matter what. Don't you ever blame yourself for this. I wanted to end things on my terms, and I have so don't burden yourself further. I want you to live on little brother, live the life I was never able to give you. I love you. And with that, the illusion shatters. It comes to a seemingly abrupt end, leaving them on an overcast battlefield littered with debris and raging black flames. But Sasuke's attention is on the smiling face of his brother, expression locked even as the life leaves his eyes. After the corpse slumps and falls to the side Sasuke's body finally gives up and he likewise collapses, mind and emotions in turmoil. Atachi lies at his feet dead, but he feels no satisfaction from the sight. How could he, knowing what he does now? His brother took on the burden of killing their entire clan for the sake of Kanoha, and more specifically him. His brother loved him enough to leave the village and become a rogue ninja. In the face of such realizations, Sasuke feels nothing but remorse. The understanding that during their battle Atachi had never seriously injured him made it worse. Atachi, his voice is weak. If only he'd known earlier why hadn't anyone told him. Atachi, don't leave me too. Why did it have to end this way? Please I'm sorry exhaustion creeps in then, and his mind succumbs like his body did moments earlier. Sasuke Chiha, now the very last of his clan passes out. Clone P of. After sending Pandora's box to Prime, Alpha and the other clones sat around for a bit waiting. During that time they were able to see the snakes huge. Hydra-like body break out of the curse mark and do battle with Itachi Susanoo. Alpha knew he likely wasn't the only one who'd wondered where that form was when the real snake face primed just a couple months ago. Not that it would have saved him. In the end, Itachi won. So they got to watch the second to last Horcrux be destroyed. That enjoyable scene essentially marked the conclusion of the battle between brothers, with Itachi's signature quickly disappearing and Sasuke's dimming after a surge in negative emotions. The clones move in as one, taking special care not to disturb anything as they navigate through ground zero and finally reach the two who caused so much damage it's clear itachi is very much dead while sasuke sits against a wall only an arm's length away out cold it's what alpha expected to see but the sight is somewhat unpleasant all the same for what it's worth i'm sorry it had to happen this way he sighs sasuke may have been a jerk to naruto on top of likely killing him but the kid did just lose a brother who was also his sole living family member. Alpha couldn't miss the tears on the younger brother's face, and combining that with the faint shift in chakra he'd felt earlier well, it's safe to say Sasuke was not having a good time before falling unconscious. During one of Prime's more melancholy moments, he'd entertained the idea that people in this world were more attuned with their feelings, that they felt emotions more vividly than he was accustomed to. He'd attributed that to a combination of having chakra, a physical and spiritual energy, and the way of life in the elemental nations. An example more so for shinobi than civilians, but one had to really cherish their loved ones while they lived because death was an ever-present factor. The difference in average life expectancy here and back where Prime first lived proved that point well. Of course, love wasn't the only magnified emotion present in this world, but it was what Prime, and therefore Alpha and all the other clones, used to their advantage this day. They'd counted on the love Atachi held for Sasuke to make sure no real damage befell the younger Achiha, while also relying on Sasuke's previous love for Atachi to make an appearance and then result in grief strong enough for a Manjiku activation. It was honestly similar to something Black Setsu would do. Sure, excuses could be given like pointing to this event happening in the original storyline, or even saying that this is what Itachi wanted didn't change the fact that their excuses. Getting Sasuke's Sharingan benefited them so they allowed, pushed, events to turn out the way they did. No need to sugarcoat anything. We'll make sure it was worth it in the end and try to lend a hand in the aftermath. Alpha promises before gesturing Bravo and Charlie forward. You know what to do. The clones move forward, with Charlie opening the second scroll they prepared ahead of time. They lay the supplies between the patients and clean their hands before getting to work. It doesn't take long to prepare the two for an impromptu operation. Simply having to flip Itachi onto his back, and position Sasuke in the same fashion, and then applying antiseptic to the target sites, and a local anesthetic to the younger brother. It's their first time doing this on a human, so they start with Itachi. The extraction process goes pretty well, in Alpha's amateur opinion. He steps up to the body once the eyes are out, and the clones focus on Sasuke with their newfound expertise. His gaze roves up and down, weighing the possibilities. Should be something that's always near him, hard for an opponent to separate. 
Maybe of certain importance lightning is faintly reflected off the scratch forehead protector. Hum, the old thing slips off with a tug, and ignoring how unhygienic it is, Alpha holds the metal slab between both hands and channels, a small amount of chakra into it. Oh, looking at the inner side of the plate, he sees it, a seal, a rather simple looking one for storage. Focusing chakra directly onto it this time results in a small puff of smoke and a nondescript scroll which he quickly unrolls to analyze. There's another more complicated seal there. But it can't stump someone who had to study the science behind storage seals in order to create a new one. Nope, he figures out how to open this one too. Just need to apply blood to two specific areas. Only, after getting two drops from Atachi and applying them, nothing happens. Huh. He wordlessly looks between the scroll and Atachi until something hits him. Hey, I need one of you to bring me a drop of Sasuke's blood. Bravo ends up being the one to answer the old summon. Okay, drop it onto that matrix there while I do the same on this one. On my count, three, two, one, the smoke is thicker this time, but Alpha doesn't mind. Means they did something right, very right. Before their eyes lay two objects. The first is a plain looking gourd made of clay, only about 45 centimeters from head to base. The gourd has no stopper, but looking down into it reveals a complete darkness. Even the light around them makes no difference in seeing what's inside it somewhat foreboding. The other object is even harder to explain, a flat piece of something grey with no discernible edges. It seems to blur making it hard to tell just what shape it is. It's a good thing Alpha had names and functions to assign to these objects, or he would be completely lost at the moment. The first is the Sword of Tetsuka, a jar filled with a liquid that gains the form of a blade when released, and can seal whatever target is pierced by it. They just saw it used on the snake. The second is called the Yata Mirror, and should be able to negate any attack. Although both are classified as ethereal weapons and can't be used in their current state, the mirror is said to have no set form or property, which explains why some flat grey thing is the best explanation for it right then. Alpha reaches out to touch the mirror, very hesitantly, and makes contact with the center. Immediately he feels a pull on his chakra before it stops. He gets the feeling of being weighed and found wanting for some reason. Okay, I'm going to assume these things bind to an owner after absorbing some of their chakra. After that the owner can summon them from wherever they leave them. He theorizes. And I'm guessing that chakra has to come from a living being, not a clone. Bravo asks. Likely thinking Alpha had just experienced an attempt to absorb chakra from the mirror. Probably, it definitely didn't bind to me. He shrugs before putting the mythical weapons back into the scroll, without touching them. We'll store this in hours. Make sure you get a sample of Atachi's blood and another of Sasuke's. I'm going to set up the smoke screen. For the sake of secrecy, certain measures had to be taken to cover their presence. The clones would do their part, while the rest would be left to prime. Alpha just hopes the dead can't watch the living world wherever they were. Some things simply can't be explained. Karen Piov. People from the Hidden Mist are really weird. She's only really met two Kirinin, but that seems to be a constant. On one hand is Sujetsu of the Hazuki clan. The idiot really needs to learn to read the atmosphere, as she can vividly remember all the times he's gotten between Sasuke-kun and her. The boy was probably jealous. Shuck teeth and everything the second person is Kisum Hoshigaki who she's heard about, and is just seeing in person. A tall, muscular freak of nature with huge chakra reserves. That skin tone couldn't possibly be real could it? The two make quite the sight killing time sparring as everyone waits for Sasuke Kun to finish up with his fight against Itachi. They repeatedly clash large butcher knife against oddly alive shark sword, also large in size, in a bout of Kenjutsu. On the surface level it looks like no one takes any real damage, but she feels the difference in Sujetsu's chakra pool. After taking a hit in his water form, Kisum's sword can absorb chakra apparently, a fact that adds to her growing worries. Despite herself and the faith she has in her dark-haired crush, Karen doesn't feel comfortable. And that's what pushes her to make jokes about how Kiri Shinobi are compensating for something with their oversized swords. It helps her stress less about Sasuke Kun who'd left her sensing range, and the S-rank Kiri Nin who at any time, might stop playing around and decide to kill them. Honestly, this was not going how she'd imagined it would go, probably because the specifics had never seemed important at the time. In her dreams the younger Achiha would win, and then they'd go celebrate together, just the two of them. Realistically however, Kisum could pose a huge threat if Sasuke Kung kills his partner. What was the point in fulfilling one of their ambitions only to be killed afterwards by a living sword? That would certainly not be the happy ending she wanted. She startles as the senses she's pushing as far as possible pick up something. Multiple signatures, one very familiar. She could never forget the chakra she'd felt that day. If he's really Sasuke Kun's old teammate, 
then that makes the others with him Leaf Ninja. It's obvious who they're here for. Thinking quickly, she makes a possibly rash decision. Sujetsu. What? He barks back angrily, narrowly avoiding another hit from the chakra absorbing sword. Get over here. After over an hour she'd think their mock fight would have lost any entertainment value. Kirin in, honestly. Ugh. The purple eyed teen hops back from Kissim with a half. You'd better have a go dash. What is it Karen? Jugo interrupts him. Don't you have birds looking out? We've got company. Seven leaf nin and what feels like a summon animal. One of them could possibly be connected to Orochimaru Sama's death. As she speaks she moves the huddle away from the Akatsuki member. Differentiating themselves from that organization is the first part of her plan to not be killed by the Leaf Squadron. The huge, overpowering chakra comes closer. She doesn't have much time. We should surrender to them. What? The expected person immediately blurts out. Why? If they're here for Sasuk then we should fight to hold them off. Prevent them from interfering with his battle. Don't use that as an excuse. She retorts knowing the idiot just doesn't like the idea of surrendering to anyone. I know for a fact you're not willing to die for Sasuke Kun's goal. Sujetsu opens his mouth and then closes it after some thought. Exactly. Odds are that their battle is over already, and Fish Face just hasn't gotten the message yet. So fighting the Leaf would be pointless. If we cooperate they might not kill us. Do you hear yourself? You don't know for sure if giving up would save our lives, and even then, we would end up as prisoners. Do you know what their torture and interrogation division does to prisoners from other villages? Do you she admits that he is raising some good points. Ibiki Marino was quite infamous for his work, and as underlings to Orochimaru Sama. They'd possibly be looking at an extended stay in his care. Yet at the same time, Sasuke Kun might not have outright said it. But this teammate of his had gotten one over him recently, so it wouldn't be impossible for it to happen again. Especially if they outnumber her crush who is likely exhausted by now. That means the soon-to-be last Ichiha could end up in Kanoha again, where he would be out of her reach indefinitely. Just dash her response dies off. She'd been paying close attention to the approaching group, so she noticed when they'd sharply turned in their direction, and now she also senses how the group splits up less than a kilometer away. Four continue towards them, while three in the summon branch off in an angle that will likely take them towards Sasuke Kun. Notably, he isn't part of the four humans. Look, I was conscious when that guy raided the base I was kept in. I know he's powerful. Sujetsu relents in her silence. But I think you're forgetting something. He nods over to Kissim who's just standing there grinning. Kissim Senpai is currently their enemy too and crazy strong. We could join forces against the leaf. We could retreat instead. Let Kissim fight them. Jugo starts to offer when a bird lands in his hair and chirps. He blinks and turns, or not. The four Leafnin emerge from the forest and stop, forming a triangle consisting of the three parties. The newcomers look like the typical four-man group led by a man in a garish green outfit with three younger subordinates. It's the man who Kissim narrows his eyes at. I remember you. Kissim laughs, bandages falling off his sword, revealing spiky scales and a mouth. The green beast. Looks like we can have a proper rematch. You, do I know you? The man asks in confusion. Karen doesn't get to comfortably observe them as the three teens turn to her and the others. A Hyuga, another green outfit, and a girl with her hair in twin buns. To her side Sujetsu raises his cleaver sword and attacks, likely seeing victory against these three. Jugo transforms and likewise charges the boy in green. And that's how she found herself facing the leaf Kunoichi unfurling a large scroll. I surrender. Sakura, P of. The rain was the first sign. They ran into it a few minutes after teen guy split off from them, with Niji having identified Kisum Hoshigaki. Atachi wasn't with him, a trio of strangers there instead, so the teams had separated after making the assumption that the Uchiha would be further down. They really couldn't afford another delay, so they backtracked and pushed on before running into something else. If the downpour hadn't been ominous enough, the black flames certainly were. They covered a great expanse of land, and the falling rain seemed to do nothing to it. She didn't have to be told this fire wasn't normal. So two things, first, we're on the right track. Only person I've seen create fire like this was Atachi. Naruto reports as they stand a safe distance from the conflagration. It will likely continue to burn for days. Jiraiya Sama recounted something along those lines when he first encountered the Akatsuki duo. Her sensei muses, the rain and fire doesn't help. But I can confirm this Atachi scent is present here, along with another that feels kind of familiar. Pakan adds in, familiar? Kakashi-sensei asks to the dog version of a shrug. Yeah, 
Like I said, the environment isn't helping. What's the second thing? She asks, beating the others to the question. I sense someone in the center of all this. Without my sage mode, all I can tell is that they're not moving. Oh, that's certainly an issue. Maybe Niji should have come with them. At least, then they could have potentially gotten a visual of the unknown person and plan accordingly. Now they had to risk the flames to confirm who was among them. Do we have anything to deal with the fire? Your wind jutsu maybe. I have something. It's not a jutsu. However, Jiraiya taught me the fire suppression seal a while back. The blonde nods. Out of his left arm guard comes a scroll which reveals a complex seal when unfurled. Sakura knows he only has so many storage seals on those things. So odds are he prepared that scroll just for this mission. She could respect productivity like that. He creates a clone who takes the scroll and moves over to the flames. Her eyebrow rises when the flames nearest to the scroll warp and are slowly absorbed. It takes a while before a safe path is available, and after a round of glances, they venture forward. The only word to describe what she sees then is devastation. There had obviously been a structure of some sort, but all that remains is rubble. Debris, scattered pieces of metal, and bits of black flames litter the area. As she makes her way inwards following Naruto, she ponders just what could have happened here. It's all too clear that a battle took place. But who did Itachi face? Did Itachi win or is the signature they're closing in on the victor? The universe reveals the answer in a way she'd rather it hadn't. Sasuke indeed, lying near what had once been a wall is her old teammate. Even after almost three years, the distance between them and a change of outfits, she still recognizes him. Just like she recognizes that the shape a short distance from him is a human body with its upper body being consumed by black flames. Mere feet from his comatose form, she doesn't remember when her legs start moving. All she knows is that she's closing the distance when Naruto appears beside Sasuke and touches him. The same red shroud he'd covered Kakashi Sensei in while fighting Tobi lights up around the Ichiha. It envelops him fully when she finally lands beside them. I don't see any serious external damage. But this should help, he explains while glancing at the corpse to the side. A clone forms and disperses. Can we move him? She doesn't respond right away. Too busy running a diagnostic technique on the thankfully living Sasuke. The chakra shroud creates a bit of interference, but she doesn't notice anything that would create any complications. In fact, she can feel the shroud healing their teammate and replenishing his chakra. We can now. She decides and they do so. Not very far, but enough so the fire doesn't pose an immediate threat. His head is positioned lying in her lap. Does he need that for much longer? Naruto asks. She assumes he means the shroud. No, either exhaustion was the worst of the damage, or your chakra transfer works fast. Either way he'll be fine. Good. The shroud gradually fades, and the blonde lays a hand on Sasuke's chest through the open collar. When he moves his hand, a seal is visible for a second, to restrict his chakra. It would also be best if he regains consciousness back in the village. She heeds the politely worded command, and taps an area on her patient's neck. Naruto nods and moves to join Kakashi Sensei and the fire suppressing clone near the corpse, leaving her alone with her childhood crush. That's Kakashi's other student, right? Mostly alone. Mate MM. She mindlessly answers back in, it's Sasuke Kun. The whisper is barely audible, as if anything too loud might disturb his slumber. Lack of consciousness really seems to soften his features. Sakura looks up, noticing the other members of Team Kakashi approaching. Their grim expressions warn her of bad news incoming. Mission's over. Prepare to provide support to Team Guy. It takes her only a second to understand what her sensei means by that. Atachi was their priority, not Sasuke. Just because they have the younger Uchiha now, that doesn't mean they would stop pursuing the eldest. Not unless something drastic happened. Something like Atachi Uchiha being killed before they arrived would count as that something drastic. They'd failed the primary objective. Kurama, P of. When you said delayed Aizanagi, I did not expect it to be so delayed. The millennia old fox grumbles. This is frustrating. True. But you have to admit, the only way Madara could have fooled Hashirama is if he were truly dead for however long it took the first to walk away from his friend's corpse. Chen, Absolutely bored, Kirama starts pacing on a branch overlooking the pile of ashes that was once an Achiha. The physical movement is enough to take his mind off the impatience for a while. Even after months of experiencing it, this style of the shadow clone technique holds a unique fascination to him. To be in the form of a bipedal creature while also holding dominance over the body's actions almost to the point of the body being his. It's not obviously, he can faintly feel his real form inside the real Naruto, yet by merging his consciousness with that of a complaint clones he can come as close as possible to living like a human. Normally he would never desire such a thing, but this state comes with many benefits. 
The semblance of freedom after being passed through three generations of containers, and the ability to lash out against those who sought to use him for their own purpose. To extract vengeance on those cursed Achihas, the frailty of human flesh took the first wretch from him, but the pretender would be his soon enough. In a sense, this delay is a good thing because otherwise, Naruto would have slain the Achiha once and for all. Kurama would have witnessed it close up, but it wouldn't have provided the same satisfaction doing the act himself might. So yes, he should be content. And he was. Half an hour ago, at this point the Achiha was just being a plain nuisance. It's as he contemplates checking in on the original that he feels it. The sudden negative emotions along with the chakra signature that hadn't been there previously. Kurama ceases all movement even tries to further suppress his presence in case the Achiha is a capable sensor. From down below the sound of agitated breathing can be heard. The pretender doesn't scream or vent his burning anger in any way aside from ripping off his mask and throwing it to the ground. Kurama assumes the Achiha is aware enough to realize the danger he's in and doesn't want to draw any attention. Smart of him really. The milky white orbs in place of red Sharingans paint a picture of vulnerability. Any altercation would come with an added element of danger. The target makes his way over to a tree and touches it, a pulse of chakra originates from that point. Kurama doesn't know what the purpose behind that action is, but he makes up his mind. Naruto easily overwhelmed the Achiha, so although he lacks the natural energy to enter sage mode now, the blindness of his opponent should balance it out. He drops down to the forest floor, meters away from the second to last living descendant of Indra, who spins to face him. Far too late. A wet squelching sound echoes around the partially destroyed forest. Warak! Blood erupts from his mouth, the result of Kurama pulverizing his chest cavity on the way to his heart. The fox in human form withdraws and allows the Ichiha to slowly collapse, leaking vital fluid into the grassy earth. For years, Kurama had been looking forward to this. A decade spent alone in the seal while the other half of his being languished in the stomach the Shinigami. Rage and hatred had been his only emotions regarding this specific human. Finding out he was not actually the first Ichiha who used him and left him to be sealed by the wood user's wife did not dampen the frustration. Indeed, having it happen a second time was altogether worse. But now, standing above the dying Sharingan wielder, the personal satisfaction is there. And yet it doesn't quite feel how he imagined it. Naruto's foreknowledge no doubt adding another dimension to what would have been a moment of self-gratification. It doesn't invalidate his emotions on the matter, just makes this act deeper. Meaningful for more than just him and his reasons. I, I know you considered yourself right. That your actions were justified. A hero in your own retelling. He doesn't know if the Achiha hears him, doesn't care either. He just has to get the words off his chest. But the truth is Achiha, similar to how I was a tool for your goals. You were a tool for another. A means to a ruinous end. So this is for more than just me. His blood-covered hand clenches into a fist. I get retribution today. The many innocents you've killed get theirs. The ones you would go on to kill get theirs. I will not apologize, Spawn of Indra. Nor can I genuinely offer condolences. Yet all the same, when you cross into the other, I hope you find what you were after Bito Ichiha. Sometime later, his conscious returns to his body. Kurama. Naruto asks, likely feeling the shift. It's done. Is his simple response. The memories from the Shadow clone would have returned to his partner already. So no details are needed. The question is more to test his state of mind than anything. I see. That's good then. And for the moment, that's that. A little empathy can know her. This is not how I should have learned about it, Naruto. Her voice is firm, neither loud nor soft but carrying the weight of authority and a hint of frustration. I can feel her brown eyes narrowing at me, compelling me to explain myself before she really does get upset. I know, and I'm sorry, but at the time it made a lot of sense to me. I turn from the window overlooking the village and lean against the wall, meeting her gaze. A lot of people go through life with no real sense of purpose. They're just going through the movements basically. Sasuke though, he had a goal, something that guided his every action. So when I found him in that base, I had two options to decide from. I could bring him back which would bar him from ever encountering his brother again. Or I could let him go to do what he left the village to do. So you let him go, despite the fact that he could have reneged on your agreement and never returned. Sunade asks, less questioning my decision as it clearly worked out in the end, and more wanting to hear the why behind it. Why was I so confident Sasuke would return? Yes, he was being honest when he agreed to my terms. And despite what he'd done up to that point, Sasuke doesn't overtly lie. I explained before shrugging, and besides, assuming he was able to fight Itachi and get away. 
Where would he have gone after that? Iowa. No, the leaf was probably the safest he could go. So in the end, your decision was made because you didn't feel comfortable taking away your old teammate's ambition. You let him go with no means to track him with the only guarantee being a promise to return. Jen. Put like that, it doesn't sound very logical. In my defense, however, she's missing a lot of context. She lets out a soft breath of air. Well, luckily for you and not so much for my plans, your decision worked out. Her glare slides off me, and I mentally pat myself on the back. I'd long since worked out an argument for not capturing Sasuke all those months ago, but I'd not been sure how Tsune would take it, nor Sakura for that matter, but hopefully no one feels the need to tell her. It's completely irrelevant now anyways. What matters is how we're moving forward now that the last Ichiha is within the village walls. So what now? The contemplative silence is broken, and her eyes return to me with Sasuke. I expect you've thought about this in case we did find him while looking for his brother. What do you think is a fitting punishment? Imprisonment for a period of time yet to be determined followed by probational return to service, should he desire to. You saw to it that his chakra was sealed, and it'll remain that way until his sentence is served. An eyebrow quirks up then. I think it sounds reasonable, but what do you have to say about that? Not much really. It's not cruel nor unjust. So your word is final here. She nods. Good. Hopefully your teammates will share your belief. By that I assume she's mainly talking about Sakura. Technically, she has nothing to complain about when taking into consideration the treatment an ordinary rogue nin would receive, usually elimination. Makes me somewhat curious as to what happened in the original story. I know Sasuke was free later on, but did he face any charges? Especially after attacking the cage meeting. Or perhaps saving the world gave him some type of immunity. A. Doesn't matter anymore. Tsunade's voice gets my attention again. I suppose with the last Ichiha in our custody it's time we close this chapter of our lives. Tie off loose ends. I don't need to ask what she's talking about. This has been a long time coming after all. I want Sasu to be present. He of all people deserves it. Request granted. I suspected you would ask. Her lips quirk into a knowing smile. Now, I believe there's somewhere you have to be. ECH, yeah, I'll be seeing you later. I leave her office with a final wave and take the long, scenic route out of the Hokage building. It's nice to take it slow for once, enjoy the sights from a different perspective, compared to weeks prior. Saying that I feel a weight was lifted off my back wouldn't be wrong. Would actually be an understatement regarding my current mood. And it's completely justified. I have Black Zetsu sealed away in a container that I'll leave to be forgotten. Abito is dead once and for all with his body turned to ash. Those are two important factors in a scenario where the fate of the world would have been placed at risk. And now they've been handled. I won't try tempting the universe. But I would say things are looking a lot brighter now. Another interesting outcome from the past mission is what happened with Kissum. I'd always assumed Guy took him down yet, although he did fight the tailless beast, Guy did not kill Kissum, nor did he capture him. Instead, with an act that makes sense knowing how hardcore Kiri is, the swordsman took his own life rather than risk being interrogated, using water sharks. So Kissum died, and Guy managed to recover his sword, odds other thing will end up in Tenten's hands somewhere in the future. I wish her luck with that. The other members of Team Guy captured Karen and her teammates with various levels of difficulty, ranging from heated battles to straight up surrender from what I heard. That redeed is something else entirely. Sasuke must either be the most charming guy alive, or Karen is super clingy. Can't tell which. Out of the ten members of the Akatsuki, the Leaf and I have whittled that down to two. Nagato and Conan are the only ones remaining, and the smart decision would be to go after them as soon as possible. People tend to lash out when cornered, and that's the last thing I want the Rinnegan wielder doing. For now, I'm just waiting for Jiraiya to return, and then we'll plan out our next move. That trail of thought is put to the side when I finally arrive at my destination, although I can't help but sigh before walking in. Couldn't have avoided this forever. Sasuke Piov. Sitting on his cot with no one else for company. Sasuke had nothing but time to think about his brother's sacrifice, about all the clues that in hindsight should have made him doubt what really happened that night, about his life decisions based on that deception, about his present, his future. Perhaps it's a good thing that he has this freedom, otherwise he might have never confronted this absolute truth. He, Sasuke Chiha, was lost like never before. After his clan was wiped out, the next course of action had been obvious. Avenge them. From there, various decisions were made with that end goal in mind. Graduate the academy, enter the Chunin exams, go to Orochimaru for training, kill said sensei, or to get stronger and defeat Itachi. Which he did in a fashion. And now here he is with no idea how to move forward. Itachi told him to live his life, 
But what does that really mean? Assuming he is let out eventually, should he continue on the path of a shinobi? Is that even possible anymore knowing what he does now, and after having betrayed his village? Another possibly even more important question, does he even want to be a shinobi? From a certain perspective, his path had been decided by factors outside of his control, and thus, the desire to be a ninja, may very well not have originated from him. His father, his clan, his brother, and even his village, they'd all wanted him to be a shinobi, but after all this time, did he want the same? What would he do then if being a shinobi were to no longer be an interest? What would he do with his life, with his time, to give it meaning? Questions, questions, and even more questions with seemingly no answers. At least none within his reach. The sound of footsteps draws him out from his thoughts. Didn't think I was allowed visitors. Sasuke comments idly after throwing his old teammate a glance. To himself he notes how this is their second encounter since he left all those years ago. And once again, he's in a weaker position with his chakra sealed. You're not. Not unless they're authorized. Shen. He'd been warned about that after the interrogation, told not to share the truth behind the Ichiha massacre. As if he'd even consider exposing something his brother had given his reputation and life to hide. No, everyone else would remain in the dark for all he cares. But it seems the Hokage doesn't understand his conviction, and is restricting who he could potentially leak the news to. That came with the unintended bonus of not having to deal with his old classmates who all likely have words for him. And you, I know the truth if that's what you're asking. Naruto responds simply, using the intel from you and Karen. I was able to find evidence that Danzo and the snake worked together to implant almost a dozen Sharingan. We found out about his order to Itachi after bringing him in. Sasuke lets out a slow exhale. Even the mere mention of that elder was enough to make him seethe. But to think Orochimaru might have had deeper insight into that night made it worse. His infuriating smirks had suddenly gained a new meaning. All those times he'd been reminded of Itachi's brilliance. Goaded to do better if he wanted to kill him. If only he'd moved to kill him before Naruto got to him. Pushing the thought aside, he focuses on the present. Why did you come here Naruto? Well, the blonde moves to sit against the wall facing his holding cell. After almost two months, we've gotten all we can from Danzo, so his execution is coming up soon. You're allowed to be present for it. Good, Sasuke grunts. Internally the news pleases him. Despite the events surrounding the massacre painting a very complex situation making it hard to assign blame. Danzo was the one who approached his brother, and therefore will always be the true culprit in his mind. But if the execution is to follow the traditional method, who will carry out the sentence? Jiraiya. Sasuke tosses and turns that piece of information around in his mind. Either the Hokage ordered the Sanin to participate, or he has his own grudge against the Elder. Whatever it is, the Achiha finds nothing to protest. It's not as if they would allow him to do it. Several minutes pass in silence with Sasuke intermittently thinking about his future and wondering why Naruto remains sitting there, the blonde stare burning into the side of his head. He's not expecting him to break down and start talking, is he? Sasuke has never been the type to discuss his feelings, and this setting is not conducive to starting now. Honestly, he just feels his eye growing, something the once upon a time moron notices as he stands up and brushes off. I don't know why I expected any different. These kind of things were never my strong point. Sasuke gets the feeling the last part was not intended for him. Naruto stares at him for a second before nodding solemnly. Sasuke, this may sound like empty words, but I'm sorry things went down the way they did. I came down here to check up on you and maybe offer some support. Yet it's obvious that I'm out of my depths here. So rather than say something harmful or pester you to talk, I'll give you some space. Perhaps that is the best way for me to help. I'll see you soon Sasuke. Curious black eyes watch as the blonde walks out of sight. Some days later, a couple Ambu approach Sasuke's cell. Knowing what is coming, he makes no effort to resist as they lock his hands behind his back and attach a tag to his neck. A quick test reveals it prevents him from forming audible words. Safety measures seen too. They escort him to an unfamiliar room within the maze that is the interrogation department. He casts an eye over the room before mentally casting it aside. The people are more interesting than the plain walls. Presiding over the room on a dais are the two living Sanin along with Naruto. The Hokage stands a short distance in front of the other two in a triangle. From the entrance to the raised steps is a stretch of open space, and on each side of that are leaf personnel. Sasuke recognizes two who'd served as proctors for the Chunin exam, and another duo who resemble old classmates of his, the rest are strangers. Itachi's secret assignment actually has a chance of remaining a secret, if these dozen or so people are the only ones in the know. The guards lead him to the right of the aisle, and he spends the next while ignoring the various eyes that try to analyze him, 
Unwanted attention is something he knows well. And then he is finally brought in manacles restrain his single arm behind his back, while another set covers his ankles and prevents them from reaching a full stride. Although bearing the signs of years past and various degrees of torture, Sasuke recognizes the man from Itachi's illusion. One Danzo Shimura, the catalyst behind the Achiha massacre is marched past him only a meter or two at most. Sasuke's arms are behind his back, but unlike the elder, his feet aren't shackled. This close, he would need just a few seconds to charge at him and knock him down from which point a well-placed kick would see his throat collapse beyond repair. As long as he acts before the feeling of hands tightening around his arms brings him back to reality. He blinks and the dull roar of blood within his ears fades a bit. Seems he had underestimated just what seeing this man would do to him. But to think that this, this pathetic waste of space is the reason he no longer has a clan. That this filthy, conniving wretch is the reason every Ichiha, regardless of their age and role in the plan coup, was slaughtered. It's safe to say that the anger and hatred Sasuke had once held for Itachi as a campfire compared to the all-consuming inferno burning inside him now. Truly, with no previous bonds, this is someone Sasuke could detest with all his being. And he does. A prayer is sent up then, one begging for no further twists, because as the blade swings and the head rolls, there is nothing but duck satisfaction within his chest. Eov. Restored. You know, I have a whole new respect for those in the psychiatric field. To be able to analyze someone's psyche and then use that understanding to help them recover or predict their next move if they're a criminal is something that shouldn't be taken for granted. Of course, this mental musing comes about due to Sasuke. I was right in assuming talking to him wouldn't be easy. For obvious reasons the guy was a whirlwind of emotions. My senses easily picked up rage, confusion, betrayal, guilt, and a lot more. And the thing is, just because I could tell what emotions he was feeling did not mean I knew the why behind them. He could have very well been enraged at the village as a whole, rather than just Danzo. Could have been a combination of the two, maybe a large part of that rage was at the cripple, and a small fraction at the leaf. Furthermore, just who or what exactly did he feel betrayed him? The village for obvious reasons. His clan for not being completely innocent and ruining the image he'd likely had of them. Itachi for deceiving him for so long. Himself for indirectly killing Itachi. I had no way of telling short of asking him, but the vibe I was getting from him was not one of let's talk about our feelings. So I left. The way I see it, he's not going anywhere. So I'll bid my time until he's in a space where we can make some progress. I have no idea how long that will take and as I watch him be escorted away from the site of the execution, I get to wondering. I definitely sense how he reacted to seeing Danzo from beginning to end. And I'm curious as to the effect this will have on him. That burst of satisfaction, does it mean he feels retribution has been achieved? Will he move on to grieving for Itachi? and then eventually overcoming the loss. Or does he want vengeance still? Does he expect recompense from the village? When Tsunade formally declares his punishment, will that spark something negative inside him? It's all quite stressing to think about so as per usual. I calmly push it aside for future me. Nothing gained from thinking about it now. Naruto. I turn to Tsunade with a raised eyebrow. Jiraiya, and I have some things to talk about. Why don't you go spend time with your friends? I'm sure they have questions about their old classmate. Ah, that's not co for them doing other things right. No, the serious look on Jiraiya's face seems legitimate. Okay, thanks, Naruto. I'll call for you soon. With a smile from the blonde and a pat on the shoulder from my sensei, they make their way out. As if on cue someone else approaches me then. Blondie, you look like you could use some company. Looks can be deceiving. If you didn't know her and only had her typical attire and mannerisms to make assumptions, you wouldn't expect Anko to be some kind of tea connoisseur. But she doesn't care about the opinions of the common person and actually enjoys things like hosting tea ceremonies and sampling it from different shops. It's to a new one on her list that we head to. Alright Naruto, she finally says as she gently puts down her teacup. Before this she'd spent a good 5 minutes evaluating all sorts of things that I hadn't even noticed when I tried it. You have 5 seconds to start talking before I show you my special. Shem PH, do your worst I'm joking. Her glare goes down a notch, and she thankfully doesn't carry out her threat while I gather my thoughts. Look, it's not that I didn't take your warning seriously cause I did. I accept the fact that people change, and sometimes you just have to let them go. I really do. I sense a book coming. However, QI roll. You have to admit that this situation is far from simple. I won't go further since we're in public, but I do feel like I owe it to him to try and make sure he doesn't go into a downward spiral. And by owe him, I mean mostly Itachi and somewhat Sasuke. Is that all it is? I shrug at the question making her sigh, could be worse I guess. As long as you don't forget the past and let him cloud your judgment I'll stay quiet. 
Don't think it means I like him though. Trust me, you've made your opinion on traitors loud and clear to me. And she has. Anko and I have hung out a few times by now. And although not all of our discussions are this serious, she's taken the time to share her experience with having someone close go rogue and how to deal with it. Or how to not deal with it actually. She's a supporter of holding people accountable regardless of previous connections, while also not letting them hold power over you. She'll be the first to admit to not living up to the second part. But she's gotten better since the events in the Forest of Death. Needless to say she doesn't approve of Sasuke running from the village, to knowingly join the same person who turned his back on her in the leaf. Not one bit. She would advise me to forget about Sasuke and just live my life unburdened. Personally, I do plan on living unburdened to the best of my ability. Yet I also need to think about the future, and the last etcher his role in it. Rinnegan Sharingan hybrid or not, he could still be a useful person to have around, if more of Kagaya's people come to visit. So my desire to see him mentally stable is more for safety's sake, than some dumb men said that he's a victim and should be pardoned. Although, I can't really tell her that so it's best if she thinks it's as simple as him being an old teammate. It's not like I'm the only one, Rogue Nin can't be trusted. Why do you think we have a division specifically for hunting them down? I sincerely hope Hokage Sama doesn't go easy on him because he's the last of a dying breed. She catches my look, what to fire. Kind of, yeah. And as for his punishment, she's told me the gist of it. And I think it's fair. Of course you would, he gets to keep breathing after all. Her demeanor changes then, gets softer as her caring side comes to the forefront. I know you're a smart and capable guy Naruto. But I still worry. I don't want his presence within these walls to stress you out. Way over you and make you feel like you have to help him. After all you've done, helping bring this whole thing to the light and taking down that scum. You don't owe the Acheha anything further. You could let the specialist deal with the fallout and be completely in the right. I give her hand a squeeze, she'd moved hers to hold mine at some point and smile. It's clear she cares and although I think I'm good in this case. It's nice to get that reminder. Trust me Anko, no one will be allowed to control me. Least of all Sasuke. Good, a beat passes and then her lips curl faintly. Now make it into one of your promises. I should have seen this coming. Just ruin the moment why don't you? I promise to not let this whole thing create an unnecessary burden for myself. You forgot something. It's not complete without the believe it. The last two words are said with a high-pitched voice, in mockery of what I used to sound like. It almost makes me cringe. Screw you Enko Tsune Piov. The successful retrieval of Sasuke Chiha was not kept a secret. There was no point seeing as how he would eventually be a free man, if heavily observed, in the not-so-distant future. So, although not overtly stated, the news would trickle down, and soon even the civilians would be aware of it. Not the complete truth of course, as some things were better left in the dark. Contrary to everyone else who had the Acheha on their minds however, the topic she and Jiraiya were discussing in the privacy of her home was notably different. Then they could wait a safe distance from the border, they wouldn't have to know what you were there for. Sunaid suggests leading Jiraiya to raise an eyebrow. That would defeat the purpose of them being there for added safety. He shakes his head, security we don't need I'd like to emphasize. But you don't know that. She attempts to stare him down while he does the same from the other side of the dining room table. Neither speak for a brief moment before she breaks the silence. Look Jiraiya, this is important to you and I understand. What I don't understand is why you feel the need to go about it in the most idiotic way possible. So being optimistic makes me an idiot. His tone is equally hot. No, but not being open to alternative solutions does. She responds. They barely started, and already the bottle of sake on the counter behind her is looking so very tempting. It's true, men really do lead women to drink. Being safer and keeping things confidential don't have to be opposing objectives. And I'm telling you we'll be safe enough without having to compromise secrecy. I may be older now, Haim, but I'm still a Sanin. And I'll have Naruto by my side. We can handle anything that comes our way. I'm not doubting your strength, you old fool. I'm worried that you might be too much of a good person. I see where you're going with this, so believe me when I dash she cuts him off then. Would you really be able to strike them down? The little brats you took in when Orochimaru threatened to do the same too. It comes across as harsh. But she wants him to acknowledge this. Because let me tell you Jiraiya, if I ever had to do the same with Shizun, I wouldn't be able to. You and Shizun are a different case Haim. She's practically family at this point. He sidetracks. Perhaps. But don't think I didn't notice what finding out they're alive did to you. Deep down you never did let them go, and this guilt won't make it easier. I know before her eyes the normally boisterous man she's known for what seems like forever shrinks down on himself. 
It brings a pang to her chest. But I have to try, I'm, try to change their minds. And if that fails she closes the distance then, walks around the table to wrap him up in a tight embrace. It says something about the seriousness of the conversation that he merely hugs her back. You don't have to worry about me. I'm, he murmurs into her hair, but I do anyways, she whispers. Couldn't the big idiot see what she saw? It was fine to be optimistic and think he could get through to his old charges, but the odds were not in his favor. Only Kami knows what sort of trauma those orphans must have taken to be where they are now, and that kind of pain, powerful enough to turn them to the Akatsuki, would not be healed with mere words. No, such a thing would take time or as was fairly common between contrasting mindsets, a conversation using fists. She didn't like such a scenario. The possibility of hesitating on Jiraiya's part was one reason, and the negative impact of killing a student was another. Damned if he isn't ruthless enough and damned if he is. The addition of Naruto helped, but it didn't clear all her worries. The blonde was strong, frighteningly so for someone of his age, and much smarter than when she first met him. If anyone should be trusted to fight S-rank shinobi and win or retreat to live another day, then it's the Yuzumaki. Yet she worries. In the heat of a battle between monsters like that, anything could happen, and then she would be down another loved one. She wouldn't allow that to happen, not anymore. Would it help then, if we had a fallback contingency? The Toad Sage breaks off the hug, another unusual occurrence. With only the two of us, reverse summoning would be an option. It's a start, she allows. They wouldn't be going anywhere until she assesses every countermeasure possible. Hinata Piov. She's facing a conundrum. One with dire consequences. Her expression is troubled as she adjusts her forehead neck protector for what feels like the tenth time. Completely unnecessary. But any excuse that gives her an extra moment to think is very much appreciated. Her eyes lock onto the source of her current dilemma. On the other side of the wall that surrounds the academy grounds. And currently sitting on the swing set is her Naruto-kun. Luckily for her, he hadn't been looking at the entrance when she'd stepped through and taken notice of him. That allowed her to quickly backtrack and hide behind the wall from his direct line of sight. She could see him, but he couldn't see her. Which, sadly enough, is how it's always been with her and Naruto-kun. Back in their younger years she would watch him in class while he would focus on other things. She would watch him train while he had no idea he had an audience. She would watch him take the world head on with a smile on his face, while he believed he had no one on his side. It was rather frustrating to be honest. And although she's matured and became stronger over the years, she can't quite muster the courage to approach him. Sure, she's interacted with him in Tsunade-sama's office where she would report sometimes, but never has she broached what she really wants to. The important stuff. This could be her chance however, an opportunity to talk to him with no bystanders, and therefore less pressure. All she has to do is walk through that entrance and take perhaps a dozen steps, and she would be within speaking range. Just a few steps and the next chapter of her life could begin. If only it was that easy. Despite her current reality not being what she wished it to be, it's much more tolerable than the hypothetical scenario where she confesses and has her love go unrequited. Indeed, the illusion of a chance is powerful enough to glue her feet to the ground, make her hesitate. Perhaps now isn't the right time. Matters such as this shouldn't be rushed. With that decided, Hinata's legs finally obey her commands as she moves to approach Naruto-kun. Not to talk about her, but to see how he's coping with his old teammate being back. She may not be the best conversationalist, but she can at least try to lend her help if it's needed. She deactivates her Byakugan before going around the corner, and there he is. Looking at her, something flutters inside her stomach. Hey there Hinata. He smiles in greeting as she gets closer. Ah, hello, Naruto-kun. It's not perfect. But at least she doesn't stutter. Is there something wrong? No, why do you ask? Oh, sorry. It's just that you're sitting on the swing and, uh, you only used to do that when, uh, when I was feeling upset. You're not wrong. Forgot how observant you are, Hinata. She flushes slightly as he runs an eye over the tree and surrounding area. You know, for something that's meant to be fun, this swing doesn't really hold many happy memories for me. He shrugs, but that's in the past with a different Naruto. Can only move on now. So... How are you doing, Hanata? Getting back from a mission. I'm doing well, Naruto-kun. And I was here on my father's orders to learn about the responsibilities the clan heiress will have. She responds. It was still quite early for preparations to take over from her father. But like he'd warned her, the Hyuga clan was sizable and held influence over many aspects in the village. Aspects she must be familiar with now rather than later. There was an image to uphold after all. Clan stuff, huh? Can't say I envy you. He rises from the swing and smiles down at her from his new height. You're not busy right now, are you? I had something to talk to you about, and thought now might be a good time. He wanted to talk to her. More importantly, 
Had he been waiting for her here? Either way, I'm not busy. Her report could wait a while longer. Great. Walk with me. And that's how Hanada finds herself walking beside Naruto-kun down the streets of Kanoha. Almost as if they were dating. Or anything else other than being mere acquaintances really. What do they look like from an outsider's perspective? Do they look close? Should she put some distance between them? Get closer. Wait, she'd had a reason for going up to him. I, uh, heard about Sasuke. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. Thanks I guess. It's a relief to have him back. That's good to hear. She comments, I'm happy for you. You're really too kind Hanata. He turns to her with a faint smile, once she returns shyly. Not everyone is happy to see him after what he did. Ah, she'd worried about that when she first heard of Naruto-kun's promise to Sakura. Seeing it through would only be the start of his problems. I don't blame them really. Especially those who almost died trying to rescue him the first time. Was Kiba happy? I am not sure. And that's an honest reply. Kiba himself seems to have conflicting emotions. On one hand Sasuke used to be a comrade while on the other he betrayed the pack. It's complicated, I think. I understand that. But enough about Sasuke. Anything new in your life Hanata? Well, Kurenai Sensei is getting married soon. To Asuma Sensei, she offers to a raised eyebrow. Really? That's good news. Will it be before she's due? Yes. She wants little Mirai born in wedlock. Her sensei was fixed on that in particular, wanted her daughter to be raised in the type of household she'd never had. Mirai Saratobi, huh? You are, don't like it. No, no, not that, just getting a feel for the name. It's unique. Was that name planned from the beginning? It surprises her how easy it is to make small talk with Naruto-kun. She sees it as a sign of progress. She'd had no idea where he was leading her. But when they finally stop and he gestures outward, she recognizes the setting quick enough. Despite the lack of snow and bullies to mock the appearance of her eyes, she would never forget this street. The site of one of their earliest encounters. Where it all started. I'm glad to see you remember this. His voice takes her attention. While she'd been reminiscing, he'd moved to stand in a specific spot. The area where he'd fallen after taking a shot to the face. While defending her she remembers. I never forgot either. Although, I admit, it took me a long time to recognize the significance of that day. Of what it meant to you. I are, uh, it's, and there goes her composure. It's honestly what she'd been expecting from the start, Naruto-kun always did have a way of overwhelming her. The turn this talk was taking did not help. You ever think about that day and just wonder what could have been Hinata? Like if we'd actually became friends over the shared experience. His voice is so soft, but she hears him all the same. Hearing one of her fondest dreams spoken out loud gives her the courage to speak clearly. I do, Naruto-kun, a lot doesn't even begin to explain it. So many times she's fantasized about growing up with him as a close friend and then later life partner. So much would have changed if she'd had him beside her. I do too, especially recently. Her mind goes abuzz wondering what could have happened recently and pretty quickly comes to a conclusion. He knows. You're an amazing person Hanata. One of the kindest people I know. The compliments, which would have been quite pleasant in another context, take on a negative connotation here. She almost wanted to cover her ears to not hear the rest, but her arms wouldn't move from her side. So although I can't readily return your feelings, I'd like to try, if you're willing. I was thinking we could start off as friends. Before her heart can break into a thousand pieces, she takes in what exactly Naruto-kun was saying. She didn't necessarily have prior experience, but that was not like any rejection she'd heard before. She was sure that's where he was heading when he first started, but the ending there. Was he saying, it's not the most romantic of ideas, but I don't know, it could work. Naruto-kun shrugs, and for the first time she realizes that this isn't easy for him either. I'm aware enough to admit I don't know you all that well Hanata, and I'd even go as far as to say you don't know me either. The Naruto that you developed feelings for is long gone, and I don't know if you'd like the new one the same. That was possible. She very much doubts it, but it could happen. But that's not what's important right now, she's much more interested in this idea and what it means. Friends who are trying to get to know each other, it sounds much like dating. But he didn't put it that way. She's happy he's not saying no. But she's confused all the same. Why not why this way? You're not any random girl Hanata. You were always kind to me and I want to return the favor. I want to do this the right way. And I don't trust myself to not take advantage of your feelings for me. If we started dating like this. That sends her reeling momentarily. He notices. Imagine we were dating Hanata. Imagine I wanted to change the dynamics of our relationship. Would you allow me to? And would it be because you wanted it or because you didn't want to disappoint me? Would you hold me accountable to being the best partner for you that I could be? I could go on. 
But the gist of this is that I don't want to put you into a situation like that. I don't want to be that toxic partner. In the privacy of her thoughts, Hinata admits Naruto-kun makes a good point. She knows she's not the most assertive of girls. And she also knows if she doesn't already love him, then she's close. If keeping him satisfied by her side was within her power to grant, then she'd do it in a heartbeat. And she might not even be conscious of the fact. She of course trusts him and believes he would never do anything to hurt her, as this talk is proving. But she understands he might have reservations. And this would help prevent that. She finally asks and he smiles. Yes. And I mean it when I say friends. Not just two people who see each other every now and then and are friendly. I want to get to know the real you while you do the same with me. In time we could have mutual feelings for each other, well either that will come to our senses perhaps. I'd like that as well, Naruto-kun. It certainly sounds pleasant. Spending time with him was already something she wanted so for now she's content. Conan P. Of. As the name suggests, rain is plentiful in her village. It falls in a seemingly endless downpour, and dictates almost every aspect of life with a name. Simply another reason amongst dozens as to why its shinobi are known to be very short-tempered. Regardless, the weather outside plays no part regarding the heavy atmosphere within the building known as God's Tower. Still no word. The blue-haired Kinochi comments to her longtime friend and now leader as she helps him get comfortable. Only someone who knows her well would be able to discern any emotion from her stoic statement. Her companion is likely the only such person. That is concerning. For what reason would they be absent for so long? Nagato wonders aloud in his raspy voice. Conan stays silent as she has no answers herself. The man they know as Madara can be distant at times, off focusing on his own projects kept a secret even from her and Nagato. Despite that, he makes use of his ability to come and go as he pleases to relay information and assign certain tasks. So short spans of time without hearing from him aren't overly unusual. What makes this case unique is the uncertainty they are currently facing. Dadara and Sasori, Haydn and Kakuzu, both teams eliminated during official Akatsuki business. The first handling the extraction of the One Tails and the second pursuing the location for the Nine Tails. Kisum and Itachi, presumed dead or incapacitated after taking on a personal objective for the Ichiha. Madara, or Tobi after taking on an active role, and Zetsu, missing and possibly incapacitated following last communication almost two weeks previously. It's possible Madara took interest in Itachi's objective, meaning they might have shared the same fate. From a group 10 strong, the only remaining members are her and Nagato, which places them at a disadvantage. Madara was a contributing member of their organization, loath as she is to admit it. He helped guide the Akatsuki to its current goal, and often possessed intel that was hard to come by. The same went for Zetsu who reported directly to the Achiha and functioned as their eyes and ears around the elemental nations. Without those two, they found themselves suddenly in the dark regarding important information. Indeed, despite believing their lives would be better without the masked individual's presence, she admits that now is not an optimal time for said desire to have become reality. How will we proceed? She asks instead and watches as he ponders the question. Like her, Nagato isn't overly fond of Madara. So she is curious as to what he will decide on now, with the assumption that the man may very well be dead. Would he diligently continue on their current path or would he forge his own? Either way she would follow. Their friendship demanded no less. We've come this close. He finally speaks up. She quietly nods at the statement. After all we've lost and overcame to reach this point, to regress would be an absolute betrayal of everything we stand for. We give him and Zetsu another two weeks to resurface, and after that we continue with the eight tails. The nine tails will be left for last. Will we look to gather more allies? Should they not return? No. You and I will suffice. He looks at her then, his legendary eyes blazing with power and confidence in such distinction from his emaciated form lying on the bed. After all, we are accustomed to shouldering our burdens alone, aren't we? The sad truth of this world. He falls asleep soon after that, his physical body recuperating after the strain of capturing the six tails and extracting it. The process took a much heavier toll, with only the two of them to guide it, and even then, Nagato shielded her from the brunt of it. As she makes her way around the tower, she reflects on the people who'd entered and left her life. Some were inconsequential, while others left their mark on her very soul. Yuhiko sensei would they understand? Is it over? Kanoha every important action deserves an equally important planning session. Of course, the second part won't be remembered in the same manner as the first. But that doesn't mean it's not necessary. So before setting out to face the remaining members of the Akatsuki we had to strategize, devise a plan beyond simply sneaking in and knocking heads. Said planning session took place in the Hokage's personal home, under an assortment of seals that provide much better security, 
than what I have in my own home. For now, that is, is that everything then? Have we accounted for all the factors we can reasonably control? Sunaid glances from Jureya to me, the only ones in the room with her. Well, I certainly think so. Jureya nods somewhat indulgingly. We can start this mission knowing at the very least that we plan to the best of our ability. Yeah, this is definitely better than what he and I had in mind. I have no issue admitting that because while my own plan had a number of contingencies to it, the majority of them were focused on actually taking down Nagato and Conan. Since I saw that as the biggest hurdle, these additions by Tsunade can be easily slotted into my master plan to great effect. Of course it is. I made it. Um, I'll ignore that one. Even if only because she's more stressed out about this mission than either of us. Being relegated to the back seat where she can't provide any immediate aid is really weighing on her. If nothing needs to be changed then we can do another run through. Naruto, you do it. Definitely stressed out. And yet I go along with it, putting myself into the mindset that I'm running the mission already, and outlining each step in the order that we take them. I tap specific points on the map spread atop the table as I go, and patiently answer each probing question sent my way. When you take away all the specifics and look at it on the surface level, our plan isn't all that complicated. Jureya and I will sneak out from the village under the cover of darkness, using one of the many ambu-restricted paths, and after taking evasive maneuvers to lose any tails, make our way westward to the hidden rain. We will sneak past our own border patrol. Their numbers are doubled for the duration of this mission, and that of rain after crossing over. Before we reach the border, however, I'll arrange for a clone to be reverse summoned by Fukasaku, while Jureya will summon the Toad, who will ferry us into the hidden rain when the time comes. We decided on doing this step before entering enemy territory to lessen the chance that someone might notice the spike in chakra usage. So we sneak out of our village and into the rain village with none the wiser. Due to a lack of good intel, our plan for once we're inside is less comprehensive and relies more on smart ground decisions. We'll move fast to locate the Akatsuki's base and confront the leader and his partner. If at any moment we should find ourselves on the back foot then we retreat. No debate. Tsunade has made that clear. And there you have it, an outline for the upcoming mission. One shaping up to be as black tape as Atachi's. The type of thing that will never go on file and will never be shared. The only people who will know the full details are sitting in this room. And just why is that the case? It's quite simple no, simple isn't the right word here. The opposite really seeing is how this situation we found ourselves in, is full of layers and different factors to consider. Jureya wants to redeem the three orphans who in his mind he abandoned in a war-torn village. He wants to knock some sense into them and have them renounce their old ways. I don't know what would happen to them after that, but I do realize Jureya doesn't want to kill his old charges, unless it's the final resort. Yet if he does succeed in getting through to them, no one can know about it. And when I say no one, I mean absolutely no one. If it leaked out that the Leaf had contact with the Akatsuki leader, the group of rogue ninjas who successfully captured several Jinchuriki and stole their tailed beasts, then there would be hell to pay. The various hidden villagers would call for their heads, and I suppose it would be within their right to do so. Even though they contributed nothing, leaving the leaf to take down the other six Atachi doesn't count, and no one will know about Black Setsu members of the organization. I don't imagine Jureya would take kindly to such a demand, so Tsune would have to make a hard decision, bend to the other cage or tell them off. Disregarding the question of which choice would be the right one, it isn't impossible that conflict could break out in such a scenario. A conflict that none of us want. Would be a real shame to try so hard to prevent one war only for another to break out over something I participated in. So the best way to prevent that outcome is to be discreet. No one will know when we leave, and no one will know what we're up to. Not even those making up our contingencies. It will be annoying having to sneak past the hyper-vigilant border patrol. But that's the price to pay to have them both close by yet unaware of our infiltration in terrain. Of the Toad clan only a select few knew where we planned on going, and they were well accustomed to ninjas by this point, and didn't put up a fuss as to what we would be doing there. They simply agreed to be our escape option, should we need it. To get the clone to the Toads, I'll be using the method devised by Naruto during the pain invasion only in reverse. The clone equipped with a jewel and scroll will be summoned away by Fukasaku and Beyond Middleman. There's a brief moment of silence after I wrap up in which Tsunade stares at the map in thought. We watch her sigh a final time before she looks up to pin us with a heavy stare. I've stalled long enough I suppose. It's time. I can't come with you. Nor can I send someone in my place so I'm trusting you too. Come back home. We won't let you down home, Jureya promises with one of his smaller smiles. Very different from the overdramatized gestures that make up his public persona. Just you wait, we'll be back in no time. Listen to the old man for once, we got this. I throw in. 
Matter of fact, make a note somewhere that when I get back I want some downtime. All this Akatsuki business is giving me grey hairs. Her lips quirk HMPH, I'll see what I can do. Take care of yourselves out there. Take care of each other. That last part seems to be aimed at me more than Jiraiya. So I nod when her eye catches mine. One way or another, we'll both be coming back. That, I promise. Aim, there's a reason the Toad summons are held with such high regard. And it's not because of their size. Well, their sheer bulk does play a role. But I personally like their versatility more. Take for example the hiding in a Toad technique which does exactly what it says. It is utilized in conjunction with a toad which can alter its size from that of a regular, non-summoned toad to the proportions of a small house. Throughout that process, the toad can carry passengers who seemingly shrink and grow along with it, when in actuality their absolute size doesn't change. The toad hides the chakra of its passengers, making the technique extremely useful for infiltration purposes. Makes sense that an infamous spymaster like Jureo would have a couple of techniques like that hidden in his toolkit. With it breaching the heavily isolated village became a relatively simple process. I exit the toad first, that odd squeezing sensation making its way down my body, as I slowly creep out and balance on top of the water. My gaze falls onto the industrialized village off in the distance, and I can't help but wonder whether Nagato sensed us already, or if we'll have to make landfall before that can happen. Neither option discounts how remarkable his ability to sense chakra through rain is. I wouldn't even know where to begin creating a technique like that. A movement to the side lets me know Jiraiya is fully out, meaning it's safe to look now. It's squeamish of me yet something about a man his size popping out of a tiny toad's mouth makes me feel sick. So this is the new head and rain, huh? Different from when you last saw it. Times like these remind me just how old this guy is. Very. Let's take a closer look and see just how much has changed. I let him take the lead as we leave the water and slip into the crowd of pedestrians going about their day, as if the downpour doesn't affect them. I suppose when it rains more often than not one adapts quickly enough. We approach a stand of sorts, and in almost no time Jureya engages the elderly woman selling her baked goods and gets her to talk about the goings-on in the village. What we learn from her and others as we navigate the streets makes for a thought-provoking picture. Nagato, known as pain to these people, and Conan are essentially seen as divine figures due to a combination of their power and the good they've done for the people since overthrowing Hanzo the Salamander. If the villagers were to discover our purpose here they would turn on us, rightly seeing us as agents of the great nations here to kill their leaders and take away the stability and peace of mind they've established over the years. As if this village needs more reason to hate those who use their home as a battleground. The realization that I could very well be the villain gives me slight pause, but I harden myself and pray once more that everyone walks away from this encounter alive. The best case scenario for many, with Jiraiya focusing on gathering intel, it leaves me to monitor the response to our infiltration. I reach out with my sensing abilities in an attempt to anticipate any ambushes before they happen. As the minutes go by and we get more mentions of God's Tower, I start to realize that Nagato's rain technique might not give him an exact location for intruders as otherwise. He should ah, uh, spoke too soon. I almost didn't catch it, the barest hint of chakra sweeping around us. If they didn't contain part of her conscious, and therefore her emotions, Conan's little paper relays would have gone unnoticed. As it is, I pick up on the telling mix of surprise, regret, and then resolve. And having already grabbed my attention, I feel her chakra signature becomes stronger somewhere above and to the left of us. Likely as a result of her coalescing from her previous state of scattered sheets of paper. Mentally brushing aside how useful a technique that must be I catch Jiraiya's eye and blink meaningfully. Three seconds count and I blink again. The message thus conveyed and received we continue on our way. She follows us of course. Traces of paranoia are picked up by my senses as we approach an area devoid of other life. Once sufficiently isolated the signature that had been trailing her finally makes itself known by dropping down before us. The black and red cloak around his form is all too recognizable even if his face isn't. The designations of the various parts were never important to me, so I don't exactly recall which is which, but I'm certain this one is the animal. The name came from its ability to summon multiple kinds of animals as well as summoning the other parts. Wherever this one shows up the others can as well. In the air above the animal path floats God's angel on motionless wings. Her appearance is just about what I remember. Hair a unique shade of blue with a paper flower attached to it, skin fair and blemish free, and a completely blank expression. The Akatsuki cloak is a given. Conan, taking a step forward, Jiraiya addresses his old students for the first time in decades. And Nagato, is that you? Your face has changed completely, but I could never forget those eyes. Hopefully Jiraiya wasn't expecting a happy reunion. 
because there is nothing fond about the look the path fixes on him. Total apathy actually. You shouldn't have come here, Jiraiya sensei. There is nothing here for you. I don't need to look to know Jiraiya didn't take that well. Don't give me that Nagato. You were all my precious students. How could I not come here after getting news of your survival? Is his heated reply before softening his voice? Where is Yahiko? Is he part of this too? He died long ago. The news is delivered in the same tone one would talk about the weather. Conan remains silent in her position in the air, a pulse of negative emotions being the only clue she cares for the subject at hand. Although very distantly, I can sense a bit of Nagato's feelings through the path. His own grief was overshadowed by anger. Definitely not as apathetic as the path's face would have you believe. I see. I had hoped you all survived. But it seems it wasn't meant to be, and for that I am sorry. I shouldn't have left you all behind, it was a foolish and heartless decision on my part. His head dips into a sad bow before rising after a moment, yet that does not justify what you're doing. Tell me Nagato, what happened? How did Yahiko die and how did you become like this? Nothing happened. There was just war. War and all that it brings. The path informs us. What you see before you is the result of that. Suffering so profound that it marked the death of that which you once knew. Yuhiko is no more. Nagato is no more. There is only pain now. Pain that I will share with the world. Pain, huh? That's your reasoning for what you've done over the years, Nagato. That's why you created the Akatsuki and raised tensions among the villages. To have everyone suffer the way you did. Jiraiya shakes his head in disappointment. And you Conan, why go along with this? You are such a sweet girl. The calmest of you three. How could you condone this, let alone participate in it? Even then she doesn't speak, making my ability to read people a godsend at this moment. Instead, the moving corpse takes the opportunity to talk down to us some more. I would not expect you to comprehend it Jiraiya Sensei, encumbered as you are. The actions of a god are rarely understood by mortals. You think yourself to be a god. A hint of something creeps into Jiraiya's voice, while the path doesn't bother with a response. A god, and this is what you do. Kill those who haven't harmed you all in an attempt to spread pain. I don't know how you've been led astray like this. But those are not the actions of a god. It's wrong, and I hope you can see that. You have the power to do good Nagato. Instead of leading rogue shinobi and creating strife, focus that power on helping others instead. Violence doesn't solve Dash enough. The volume doesn't change. Yet it's clear the path did not like where Jiraiya was heading. Let me enlighten you sensei. You speak of helping others, yet the constraints of your mortality prevent you from seeing the truth. For all your efforts and time spent on solving the issue of world peace, you are no closer to a solution today than you were all those years ago. It is clear that such an endeavor is beyond you, beyond any one person. That is why I have taken up the burden of finding the answer. As a god, I can accomplish what you have failed to do. I will create the peace this world needs. I step forward to stand beside Jiraiya and facing down the path. And how do you plan on doing that? By showing the world pain. The path begins its reveal through the assembled tail beasts. I will create a new forbidden jutsu. That with a single use will wipe out an entire nation. Tens of thousands will die leaving the people terrified. They will know pain and only then will they learn the value of peace and seek it out. As the god of peace, it is my duty to guide the world along this path. The path to true peace. A path paved in blood and fear. I rebuttal. You'd be damning hundreds of innocents for this. The ends would justify the means. It responds without care which sets off Jiraiya. No, they would not. True peace, a peace that would last is not established on the graves of innocence. Your actions would only lead to fear and resentment, which would perpetuate this world of violence and hatred. No Nagato he slowly pulls out a scroll from his pocket and unravels it. This path will only lead to ruin, of yourself and of those around you. I won't let you do that. As your sensei, it's my duty to stop you here before such horrors can come to pass. And as I informed you earlier, you shouldn't have come here sensei. All you've done is forfeit your life and contribute another component to my plan for world peace. So it finally acknowledges who I am. I'm sorry Nagato, but your plans end here. The two Akatsuki members don't have the right vantage point to see Jiraiya slip a piece of paper onto the seal matrix of the scroll and seemingly store it away. On the other hand, he and I clearly see the path clasp its hands together and then the puff of smoke that momentarily blocks our vision. As the smoke slowly dissipates, I feel the shift in Jiraiya's body, as the clone he'd left outside the village transfers over the natural energy it had collected. At that same moment, I activate my own sage mode via Kurama. The smoke screen is gone by that point revealing what the path had summoned. The other five paths, where there was only one now stand six figures in Akatsuki cloaks and Rinnegan eyes. I'd been expecting such a sight before this even started. Jiraiya, 
not so much. Yuhiko comes his shocked whisper. But how? Nagato said how do you all have his eyes? Yuhiko, Nagato, neither means a thing. We are pain, says the favored path, the one using Yuhiko's body. We are God. And at this point, I've had enough of the talking. I know for a fact Nagato won't listen to a thing we say until we've proven ourselves. Proven through violence, amusingly enough. They shift, and I launch into action, a set of kunai dropping into my hands, and going airborne a fraction of a second later. So ingrained is the combination that I barely think about it, and my chakra responds, turning half a dozen projectiles into a dark cloud, seeking to impale their targets. The Yahiko Path Diva. Ash chooses the easiest method of handling the swarm of kunai, and sends out a burst of gravitational force, dispelling the clone weapons, and sending the real ones flying. I had planned for this naturally so even before the diva acted I was reaching out and infusing the air around me with chakra which I then grasped and sent into a rotation, leaving Jiraiya and me in the eye of the sudden twister. I keep a tight grip on it, making the wind spin faster and faster as I count in my head. Once I reach three seconds I unleash all that force outwards in an omnidirectional blast. It might seem pointless to throw a technique like that at an opponent who can absorb chakra, but I have my reasons. It targets and covers a wide area, meaning the path can only absorb so much of the technique while the others would need their own protection. The twister has a few kunai, random debris, and a considerable volume of water flying around at high speeds, which at the least impedes their vision and should serve to make them scatter further. And most importantly, the diva path just used its signature ability, meaning it's on a countdown before it can easily disperse this technique as well. Taking all these factors into consideration, the tiny amount of chakra I spent to create this diversion was worth it as now I have an extra second to analyze the situation. There are six paths before me in various states of disarray, and a certain few require a specific plan of action when facing them. From just the few seconds I had to observe their appearances before they attacked, I was able to differentiate some of them. The diva path, the one with the gravity techniques, took a direct hit, and is yet to hit the ground. The animal path is also reeling back, but it seems it was able to summon a large panda to take some of the blow, and therefore didn't go flying as far as the diva. There is another path near the animal, but I don't recognize that one. Same for another one further off to the side. One I can confirm however is the technological path its bald head is distinctive, surrounded by all that bright hair, which wasn't able to obtain cover. And finally, there's the one that can absorb chakra. It was able to stand its ground with both arms outstretched in front of it. I can faintly see the distortion around it as the energy is absorbed. By process of elimination, out of the two that I can't visibly place, one must have the healing ability and the other, the ability to rip out souls. So one's annoying and a high priority target, while the other is dangerous, and will be matched with a clone. Since I can't tell which is which, both get clones. These observations and thoughts run through my head at lightning speed, and don't interfere with my ability to simultaneously create six clones. They act without any verbal commands from me. One stays behind to cover Jiraiya, while the others join me in splitting off and taking a path each. I don't attack my target head on, choosing instead to take a roundabout approach and come in from the side. Or, I try to anyway. It raises a hand and I feel a force grab me and jank me forward. The move might have disoriented an unaware opponent. But in this case, it's easy to use arrow step and pivot mid-air, neatly avoiding the black chakra rod it tried to stab me with. I land lightly and channel chakra into my souls to bleed off the momentum before closing the distance between us. I slip around a couple of attempts to skewer me and slam a natural energy infused palm into the rod which shatters it. Redirecting that hand I aim it towards the path's face in a jab that it just barely avoids by tilting its head to the side. Just barely however isn't enough when taking into consideration the invisible yet powerful aura around the limb. Said glancing blow snaps its head backward and momentarily disrupts its sight of me, something that is used to my advantage. I punish it with a spinning kick that practically folds the corpse, before physics does its job sending it flying into a metal structure. That brief engagement confirms my suspicions regarding Nagato's pass. His ability to split his attention between six different vessels is impressive, very much so, yet at the same time, I remember that Canon Naruto only really struggled against one of those paths, and that was after all the others were incapacitated. The assumption then is each path can only reach its maximum potential, when Nagato is focusing all of his attention on it. Certainly explains why the diva can't put up a fight against me, 
while its ability recharges. And speaking of that, it's been 5 seconds already. I materialize a Rasen Shuriken in each hand and get ready to end this. Jiraiya, Piov. There was a time when he thought he would never get to see his old students again. When he received news of their apparent deaths his days afterward had been nothing but grief and self-loathing. He'd had no excuse for leaving them in rain, and therefore their deaths could be traced back to his actions. But to be a shinobi is to endure. So he pushed that moment of weakness to the back of his mind, and focused on his duty to his village. Said focus was tested over and over again throughout the years, and it all came to a head when Naruto discovered that the rain orphans might have survived. Much more than survived, they'd grown into competent ninjas and made a name for themselves. If only that name hadn't been associated with a group of international criminals. As he watches Nagato proclaim his desire to bring peace to the world using terror and violence with Conan silently supporting him, he feels something inside of him crumble. How did it come to this? Why his precious students? Vaguely he wonders if this is what Sensei felt when Orochimaru's crimes came to light. If so it's not a very pleasant feeling. Even worse than having a comrade go rogue, it feels like he had a hand in this outcome. He failed as their sensei, so it's only right that he take responsibility and resolve this. Even if it means raising his hand against those who were at one point his children. He braces himself to do what has to be done, collecting the natural energy his clone had stockpiled, when he appears along with four others. Yuhiko, the most charismatic of his old wards. He looks to be alive, which Jiraiya should be pleased about, yet something is off with the group in front of him. Using the sensory ability of Sage Mode, he notices that beyond the shared piercings and rare dejutsu, their chakra is similar to the point of being identical. You sense it, don't you? Their chakra? Asks the clone of Naruto who'd stayed with him while the others face down the group of pain. They're all the same, he acknowledges, instead of leaping into the fray like he wants to. He moves to keep Conan in his line of sight, while also observing Yuhiko, and who he first assumed to be Nagato. They all have the same chakra and the same eyes, there has to be a connection somewhere. That's what I'm thinking. Remember Team Kakashi and Guy's report of their mission in the sand? About the technique Itachi and Kissam used to puppet those bodies. Oh, something similar, perhaps. Then then one reason they all have the Rinnegan and the same chakra signature, is that Nagato is controlling them from somewhere. The clone finishes the thought for him, meaning Nagato is alive while Yahiko truly is dead as he said, Jiraiya concludes with a grimace. It felt as if the world had decided to play with his hopes regarding Yahiko. Dead to alive to dead to seemingly alive, only to be actually dead. Most likely. And if God's Tower really is their base, then the real Nagato might be there hiding behind some sort of seal barrier. Because I'm not picking up anything. Jiraiya focuses on the direction of that odd tower, and notes he likewise can't sense anything odd. Either there's a barrier or Nagato is further than they can sense. Then that's our next target. While they were talking the clones of Naruto had been busy dismantling Nagato's puppets. One was crushed to pieces revealing mechanical parts inside of it, while another transformed into a petrified toad, meaning its ability to absorb chakra extended to natural energy as well. It's when Naruto assuming that's the original kicks Yahiko's body into a wall that Conan, who had seemed fine with playing a spectator role, tries to intervene. Pieces of paper from her wings detach and shoot towards Naruto's back. But a strong gust of wind from the clone beside him throws off their trajectory. Acting himself, Jiraiya exhales a stream of flames into her direction and feels his attack be impeded before it can reach her. Cutting off the technique and quickly rolling to the side he watches as sheets of paper slice into the ground where he'd once stood. He realizes right away that she used her paper to counteract his flames, meaning those things were resistant to a degree. He feels a burst of pulley time pride at that. Fire-resistant paper. No one can say his students weren't talented. Before either of them can attack again, a clone appears in the air and lands a kick on Conan's back, sending her plummeting to the ground. As someone who's been subjected to the blonde's preference for kicks, he has to give respect where it is due. When she makes to rise from the crater her impact created, Jiraiya extends his hair between them to wrap around her. But she bursts into loose pieces of paper and escapes back into the air. A wily one, she doesn't get far, however. The clone in the air buffets the scattered paper with a column of wind which pushes them back down. Another column of wind comes in from the side via a free clone and strikes her general location. A third clone moves around and launches an attack perpendicular to the second and effectively sets up a cross stream that pins the papers from flying away. Seeing Conan taking her shape again under the onslaught of pressure, makes Jiraiya move in, forming hand seals as he goes. The streams of wind led up right when he gets to her and plants a chakra-restricting seal on the bare skin of her neck. 
He makes the decision to tap her nerve cluster and knock her unconscious, grabbing her body before she face plants. Her face softens then, looking so innocent compared to her previous stoic expression. With a sigh, he lifts her up and onto his shoulder. That's one way with student accounted for. Feeling the blonde approaching, Dreya turns to face him. A quick scan shows not a single scratch on his person. The only sign he'd been in a fight moments prior is the body he's carrying. Yuhiko's corpse. Minus the black body jewelry. He'd seen it totting earlier. Why did Naruto take them out? I figured I should keep his remains as intact as possible. So I hit it with a controlled Rasen Shuriken. It turned the metal pieces to dust. Naruto explains to which he nods in understanding. Millions of microscopic wind blades would do that. How is she? Fine. Cut off from her chakra and unconscious but fine. We need to get to that tower as fast as possible. Would you mind? He gestures to Conan, resulting in a clone stepping forward to take her from him. He didn't know what opposition they would face going forward, so it was best if his hands weren't occupied. Right? No time to waste. He watches with a heavy heart as Naruto pulls out a free scroll from his litany of storage seals and seals away Yahiko's body. Another casualty of this cruel world. Let's go. They depart then. As Jiraiya had expected, their fight against Nagato's puppets had not gone unnoticed. No one had interfered because of the rain shinobi setting a perimeter around the battleground. Seems as if they believed their god and his angel would be victorious without support from them. Misplaced faith in this instance. The cordon zone meant they were able to fight unhindered. But they also had to take time evading the rain personnel to get to God's Tower. Time in which Jiraiya's pool of natural energy ran out unfortunately enough. Having barely done anything during the previous battle and now running out of power shortly before arriving at their destination, Jiraiya countered that particular usage of Sage Mode as wasteful. On a slightly different note, if he didn't know better, he would suspect Naruto of deliberately taking control earlier and making sure his participation was minimal. But he does know better and realizes that's exactly what the blonde did, likely as a way to lower the risk of him being harmed. And if he's seen things correctly, then there's likely another blonde in on the plan. Probably her idea actually. The white-haired Salmon snorts in amusement, should have known she would get her way in the end. That woman they opt to scale the tower, rather than use the ground entrance. Their reasoning being each village leader resides on the uppermost level of their respective buildings, and Nagato is likely to do the same for various reasons. Halfway up however they discover the entrance inside the painted face's mouth, and the plan changes. They go in and once past the threshold Naruto nods at him, he picked up Nagato's signature. Walking through the dimly lit hallways with Naruto in the lead and the clone carrying Conan in the rear, Jiraiya notes the distinct absence of people. Back in the Hokage building, one could always hear and see the activity as Nin active or retired move around carrying out their tasks. Then again, in a tower this big perhaps the lower levels are where village personnel works. Naruto stops in front of a door, prompting the party to stop as well. He can't tell what the blonde is thinking, but for a couple of seconds, he simply stands there before reaching out to open it. The door swings open noiselessly, and after another hesitation, Naruto steps inside followed by everyone else. Jiraiya almost stumbles mid-step. So this is how it ends. That voice. Nagato. Indeed, before them is his old student. Or rather what remains of him. Beneath the red hair is an unhealthily gaunt face with a thin neck leading to an emaciated body. His ribs are easily visible, and there is almost no meat on his arms. His hands and lower body are attached to a contraption that Jiraiya assumes is to support him. If his legs look anything like his arms, then his body likely needs all the help it can get to remain upright. The most horrifying part of this image is the various rods seemingly sticking into his back. The fact that he can see two ends of them from the front has worrying connotations as to how far into his body the rods go. How is he still alive? Are you here to kill me Jiraiya Sensei? Naruto Yuzumaki. Nagato's raspy voice jolts Jiraiya out of his shock, returning his gaze to the Rinnegan orb that speaks of a bone-deep weariness, while also brimming with life in comparison to their owner's body. Or perhaps capture me to face the Leaf's justice alongside Conan. I want to stop you from dooming the world, but I don't want to kill either of you Nagato. Please don't force me to, work with me instead. Jiraiya goes around Naruto to approach the redeed. I want to save you. What is there to save Sensei? You've bested me, thwarted my endeavor for peace, proving my conviction insufficient. I have nothing left but my life and Conan, and you have both within your palms. Damn it Nagato, stop talking like that. You can still be redeemed, but only if you work with me. Nagato didn't budge so he tries another appeal, and if not for your sake, then do it for Conan's. Your story doesn't have to end like this, and neither does hers. Those ringed eyes move from him to somewhere behind him before blinking. What would you have me do? Help me understand you. What happened to you? To all of you. He asks, hoping to learn what could have left Nagato in this state. 
turned his students into the people they are now. And don't you dare say war. Who did this to you? Does it truly matter, Sensei? Why was he still hesitating? Yes. I want to know what happened to you all after I left. Is this the pain you spoke of? Is this the reason he turned to the Akatsuki? The redeed stays quiet. Nagato. It was Hanzo. A soft voice speaks up. He marked the end. Turning around Jiraiya sees Conan kneeling on the ground with her head bowed. Behind her stands the clone who'd been carrying her. And it nods when he looks at it. It had brought Conan back to consciousness. We were getting too powerful. Beyond what he could control head not rising. Conan begins to recount the events that transpired within the village after he left. The three orphans forming a group of like-minded people in an attempt to bring peace to the war-torn reign to try and prevent other children from being left alone like them. That was the birth of the original Akatsuki. The group grew in size and influence, grew so much that Hanzo the Salamander took notice of them and became fearful. He reached out with words of collaboration, but instead betrayed them, taking Conan hostage and threatening to kill her, unless Nagato killed Yahiko. Hanzo had seen Yahiko as the leader and spirit of the group, and believed killing him would kill the movement. Ignoring Conan's pleas to leave her behind, Yahiko sacrificed himself on a kunai in Nagato's hands, and the sight drove the Redi to rage. Nagato saved Conan from Hanzo at the cost of his legs. Going further, he used a technique special to the Rinnegan to summon a beast that killed all the troops Hanzo had brought with him. The Salamander escaped while the technique stole a great portion of Nagato's life force, and left him in the state he is today. Nagato would later get his revenge on Hanzo, but the Akatsuki was never the same afterward. Over time their vision shifted and with influence from a man in an orange mask calling himself Madara Uchiha, they devised a new route to peace, using the tailed beasts as a weapon. You understand now, why my solution is the only viable one. We only wanted peace within the village, to make life better for everyone. We tried to follow in your footsteps, use your teachings, yet in the end, we paid the price for it. Nagato's face tightens, something very obvious on his frame. Your idealistic vision of peace will never happen in this world. The people don't desire it enough. I, I understand where you are coming from Nagato. Jiraiya takes a moment to organize his thoughts. He won't get another chance at this. It can be all too easy to lash out at the world when it hurts you, especially when you have the power to enact vengeance as you do. However, rarely is violence the answer. More often than not, you will find that those actions, in turn, hurt another, and that creates a vicious cycle of violence and suffering. The same cycle that exists currently. My plan would have broken it, Sensei. Once everyone had experienced pain, true pain, everyone would want it to end. They would cease the wars and violence that brought them pain. There would have been peace then. Jiraiya shakes his head. It's a good thing Nagato is willing to engage in the exchange of philosophy. But there is a disconnect between them. Your logic doesn't account for human nature, Nagato. You believe the world would see the results of your weapon and stop their ways yet, although that may be the case for a while, they would eventually rebel. They would band against you, and once you were gone, they might go on to have some semblance of ceasefire. Or they might turn on each other again. What I'm trying to say is that you would kill countless people for no reason. Like many things in life, peace is not something you can force and then expect to last. But why? Why would they purposely do such a thing? Why make their lives harder? Nagato asks. And at that moment he sees a younger, less jaded pupil, struggling to understand how people could be so cruel to one another. Because it's their life. Naruto responds, free will is important, and people would rather make the wrong decision freely, rather than be forced into what's best for them. You would think you're doing a good deed creating your brand of peace while to them. You would be another great village doing as you want, with no regard to their opinions. That's why although idealistic, Jiraiya's teachings have a certain merit to them. You believe people can come to embrace peace as sensei and visions. Nagato questions Naruto. Jiraiya glances at Conan who also seems to be waiting for the blonde's response. I do. I can't say that it will happen in your lifetime or even mine, but I believe that if we work together towards peace, to simply change how things are today really, then each successive generation will be better. Naruto pauses and then shrugs. That's just what I've come up with myself. But I think it has potential. It won't be a quick thing. But just like today people can have better lives than those who lived during the warring era. So too can our descendants have better lives than us. We just have to be willing to put the work in. Does that make sense? Hum. And what of those who oppose the efforts for peace? What would you do with them? I received some advice a couple of years back. You have to find your reason for the things you do in this life. It's phrased differently. But Jiraiya recognizes the advice he'd given to Naruto after his first kill. To think it would come back like this. There will be people like those you asked about. 
people who enjoy causing suffering, to whom peace is not something positive. They will force your hand when it comes to dealing with them. You'll have to resort to methods that aren't exactly peaceful. And my suggestion then is to remember why you're doing what you're doing. Recognize that each life is precious but that each violent act can play a part in the creation of something better. A fine line to tread Nagato muses, and Jiraiya nods to himself. A very fine line. Conan, my oldest friend, said friend turns to him. I've always been so assured of my path that I never once asked you what you thought. I was wrong for that. Nagato, so I ask you now, what do you think? She's silent for a long second, seemingly deep in thought, and when she does respond, it's with a quiet conviction. I would like to see this world they envision, the one in which peace is achieved peacefully. You think it could come to pass? There's a certain weight to the question, as if the response is something he desperately needs. I would like to believe so, even if it is not easy. I'd like to know I played a part in it. That we all did. I see I was not a very good friend to you, was I? He asks rhetorically. Conan makes to argue. But he shakes his head. To have missed this all along, I'm sorry. For everything. Jiraiya notes the finality in his tone and gets a bad feeling. Nagato. I lost sight of your teachings, Jiraiya sensei. Even now. I have doubts as to whether true peace can be established. This world we live in is simply not conducive to your vision. Yet merely because I am disillusioned does not invalidate what you believe in. Nagato, what are you saying? Conan rises to stand on her feet. I couldn't do it. But perhaps you all can succeed where I fell short. Jiraiya Sensei, Naruto, Conan, I wish to put my faith in you. Bring about the seeds of peace where I could not. You can help us Nagato. Renounce the Akatsuki name and take on another one, one with the original goal of the Akatsuki. Jiraiya tries, but the redeed smiles sadly. I cannot Sensei. My time in this world isn't much longer. Seeing the state of Nagato's body, Jiraiya can take a guess as to what might be the reason for that. Conan voices what he's suspecting. Your condition. How bad is it? I hid the worst of it from you. Didn't want to burden you further. That's why I hastened our timeline like I did as otherwise I would have risked the completion of our plan. I have mere months to live Conan. No, she murmurs, coming to stand before him like Jiraiya. No, that can't be. Old friend, I know better than anyone how close I am to death. I can see its grasp on me. It is inevitable. Silent tears roll down Conan's cheeks. Jiraiya can feel his own eyes burning. Perhaps it is for the best. I did many things for the sake of my peace. Things Yuhiko would never have done if it were him I don't deserve to continue while they all died. This is my penance. You don't have to die Nagato. I don't know the specifics of what that technique did to you. But I might be able to help. Naruto offers. And if not him then Tsunade might. Jiraiya throws out as well. The faint embers of hope flare only to die again. Perhaps, yet that is not to be. I have long since made peace with my fate, so I can only be grateful that you stalled my hand. Nagato declines with a sad smile. Are you sure Nagato? Don't think you have to do this because it's your punishment. He tries again. He really doesn't want another of his students to die, not if he can help it. We can work something out. Truly Jiraiya Sensei, my condition is beyond repair. It's the price for wielding the power I did. He grinds his teeth yet doesn't continue fighting. When was anything in life ever so easy? If that's what you want then so be it. Naruto acquiesces when everyone else stays silent. By the way, the man you mentioned, this Madara. If he wore a mask with a spiral design along with the Akatsuki cloak, then you will be happy to hear we encountered him on a mission not too long ago. He didn't survive. Are you sure? Conan questions. Yes. I made it permanent. It is for the best. He would never have stopped Dash whatever the redeed was about to say is cut off by a violent bout of coughing. Seeing the way the contractions wreck his frail body really drives it home for Jiraiya how bad his condition is. It's a hard sight to stomach. He's not used to talking so much in this form. Conan flicks her hand out to no effect before turning to them. Help me move him please. Right, her chakra was sealed. Stopping briefly to undo the seal, Jiraiya steps up to help remove Nagato from the contraption and get him into a different room while Conan grabs the medicine. Vaguely, he notices how incredulously this mission ended with him tucking in his fully grown pupil, but he says nothing of it. It isn't his preferred outcome yet it's also not the worst. Almost like the old days really. He'd do his best to cherish the second chance with them even if it means putting one of them to bed. Eov. Restored. Somehow, despite everything, I actually thought this could have ended another way. Instead, there's a dark cloud hanging over what could have been a joyful moment. I'd always sympathized with the rain orphans. Seeing their sad origins and how their lofty goals were torn apart really spoke to me. It made me dislike the Salamander and hate Danzo even more when I learned of his role in those events. In my mind, Jiraiya wasn't blameless as I believed he should have taken them with him, or at the least make the offer. 
And after that came Abito, Madara, and Black Zetsu in the chain of deception that saw Nagato and Conan working with rogue ninjas to bring the world to its knees. It's hypocritical of me to have pitied the latter duo, while disliking Abito who was also a victim, but that's how I felt about it. As per the primacy effect, I was introduced to them first, so even when the true villain was exposed, I still had issues with Abito. Plus he killed Conan to loot Nagato's body. So there was that, it's honestly a relief not having to kill either of them. All those years ago when I first found myself in this situation, I promised myself that I would do whatever it took to end the Akatsuki and the threat they posed. If I had to eliminate all their members, then that's what I would have done, wouldn't have been happy about it, but I would have done it. And isn't that a clear sign of how much I've changed from the person I used to be? Plotting another's demise when conflict was never really in my nature. Needs must I suppose, thankfully for me. I had Jiraiya tag along for this encounter. Without him I wouldn't have been able to connect with the two. My appeal wouldn't have carried the same weight as one coming from someone they knew and respected even if only in the past. It's unfortunate that we managed to persuade them to try another route to the peace that they've always wanted only to find out about Nagato's diagnosis. Who could have predicted that he was already on his deathbed? I knew that statue took a great toll on his health, and he certainly didn't look well. Yet I thought he would be fine. In the story he only died after using a sacrificial technique. So I suppose that knowledge blinded me to the truth. He was a man with one foot in the grave already. I should have seen it coming though. Something like this, an irreversible fatal condition, is frankly par for par regarding the outcome of people with good intentions. This accursed world isn't kind to those who seek to change it. But that's pessimist talk and there are enough negatives for today. So why not focus on something good? Like the fact that it's over for now. This version of the Akatsuki the moon's eye plan, the revival of Kagaya, they're all over and done with. No longer can they loom in the distant future and leave me restless. No longer will I have to spend time agonizing over plans and their possible outcomes. I've done my part and saw this task through to the end, while saving countless lives in the process. I deserve a break now, don't I? Not a happily ever after, those are rare here, but maybe something else. Some time to myself where I can sit back and watch the sunset perhaps. A moment to live my own life not dictated to greater threats. Yeah, that sounds perfect. There will be more obstacles to worry over later, but I'm going to enjoy this piece while I have it. Kami knows I haven't been living for myself for a while now. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.